Brendan by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Brendan, Brandon, or Brandan. Circa 484 to 578. Irish saint and hero of a legendary voyage in the Atlantic is said to have been born at Tralee in Kerry in A.D. 484. The Irish form of his name is Brennan, the Latin Brendanus. Medieval historians usually call him Brendan of Clonfert, or Brendan, son of Finloga, to distinguish him from his contemporary, St. Brendan of Byr, 573. Little is known of the historical Brendan, who died in 578 as abbot of a Benedictine monastery which he had founded twenty years previously at Clonfert in eastern Galway. The story of his voyage across the Atlantic to the promised land of the saints, afterwards designated St. Brendan's Island, ranks among the most celebrated of the medieval sagas of Western Europe. Its traditional date is 565 to 573. The legend is found, in prose or verse, and with many variations, in Latin, French, English, Saxon, Flemish, Irish, Welsh, Breton, and Scottish Gaelic. Although it does not occur in the writings of any Arabian geographer, several of its incidents, such as the landing on a whale in mistake for an island, belong also to Arabic folk literature. Many of Brendan's fabulous adventures seem to be borrowed from the half-pagan Irish saga of Meldun or Meldune, and others belong also to Scandinavian mythology. The oldest extant version of this legend is the 11th century Navigatio Brendani. San Brendan's island was long accepted as a reality by geographers. In a Venetian map dated 1367, in the anonymous Weimar map of 1424, and in B. Beccario's map of 1435, it is identified with Madeira. Columbus, in his journal for the 9th of August, 1492, states that the inhabitants of Hierro, Gomera, and Madeira had seen the island in the west, and Martin Beheim, in the globe he made at Nuremberg in the same year, places it west of the Canaries, and near the equator. During the 16th century, the progress of exploration in these latitudes compelled many geographers to locate the island elsewhere, and it was marked about 100 miles west of Ireland, or afterwards among the West Indies. But in Spain and Portugal the older beliefs as to its situation was maintained. In 1526 an expedition under Fernando Alvarez left Grand Canary in search of San Brendan's island, which had again been reported as seen by many trustworthy witnesses. In 1570 an official inquiry was held, and a second expedition undertaken by Fernando de Villalobos, governor of Palma. Similar voyages of discovery were made by the Canarians in 1604 and 1721, and only in 1759 was the apparition of St. Brendan's Island explained as an effect of mirage. End of Brendan by Encyclopedia Britannica Bull Run by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bull Run, a small stream of Virginia, USA, which gave the name to two famous battles in the American Civil War. 1. The first battle of Bull Run, called by the Confederates Manassas, was fought on the 21st of July, 1861, between the Union forces under Brigadier General Irvin McDowell and the Confederates under General Joseph E. Johnston. Both armies were newly raised and almost untrained. After a slight action on the 18th at Blackburn's Ford, the two armies prepared for battle. The Confederates were posted along Bull Run, guarding all the passages from the Stone Bridge down to the Railway Bridge. McDowell's forces rendezvoused around Centerville, and both commanders, sensible of the temper of their troops, planned a battle for the 21st. On his part, McDowell ordered one of his four divisions to attack the Stone Bridge, two to make a turning movement via Sudley Springs. The remaining division, partly composed of regular troops, was to be in reserve and to watch the lower fords. The local Confederate commander, Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard, had also intended to advance, and General Johnston, who arrived by rail on the evening of the 20th with the greater part of a fresh army, and now assumed command of the whole force, approved an offensive movement against Centerville for the 21st, 
but orders miscarried, and the Federal attack opened before the movement had begun. Johnston and Beauregard then decided to fight a defensive battle and hurried up troops to support the single brigade of Evans, which held the Stone Bridge. Thus, there was no serious fighting at the lower fords of Bull Run throughout the day. The Federal staff was equally inexperienced, and the divisions engaged in the turning movement met with many unnecessary checks. At 6 a.m., when the troops told off for the frontal attack appeared before the Stone Bridge, the turning movement was by no means well advanced. Evans had time to change position so as to command both Stone Bridge and Sudley Springs, and he was promptly supported by the brigades of B., Bartow, and T.J. Jackson. About 9.30, the leading Federal Brigade from Sudley Springs came into action, and two hours later, Evans, B., and Bartow had been driven off the Matthews Hill in considerable confusion. But on Henry House Hill, Jackson's brigade stood, as General B. said to his men, like a stone wall, and the defenders rallied, though the Federals were continually reinforced. The fighting on the Henry House Hill was very severe, but McDowell, who dared not halt to reform his enthusiastic volunteers, continued to attack. About 1.30 p.m., he brought up two regular batteries to the fighting line, but a Confederate regiment, being mistaken for friendly troops and allowed to approach, silenced the guns by close rifle fire, and from that time, though the hill was taken and retaken several times, the Federal attack made no further headway. At 2.45, more of Beauregard's troops had come up, Jackson's brigade charged with the bayonet, and at the same time, the Federals were assailed in flank by the last brigades of Johnston's army, which arrived at the critical moment from the railway. They gave way at once, tired out and conscious that the day was lost, and after one rally melted away slowly to the rear, the handful of regulars alone keeping their order. But when, at the defile of Cub Run, they came under shell fire, the retreat became a panic flight to the Potomac. The victors were too much exhausted to pursue, and the U.S. regulars of the Reserve Division formed a strong and steady rear guard. The losses were Federals, 2,896 men out of about 18,500 engaged, Confederates, 1,982 men out of 18,000. 2. The operations of the last days of August 1862, which include the Second Battle of Bull Run, Second Manassas, are amongst the most complicated of the war. At the outset, the Confederate General Lee's army, Longstreet's and Jackson's Corps, lay on the Rappahannock, faced by the Federal Army of Virginia under Major General John Pope, which was to be reinforced by troops from McClellan's army to a total strength of 150,000 men as against Lee's 60,000. Want of supplies soon forced Lee to move, though not to retreat, and his plan for attacking Pope was one of the most daring in all military history. Jackson, with half the army, was dispatched on a wide turning movement which was to bring him via Salem and Thoroughfare Gap to Manassas Junction in Pope's rear. When Jackson's task was accomplished, Lee and Longstreet were to follow him by the same route. Early on the 25th of August, Jackson began his march around the right of Pope's army. On the 26th, the column passed Thoroughfare Gap, and Bristow Station, directly in Pope's rear, was reached on the same evening, while a detachment drove a federal post from Manassas Junction. On the 27th, the immense magazines at the junction were destroyed. On his side, Pope had soon discovered Jackson's departure and had arranged for an immediate attack on Longstreet. When, however, the direction of Jackson's march on Thoroughfare Gap became clear, Pope fell back in order to engage him, at the same time ordering his army to concentrate on Warrenton, Greenwich, and Gainesville. He was now largely reinforced. On the evening of the 27th, one of his divisions, marching to its point of concentration, met a division of Jackson's corps near Bristow Station. After a sharp fight, the Confederate general, Ewell, retired on Manassas. Pope now realized that he had Jackson's corps in front of him at the junction, and at once took steps to attack Manassas with all his forces. He drew off even the corps at Gainesville for his intended battle of the 28th. McDowell, however, its commander, on his own responsibility, left Ricketts' division at Thoroughfare Gap. But Pope's blow was struck in the air. When he arrived at Manassas on the 28th, he found nothing but the ruins of his magazines, and one of McDowell's divisions, King's, marching from Gainesville on Manassas Junction, met Jackson's infantry near Groveton. The situation had again changed completely. Jackson had no intention of awaiting Pope at Manassas, and after several feints made with a view to misleading the Federal scouts, he finally withdrew to a hidden position between Groveton and Sudley Springs to await the arrival of Longstreet, who, taking the same route as Jackson had done, arrived on the 28th at Thoroughfare Gap, and, engaging Ricketts' division, finally drove it back to Gainesville. On the evening of this day, Jackson's corps held the line Sudley Springs-Groveton, his right wing near Groveton opposing King's division, and Longstreet held Thoroughfare Gap, facing Ricketts at Gainesville. 
On Ricketts' right was King near Groveton, and the line was continued thence by McDowell's remaining division and by Sigel's corps to the Stone Bridge. At Centerville, seven miles away, was Pope with three divisions. A fourth was northeast of Manassas Junction, and Porter's corps at Bristow Station. Thus, while Ricketts continued at Gainesville to mask Longstreet, Pope could concentrate a superior force against Jackson, whom he now believed to be meditating a retreat to the Gap. But a series of misunderstandings resulted in the withdrawal of Ricketts and King, so that nothing now intervened between Longstreet and Jackson, while Sigel and McDowell's other division alone remained to face Jackson until such time as Pope could bring up the rest of his scattered forces. Jackson now closed on his left and prepared for battle, and on the morning of the 29th, the Confederates, posted behind a high railway embankment, repelled two sharp attacks made by Sigel. Pope arrived at noon with the divisions from Centerville, which, led by the general himself and by Reno and Hooker, two of the bravest officers in the Union Army, made a third and most desperate attack on Jackson's line. The latter, repulsing it with difficulty, carried its counterstroke too far and was in turn repulsed by Grover's brigade of Hooker's division. Grover then made a fourth assault, but was driven back with terrible loss. The last assault, gallantly delivered by two divisions under Kearney and Stevens, drove the Confederate left out of its position, but a Confederate counterattack, led by the brave Jubal Early, dislodged the assailants with the bayonet. In the meanwhile, events had taken place near Groveton, which were, for twenty years after the war, the subject of controversy and recrimination. See Porter Fitzjohn. When Porter's and part of McDowell's corps, acting on various orders sent by Pope, approached Gainesville from the southeast, Longstreet had already reached that place, and the Federals thus encountered a force of unknown strength at the moment when Sigel's guns to the northward showed him to be closely engaged with Jackson. The two generals consulted, and McDowell marched off to join Sigel, while Porter remained to hold the new enemy in check. In this he succeeded. Longstreet, though far superior in numbers, made no forward move, and his advanced guard alone came into action. On the night of the 29th, Lee reunited the wings of his army on the field of battle. He had forced Pope back many miles from the Rappahannock, and expecting that the Federals would retire to the line of Bull Run before giving battle, he now decided to wait for the last divisions of Longstreet's corps, which were still distant. But Pope, still sanguine, ordered a general pursuit of Jackson for the 30th. There was some ground for his suppositions, for Jackson had retired a short distance, and Longstreet's advanced guard had also fallen back. McDowell, however, who was in general charge of the Federal right on the 30th, soon saw that Jackson was not retreating and stopped the pursuit and the attack on Jackson's right, which Pope had ordered Porter to make, was repulsed by Longstreet's overwhelming forces. Then Lee's whole line, four miles long, made its grand counterstroke, 4 p.m. There was now no hesitation in Longstreet's attack. The Federal left was driven successively from every position it took up, and Longstreet finally captured Bald Hill. Jackson, though opposed by the greater part of Pope's forces, advanced to the Matthews Hill, and his artillery threatened the Stone Bridge. The Federals, driven back to the banks of Bull Run, were only saved by the gallant defense of the Henry House Hill, by the Pennsylvanian Division of Reynolds, and the regulars under Sykes. Pope withdrew under cover of night to Centerville. Here he received fresh reinforcements, but Jackson was already marching round his new right, and after the action of Chantilly, 1st of September, the whole Federal army fell back to Washington. The Union forces present on the field of the 29th and 30th numbered about 63,000, the strength of Lee's army being on the same dates about 54,000. Besides their killed and wounded, the Federals lost very heavily in prisoners. End of Bull Run by Encyclopedia Britannica Read by Tatiana Chichilla Comanche of Custer's Command by Earl H. Emmons From Adventure Magazine, February 28, 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Comanche of Custer's Command By Earl H. Emmons Two days after Custer's tragic struggle in the Little Bighorn, men of Reno's command found a member of the Seventh Cavalry standing in a nearby creek, his body full of bullets and arrows, and his soul full of wrath against the Redskin. The survivor was Comanche, the horse of Captain Keogh. He was rescued and taken to Fort Lincoln 
where Colonel Sturgis issued the following order. Headquarters, 7th U.S. Cavalry, Fort Lincoln, D.T.G.O. Number 7. 1. The horse, known as Comanche, being the only living representative of the bloody tragedy of the Little Bighorn, June 25, 1876. His kind treatment and comfort shall be a matter of special pride and solicitude on the part of every member of the Seventh Cavalry, to the end that his life be preserved to the utmost limit. Wounded and scarred as he is, his very existence speaks in terms more eloquent than words of the desperate struggle against overwhelming numbers, of the hopeless conflict, and the heroic manner in which all went down to death on that fatal day. 2. The commanding officer of Company 1 will see that a special and comfortable stable is fitted for him, and he will not be ridden by any person whatsoever, under any circumstances, nor will he be put to any kind of work. Hereafter, upon all occasions of ceremony of mounted regiment formation, Comanche, saddled, bridled, and draped in mourning, and led by a mounted trooper of Company 1, will be paraded with the regiment. By command of Colonel Sturgis, A. E. Garlington, 1st Lieutenant and Adjutant, 7th Cavalry. Comanche remained at Fort Lincoln until 1879, when, with the 7th Cavalry, he was transferred to Fort Meade, South Dakota. He lived there ten years, then was taken to Fort Riley, Kansas, where he died. He was buried with full military honors. The End of Comanche of Custer's Command By Earl H. Emmons The Death of the Lusitania by Mrs. P. Amory. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in May 2021. The Death of the Lusitania by Mrs. P. Amory. O Lusitania, Empress of the Sea, Art thou dead and buried in the deep, with all thy freight of human souls, victims of the Hun's most hellish darts? Come, nations, rise, avenge this hideous crime, avenge the cries of English hope, now lying cold and dead in ocean deep. Come, nations, rouse and crush this hideous foe, this vampire of the world who is no man, but just a beast of prey respecting nothing, laying waste the glorious work of centuries, breaking hearts and homes on every side. Come quickly, come, ere England's blood be shed in vain, her noble sons all dead and lying on the plains. Come, nations, crush this vampire into dust. Come quickly, come. O oh, Lusitania, my tears are falling for thee, fair village of palaces, gone for evermore beneath the cold blue waters. P. Amory Little did I think on the morning of April 27, 1915, as I purchased my ticket for sunny England, that I was destined to endure the experience of being face to face with death, before returning to my Canadian home. Neither could I have employed my imagination to conjure before me the terrible scenes that I was to witness in the most terrible disaster in the history of the British Marine. Now, as I sit in my home, surrounded by loving hearts and familiar faces, it seems to me that it must have been a dream, but I have only to recall the agonizing screams of the mothers and the children and the scenes of parting between husbands and wives, the husbands begging the wives to be saved and the wives pleading tearfully for their men to come with them. But a law of the sea is women and children first, 
and those brave men were doing their duty before their god trusting that some help might arrive to save them at the last moment from a watery grave but to return to my starting and my reason for making the voyage when the fiendish piracy of the german was at its height i am the mother of five boys who have gone to serve their king and their country two of them were at the front in france and the other three were training for the trenches realizing that a short vacation in england would place me near to them and feeling it my duty to visit them probably for the last time on earth i decided to sever home ties for the time being and in this case decision was action for i immediately secured passage and upon purchasing my ticket in toronto was informed that i could sail on the lusitania from new york on the first of may it being the twenty seventh of april i made immediate preparations and the morning of the first found me aboard that mighty empress of the seas thrilled with the thought that a few days hence would find me with my soldier sons i had not bought any of the new york dailies and was therefore unaware of the vague feeling that so many were experiencing regarding the safety of the lusitania when she should enter the danger zone had i known that notices had been posted by the german embassy at washington notifying passengers that they were taking their lives in their own hands if they departed on this particular ship i would have been undeterred as i would have taken the risk to be near my boys and at any rate i have never had a fear of the sea the men of my family as far back as i can remember have been naval officers in the service of the king and i presume that i have inherited a natural fondness for a voyage on the ocean i was born aboard ship and much of my early life was spent on the water so that i am almost as much a sailor as landlubber and it is only natural and not to be attributed to desire to boast that i should have made the voyage warning or not warning aboard the ship the usual hustle and bustle was in evidence and after being assigned to my cabin and seeing to it that my luggage was safely deposited therein i went on deck to enjoy what is always a pleasant experience to me the sights of a great busy port and the making ready for departure the dock was crowded with people come to bid farewell to relatives and friends going abroad time passed quickly all too quickly for even though i was anxious to be on my way yet the interest that one arouses in watching a great ship prepare for a voyage is so intense that the thoughts of my journey were for the time being thrust into the background smartly dressed officers were attending to their various duties both aboard ship and on the dock great truckloads of luggage and last-minute consignments of mail were being rushed aboard finally the rush subsided blue-coated officers were seen coming on the ship with their hands full of papers these being the bills of lading and the consignment sheets for our cargo of express and baggage bells were ringing their signals for final preparation the shrill blasts from tugboats announced that they were ready to begin their labor of moving the great ship from her moorings and the deep throaty reply from the chimes of the lusitania voiced her assent bridges were swung two more sharp exchanges of signals from the tugs and we were moving the mightiest vessel in the world had started on what was to be her last voyage we passed down the river and into the sea and here our friendly tugs left us with many whistles of farewell such little boats they are and so powerful one often wonders where they keep the enormous strength that enables them to force the big ocean liners to do their bidding the lusitania was now running under her own power and the mighty engines were forcing us ahead rapidly into the open road that leads to dear old england and our loved ones and i decided that i would go to my cabin 
I was anxious to meet the two ladies whom I understood were to share the cabin with me, and, as the invigorating air and the interesting sights of the past few hours have given me a ravenous appetite, I anticipated an early dinner. I found my roommates to be very charming ladies. One, the younger of the two, was a handsome girl, with beautiful fair hair. When I first saw her, she was wearing a perfect fitting dress of black velvet, and I was so impressed with her beauty and her frank, straightforward manner of introducing herself to me, that I felt I had indeed been fortunate in having such a charming young lady for a voyage companion. The other lady was older. I should judge her to be fifty years of age or more. She had been in the United States nursing an uncle until his death, which had occurred but a short time before our memorable voyage. This uncle had left her considerable property, and she was returning to her native land, England, to spend the remainder of her life among relatives and friends. I believe I have never known a more kindly woman, nor one who seemed to be more ready in a case of emergency to lend a helping hand. It seemed as though she had everything that was needed for sickness, and she spent much of her time relieving the cases of illness that most naturally occurred during the first days aboard ship. After we had become acquainted and had arranged our cabin to suit ourselves, my younger companion asked me if I was ready for dinner. I replied in the affirmative, and upon going below to the dining room, we found that we were late for the first table and had to wait our turn but I was permitted to get a view of the interior, and such a sight it was. It would have gladdened the heart of any one to gaze upon such a scene as was then before me. Such a beautiful dining-room I had never seen, either aboard ship or in the magnificent hotels that I have visited on both sides of the ocean. The pillars, extending from floor to ceiling, were as snowy white as the linen that covered the long tables. The walls and ceilings were frescoed in delicate tints, and in the centre there was a round, open balcony which permitted one to stand above and gaze down upon a spectacle that I believe could not be duplicated elsewhere. Finally our turn came, and I was permitted to occupy one of the upholstered swivel chairs that had been appealing to me for the last ten minutes but I must not dwell too long on details, and in connection with the dining-room will only say further that I had never seen such palms as those that were profusely distributed about the saloon. One of them, I remember, reached nearly to the ceiling. The only other matter I consider to be of sufficient importance to dwell upon before rehearsing to you the final scenes attending the sinking of our ship is in connection with the patriotic concert that was given for the benefit of the Siemens Fund. Having become acquainted with those who were arranging it, I was asked if there was anything that I could do to assist, and I replied that I might sell programs, which offer was accepted, and I was given the programs and started on a round of the first-class cabins and staterooms. My first sale was to a man who, I was informed soon afterwards, was Mr. Vanderbilt, an American millionaire. I asked him to buy, but he said that he had already purchased one. I then thought, of course, that I had been preceded by another seller, but when he smiled and handed me a five-dollar bill, saying that he couldn't resist my good-natured smile, I concluded to go further among the first-class passengers. I informed him that I would have to look for change, whereupon he said that he expected no change. I met with similar success in nearly all of the cabins and on the decks, and soon had realized well on my programs. The concert itself was pronounced a success by all who attended, and we felt that it was more than a success, since we had realized nearly twenty pounds which we felt would be a fine gift to the fund for which it was intended. On Thursday, which was the day following our memorable concert, we arose early and went on deck to enjoy the breeze. The sea was calm, excepting for the slight ripples that are characteristic of the Atlantic so early in the day. 
Before noon, however, the water was as smooth as the floor of the room in which I am writing, and we were very happy in thinking that the remainder of our voyage would be made under favourable weather conditions, and that before another sunrise we would be landed and our journey completed. The elder of my companions, Mrs. Wyrett, had been ill for the greater part of Wednesday night and was still feeling badly on Thursday morning. But I induced her to dress and assisted her to the deck, and I have been deeply grateful, and all my life will be, for being permitted to render her such an assistance, as it was the means of saving her life when the explosions occurred. Being on deck at that time, she was among the first of those who were saved. At noon we were greeted with the sound of the first luncheon bell, and, feeling warm and not in the least hungry, I decided to have a bath and be ready for the second luncheon, believing that a dip would serve to increase my appetite. I left Mrs. Wyrett on deck and went to our cabin, where I secured a change of clothing and proceeded to the bath. Fortunately, I took my raincoat with me, as I thought I might not have time to dress fully before the second bell, and such proved to be the case. I had scarcely finished the bath when the bell sounded for second luncheon, and as it was permissible to go to the dining room at lunch hour clad in negligé, I slipped on my raincoat and hurried to lunch. The bath had improved my appetite, and I was feeling as though I could go through the meal with a will. I took my place at table and had given my order. It then occurred to me that I would like a salad, and as the steward placed the soup before me, I was on the point of ordering the salad when there came the most terrible crash, which seemed to tear everything to pieces and to rend the ship asunder. There was a rush for the stairs, and everyone was trying to ascend the narrow stairway. Realizing that something of a terrible nature had occurred, I seemed to be possessed of superhuman strength and was able to push through where stronger persons were being held back. Someone shouted, We have been torpedoed, and I realized for the first time that we were doomed. As I fought my way up the stairs, I was thrown on my knees three times. Near the top of the stairway there was an officer shouting, keep cool, and his words seemed to have the desired effect, as the terrible crush subsided, and those of us who were nearing the top found it less difficult to ascend. But about this time the ship started to list heavily to one side. At one time I feared that we were turning over. It seemed to me at that time that it was requiring hours of time for us to reach the deck, but in reality it all occurred in a very few minutes. When we reached the deck I had difficulty in holding my feet, as there seemed to be such a slant to everything upon which I stepped that I feared being thrown overboard each time I moved one foot ahead of the other. The screams of the women and children were terrible to hear. Wives were being torn from their husbands and lifted into the lifeboats. Children who in the terrible crush of humans had become separated from their parents were being handed from man to man and on into the boats. Women were fainting and falling to the deck, only to be carried overboard by their own weight. The decks by this time were becoming more difficult to stand upon. I was trying to find a life belt, as I realized that without one I would stand little chance of being saved, as I had given up all hope of being able to reach the lifeboats. Just as I was giving up in despair, and was about to resign myself to the fate of the brave men who would be left on the ship, I was grabbed from behind, and a brave young man said, here, mother, take this belt, and with that he helped me to get into it, and remained with me until I had it properly adjusted. I said, God bless you, young man, and turned to speak further with him, but he was gone. As I did not see him among the survivors, I believe he was lost, and never will I forget his brave deed, for I feel certain that he gave his life to save mine, 
and when I think of him I unconsciously quote, Blessed is he, for he gave his life for his brother. Up to the time of securing the belt I had not realized that the lifeboats were being rapidly filled. But I was made aware of this being a fact by an officer who was British to the core. He spied me in a crowd of men, and speaking so as to be heard above the screams of the women and the shouts of the men, he ordered the men to make way for me as, to quote him, the last boat is leaving and this lady must go. Those men stood aside and let him through to me, and taking me by the hand he assisted me to the rail. By this time the last lifeboat was swinging clear of the ship, and as the Lusitania was now listing so heavily, it was impossible for the men in charge to swing back far enough for me to step aboard. But the officer who had brought me to the rail was equal to the emergency, and when he said, Mother, I guess you'll have to jump for it, and believing this to be my only chance, I jumped. I landed just over the edge of the boat on all fours. Just then the ropes on one end of our boat must have held fast, or else the sinking ship must have given a terrible roll, for we were brought up against the side of the ship with an awful crash and were thrown into the water. Fortunately we were nearly down when the accident occurred and had not far to fall, but the confusion was great. Those who did not have life belts sank almost immediately. On every hand were floating bodies, and their upturned faces showing white and ghastly. I was so close to the Lusitania I could have reached out and touched her, but her motions at this time caused waves that carried me some distance away. All this time I was floating on my back, and try as I would I could not turn over. This fact alarmed me greatly, since I believed that my life belt was on wrong, and later this proved to be correct. At times the waves would wash over my face and fill my mouth with water, and I called upon God to save me. Each time a bit of wreckage would float against me, I would take courage and think that a boat was near and that they were trying to reach me. But when the drift would float by, I would again be possessed of the fear that I was destined to float around until I could no longer survive, and then to die. I could see myself being washed ashore a lifeless corpse, and I believe that had such wild thoughts continued, I should have died from the shock of them. But again I was given hope by feeling something sharp coming up my neck and into my hair and the next instant my head was raised with a jerk, and a steady voice said to me, Easy now, I have a hook in your hair. Our boat is loaded, but your grey hair forbids us to leave. We are going to pull you part way into the boat until we can adjust our load, and then we will try to get you into a seat. I was overjoyed and could think of nothing to say but thank God, thank God I am being saved. They pulled me up so that my head and arms hung into the boat, and after a few minutes they pulled the upper part of my body over the side and left my legs in the water. We drifted this way for a long time, so long, in fact, that my legs were numb, and I wished that they might soon be able to find a place for me. But I was so thankful for having been rescued that I decided to stand the terrible pains that were shooting through my body until they became absolutely unbearable, and then asked them to please drag me in farther. After a while they seemed to get the weight properly adjusted, and I was dragged in. I raised my head just in time to see the last of the Lusitania as she sank beneath the waves. As she sank there was a mighty rush of water, and we were rocked until we nearly capsized, but the men who were handling our boat were expert seamen, and after a moment of anxiety as to our being able to survive the heavy wash, we righted again, and the men took to the oars. It was now exceedingly quiet that I wondered at it, but the answer came to me in the mute, upturned faces that floated by, and as the gravity of the situation seized upon me, 
I thanked God that he had spared us a like fate. It was terrible to look upon children, oh, such little children, floating away out there on the ocean. Children who that morning were the pride of loving parents, and who were now the dead victims of a fiendish hate for mankind in general. These dear children had been sacrificed for the lust to kill, even though the killing be of infants. These thoughts came uppermost, and for several moments I hated the race that made war on women and war on children, and I would have given everything for revenge. But naturally, this period of hate changed into one of thanksgiving, and I said to those aboard, People, if any of us have never given ourselves to God, now is the time. We are passing through a terrible experience, and without his help we will be powerless. Nearly everyone prayed. Some of the prayers were so full of joy at being thus far delivered safely, that we for the moment forgot those poor unfortunates who were being washed about us and wept for the very joy of it. But we were not yet out of danger, and when someone started to cry of submarine, we all looked in the direction to which he pointed, and there, sure enough, was what we all took to be a submarine, but which proved to be but huge fish sporting in the waves. However, we had been given a scare, and the men rowed like mad. An old gentleman, who sat opposite me, asked me if he could put his feet against my knees so that he might give a stronger stroke with his oar, and I consented to do so. Several times it seemed that he would shove his feet clear through me, but I knew that he was doing his best, and tried hard to keep from crying out with the pain of it. After we had been going for three or four hours without sighting a vessel of any description, we saw a tiny speck on the horizon that appeared to be getting bigger. We watched it steadily, and it proved to be a fishing boat. We all shouted ourselves hoarse, little realizing that it was a useless expenditure of breath, as our voices would not carry half of the distance between us. We soon saw, however, that they were headed our way, and later we knew that we had been sighted and that it was a rescue boat. They came alongside, and we were taken aboard. It was a dirty, smelly fishing craft, but never did a ship of any description look so good to me, and as soon as they had lifted me aboard, I fell to the bottom of the boat and lay there until one of the old men in charge came and lifted me up and offered me hot tea. The tea helped to warm me up considerably, but my teeth chattered and my limbs shook as though afflicted with the ague. Soon we sighted another boat, which proved to be a cutter in search of any boats that might be adrift. They sighted us about the same time and turned their prow toward us, and in less than an hour they were alongside and we were transferred, I having to be carried, and we found that they had picked up several other boat loads, as we recognized many of our friends with whom we had become acquainted aboard the Lusitania. A stewardess took my clothes, all I had on was a raincoat and shoes and stockings, and dried them. We were given more tea, and by the time land was sighted, we were in fairly good shape. From then until we arrived at Queenstown, the time was spent in endeavouring to locate relatives or friends who might have been rescued by the same ship we were on now, and those who were successful were overjoyed. But those who searched in vain were to be pitied. Having no relatives accompanying me, I, of course, could but sympathise with those who were less fortunate and notwithstanding the fact that I have seen much sorrow in my life, it seemed to me that this must be a crowning sorrow, and I broke down completely when called upon to view the intense suffering of those mothers and wives and husbands. One young man whom I had met came to me and endeavoured to control himself, but with tears streaming down his cheeks, told me in a broken voice that he has lost his Mary. 
I remembered her as having sung the rosary on the night of the Lusitania musical. For a moment he turned and gazed out to sea, as though he was taking a last look at the resting place of his wife, who had not ceased to be his sweetheart. Then, seeming to gain composure, he turned to me, and in a slow, steady tone, with his right hand raised to heaven, he said, Before God and man, I swear, that as soon as I set foot on land, I will become a member of the king's army, and I will never rest until I have had vengeance for the murder of my wife, or until I lose my own in attempting my revenge. There were many similar scenes, but many more where grief was too deep for composure. It was these that were responsible for my breakdown. Those bowed heads, the trembling bodies as sob after sob came forth, were more than I could bear, and I collapsed. Upon arrival at Queenstown, I was assisted to a hotel where I received every kindness. After a day of rest, I felt able to be about, and as I had lost all of my money, as well as clothing, with the Lusitania, I was forced to wear a suit provided by some kind person at the hotel. Being anxious to resume my journey and to arrive in London at the earliest possible moment, I did not tarry in Queenstown longer than was necessary, but made ready to leave on the earliest train in order to be with my dear sons, as I felt that I could better bear the terrible reaction that must follow if I had them about me. I may have made a feeble attempt to set before you in detail the circumstances surrounding the sinking of the Lusitania, but I pray that it may not be as futile in interest as lacking in expression. That it was murder we cannot doubt, and for this murder we must have what reparation we can get by decisively defeating the perpetrators of such a dastardly and cowardly deed. But the greatest of all punishments that we on earth can give to these murderers and baby-killers is to stand organized to the last man if necessary, and take from them their military power that was so complete, and force them to their knees, begging for mercy in their impotency. Our men will treat their women with respect, and well they know that no man who belongs to the army of Britain would lose a torpedo to murder their wives and mothers, but I trust and pray that the time will come when they will hear the echoes of the screams of the dying as our women and babies sank to their death. End of The Death of the Lusitania by Mrs. P. Amory The Decline of the Drama by Stephen Leacock This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1910 was an important year. Halley's Comet came along, and some predicted the end of the world. And Stephen Leacock's first humorous book, Literary Lapses was published. First humorous book, I said, for Mr. Leacock, who is professor of political economy at McGill University, Montreal, had published his Elements of Political Science in 1906. It seems to me that I have heard that Literary Lapses was obscurely or privately published in Canada before 1910 that Mr. John Lane, the famous London publisher, was given a copy by someone as he got on a steamer to go home to England, that he read it on the voyage and cabled an offer for it as soon as he landed. This is very vague in my mind, but it sounds probable. At any rate, since that time, Professor Leacock's humorous volumes have appeared with gratifying regularity. Nonsense novels, Behind the Beyond, etc. And some were serious books, too, such as Essays and Literary Studies and The Unsolved Riddle of Social Justice. 
One of the unsolved riddles of social injustice is why should Professor Leacock be so much more amusing than most people? We usually think of him as a Canadian, but he was born in England in 1869. Coming up home the other night in my car, the Guy Street car, I heard a man who was hanging onto a strap say, The drama is just turning into a bunch of talk. This set me thinking, and I was glad that it did, because I'm being paid by this paper to think once a week, and it is wearing. Some days I never think from morning till night. This decline of the drama is a thing on which I feel deeply and bitterly. For I am, or I have been, something of an actor myself. I have only been in amateur work, I admit, but still I have played some mighty interesting parts. I have acted in Shakespeare as a citizen. I have been a fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I was once one end, choice of ends, of a camel in a pantomime. I have had other parts, too, such as a voice speaks from within, or a noise is heard without, or a bell rings from behind, and a lot of things like that. I played as a noise for seven nights before crowded houses where people were being turned away from the door, and I have been a groan and a sigh and a tumult, and once I was a vision passes before the sleeper. So when I talk of acting and of the spirit of the drama, I speak of what I know. Naturally, too, I was brought into contact, very often into quite intimate personal contact, with some of the greatest actors of the day. I don't say it in any way of boasting, but merely because to those of us who love the stage, all dramatic souvenirs are interesting. I remember, for example, that when Wilson Barrett played the bat and had to wear the queer suit with the scales, it was I who put the glue on him. And I recall a conversation with Sir Henry Irving one night when he said to me, Fetch me a glass of water, will you? And I said, Sir Henry, it is not only a pleasure to get it, but it is to me, as a humble devotee of the art that you have ennobled, a high privilege. I will go further, do, he said. Henry was like that, quick, sympathetic, what we call in French vibrant. Forbes Robertson, I shall never forget, he owes me 50 cents. And as for Martin Harvey, I simply cannot call him Sir John. We are such dear old friends. He never comes to this town without at once calling in my services to lend a hand in his production. No doubt, everybody knows that splendid play in which he appears called The Breed of the Treshams. There is a torture scene in it, a most gruesome thing. Harvey, as the hero, has to be tortured not on the stage itself, but off stage in a little room at the side. You can hear him howling as he is tortured. Well, it was I who was torturing him. We are so used to working together that Harvey didn't want to let anybody do it but me. So naturally, I am a keen friend and student of the drama, and I hate to think of it going all to pieces. The trouble with it is that it is becoming a mere mass of conversation and reflection. Nothing happens in it. The action is all gone out of it, and there is nothing left but thought. When actors begin to think, it is time for a change. They are not fitted for it. Now in my day, I mean when I was at the apogee of my reputation, I think that is the word. It may be apology. I forget. Things were very different. What we wanted was action, striking, climatic, catastrophic action, in which things not only happened, but happened suddenly and all in a lump. And we always took care that the action happened in some place that was worthwhile, not simply in an ordinary room with ordinary furniture, the way it is in the new drama. 
the scene was laid in a lighthouse, top story, or in a madhouse at midnight, or in a powerhouse, or a doghouse, or a bathhouse. In short, in some place with a distinct local color and atmosphere. I remember in the case of the first play I ever wrote, I write plays too, the manager to whom I submitted it asked me at once, the moment he glanced at it, where is the action of this laid? It is laid, I answered, in the main sewer of a great city. Good, good, he said, keep it there. In the case of another play, the manager said to me, What are you doing for atmosphere? The opening act, I said, is in a steam laundry. Very good, he answered as he turned over the pages, and have you brought in a condemned cell? I told him that I had not. That's rather unfortunate, he said, because we are especially anxious to bring in a condemned cell. Three of the big theaters have got them this season, and I think we ought to have it in. Can you do it? Yes, I said. I can if it's wanted. I'll look through the cast, and no doubt I can find one at least of them that ought to be put to death. Yes, yes, said the manager enthusiastically. I am sure you can. But I think of all the settings that we used, the lighthouse plays were the best. There is something about a lighthouse that you don't get in a modern drawing room. What it is, I don't know, but there is a difference. I always have liked a lighthouse play and never have enjoyed acting so much, have never thrown myself into acting so deeply as in a play of that sort. There is something about a lighthouse, the way you see it in the earlier scenes, with the lantern shining out over the black waters that suggests security, fidelity, faithfulness, to a trust. The stage used generally to be dim in the first part of a lighthouse play, and you can see the huddled figures of the fishermen and their wives on the foreshore pointing out to the sea, the back of the stage. See, one cried with his arm extended, there is lightning in yon sky. I was the lightning, and that was my cue for it. God help all the poor souls at sea tonight. Then a woman cried, Look, look, a boat upon the reef. And as she said it, I had to rush around and work the boat to make it go up and down properly. Then there was more lightning, and someone screamed out, Look, see, there's a woman in the boat. There wasn't really, it was me. But in the darkness, it was all the same. And of course, the heroine herself couldn't be there yet because she had to be downstairs getting dressed to be drowned. Then they all cried out, poor soul, she's doomed. And all the fishermen ran up and down making a noise. Fishermen in those plays used to get fearfully excited. And what with the excitement and the darkness and the bright beams of the lighthouse falling on the wet oilskins and the thundering of the sea upon the reef. Ah, me, those were plays. That was acting. And to think that there isn't a single streak of lightning in any play on the boards this year. And then the kind of climax that a play like this used to have. The scene shifted right at the moment of the excitement, and lo, we are in the tower, the top story of the lighthouse, interior scene. All is still and quiet within, with the bright light of the reflectors flooding the little room and the roar of the storm heard like muffled thunder outside. The lighthouse keeper trims his lamps. How firm and quiet and rugged he looks. The snows of sixty winters are on his head, but his eye is clear and his grip strong. Hear the howl of the wind as he opens the door and steps forth upon the iron balcony, eighty feet above the water, and peers out upon the storm. God pity all the poor souls at sea, he says. They all say that. If you get used to it and get to like it, you want to hear it said, no matter how often they say it. The waves raged beneath him. I threw it at him, really, but the effect was wonderful. And then, as he comes in from the storm to the still room, the climax breaks. 
A man staggers into the room in oilskins drenched, wet, breathless. They all staggered in these plays, and in the new drama they walk, and the effect is feebleness itself. He points to the sea. A boat! A boat upon the reef with a woman in it! And the lighthouse keeper knows that it is his only daughter, the only one that he has, who is being cast to death upon the reef. Then comes the dilemma. They want him for the lifeboat. No one can take it through the surf but him. You know that because the other man says so himself. But if he goes in the boat, then the great light will go out. Untended, it cannot live in the storm. And if it goes out, ah, uh, if it goes out, ask of the angry waves and the resounding rocks of what tonight's long toll of death must be without the light. I wish you could have seen it, you who only see the drawing room plays of today, the scene when the lighthouse man draws himself up calm and resolute and says, My place is here. God's will be done. And you know that as he says it and turns quietly to his lamps again, the boat is drifting at that very moment to the rocks. How did they save her? My dear sir, if you can ask that question, you little understand the drama as it was. Save her? No, of course they didn't save her. What we wanted in the old drama was reality and force, no matter how wild and tragic it might be. They did not save her. They found her the next day, in the concluding scene. All that was left of her when she was dashed upon the rocks, her ribs were broken, her bottom boards had been smashed in, her gunwale was gone. In short, she was a wreck. The girl? Oh, yes, certainly they saved the girl. That kind of thing was always taken care of. You see, just as the lighthouse man said, God's will be done, his eyes fell on the long coil of rope hanging there. Providential, wasn't it? But then we were not ashamed to use providence in the old drama. So he made a noose in it and threw it over the balcony and hauled the girl up on it. I used to hook her on to it every night. A rotten play? Oh, I'm sure it must have been. But somehow those of us who were brought up on that sort of thing still sigh for it. End of The Decline of the Drama by Stephen Leacock Read by Penny Witt Eratosthenes of Alexandria by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Eratosthenes of Alexandria, circa 276 to circa 194 BC. Greek scientific writer was born at Cyrene. He studied grammar under Kalimachus at Alexandria and philosophy under the Stoic Ariston and the academic Arcesilaus at Athens. He returned to Alexandria at the summons of Ptolemy III Euregetes, by whom he was appointed chief librarian in place of Kalimachus. He is said to have died of voluntary starvation, being threatened with total blindness. Eratosthenes was one of the most learned men of antiquity, and wrote on a great number of subjects. He was the first to call himself Philologos, in the sense of the friend of learning, and the name Pentatlos was bestowed upon him in honor of his varied accomplishments. He was also called Beta, as being second in all branches of learning, though not actually first in any. In mathematics he wrote two books, on means, Perimesotiton, which are lost, but appear from a remark of Pappus to have dealt with, quote, loci with reference to means, end quote. He devised a mechanical construction for two mean proportionals reproduced by Pappus and Eutochius, commentaries on Archimedes. His coskinon, or sieve, Cribrum Eratosthenes, was a device for discovering all prime numbers. 
he laid the foundation of mathematical geography in his geographica in three books his greatest achievement was his measurement of the earth being informed that at siene aswan on the day of the summer solstice at noon a well was lit up through all its depth so that siene lay on the tropic he measured at the same hour the zenith distance of the sun at alexandria he thus found the distance between siene and alexandria known to be five thousand stadia to correspond to one fiftieth of a great circle and so arrived at two hundred fifty thousand stadia which he seems subsequently to have corrected to two hundred and fifty two thousand as the circumference of the earth he is credited by ptolemy and his commentator theon with having found the distance between the tropics to be eleven eighty thirds of the meridian circle which gives twenty three degrees fifty one minutes and twenty seconds for the obliquity of the ecliptic his astronomical poem hermes began apparently with the birth and exploits of hermes then passed to the legend of his having ordered the heavens the zones and the stars and gave a history of the latter his erigone of which a few fragments are also preserved is sometimes spoken of as a separate poem but it may have belonged to the hermes which appears also to have been known by other names such as catalogi the still extant catasterismi containing the story of certain stars in prose is probably not by eratosthenes eratosthenes was the founder of scientific chronology in his chronographia in which he endeavoured to fix the dates of the chief literary and political events from the conquest of troy an important work was his treatise on the old comedy dealing with theatres and theatrical apparatus generally and discussing the works of the principal comic poets themselves works on moral philosophy history and a number of letters were also attributed to him End of eratosthenes of alexandria the fantastic imagination by george macdonald this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devorah Allen. The Fantastic Imagination. That we have in English no word corresponding to the German Märchen drives us to use the word fairy tale, regardless of the fact that the tale may have nothing to do with any sort of fairy. The old use of the word fairy, by Spencer at least, might, however, well be adduced where justification or excuse necessary, where need must. Were I asked what is a fairy tale, I should reply, read Undine, that is a fairy tale. Then read this and that as well, and you will see what is a fairy tale. Were I further begged to describe the fairy tale or define what it is, I would make answer that I should as soon think of describing the abstract human face or stating what must go to constitute a human being. A fairy tale is just a fairy tale, as a face is just a face, and of all fairy tales I know, I think Undine the most beautiful. Many a man, however, who would not attempt to define a man, might venture to say something as to what a man ought to be. Even so much I will not in this place venture with regard to the fairy tale for my long past work in that kind might but poorly instance or illustrate my now more mature judgment. I will but say some things helpful to the reading, in right-minded fashion, of such fairy tales as I would wish to write or care to read. Some thinkers would feel sorely hampered if at liberty to use no forms but such as existed in nature, or to invent nothing save in accordance with the laws of the world of the senses. But it must not therefore be imagined that they desire escape from the region of law. Nothing lawless can show the least reason why it should exist, or could at best have more than an appearance of life. The natural world has its laws, and no man must interfere with them in the way of presentment any more than in the way of use. But they themselves may suggest laws of other kinds, and man may, if he pleases, invent a little world of his own, with its own laws. For there is that in him which delights in calling up new forms, which is the nearest, perhaps, he can come to creation. 
When such forms are new embodiments of old truths, we call them products of the imagination. When they are mere inventions, however lovely, I should call them the work of the fancy. In either case, law has been diligently at work. His world once invented, the highest law that comes next into play is that there shall be harmony between the laws by which the new world has begun to exist. And in the process of his creation, the inventor must hold by those laws. The moment he forgets one of them, he makes the story, by its own postulates, incredible. To be able to live a moment in an imagined world, we must see the laws of its existence obeyed. Those broken, we fall out of it. The imagination in us, whose exercise is essential to the most temporary submission to the imagination of another, immediately, with the disappearance of law, ceases to act. Suppose the gracious creatures of some childlike region of fairyland talking either Cockney or Gascon. Would not the tale, however lovelily begun, sink at once to the level of the burlesque, of all forms of literature the least worthy? A man's inventions may be stupid or clever, but if he do not hold by the laws of them, or if he make one law jar with another, he contradicts himself as an inventor. He is no artist. He does not rightly consort his instruments, or he tunes them in different keys. The mind of man is the product of live law. It thinks by law, it dwells in the midst of law, it gathers from law its growth. With law, therefore, can it alone work to any result. Inharmonious, unconsorting ideas will come to a man, but if he try to use one of such, his work will grow dull, and he will drop it from mere lack of interest. Law is the soil in which alone beauty will grow. Beauty is the only stuff in which truth can be clothed. And you may, if you will, call imagination the tailor that cuts her garments to fit her, and fancy his journeyman that puts the pieces of them together, or perhaps at most embroiders their buttonholes. Obeying law, the maker works like his creator. Not obeying law, he is such a fool as heaps a pile of stones and calls it a church. In the moral world it is different. There a man may clothe in new forms, and for this employ his imagination freely, but he must invent nothing. He may not, for any purpose, turn its laws upside down. He must not meddle with the relations of live souls. The laws of the spirit of man must hold, alike in this world and in any world he may invent. It were no offense to suppose a world in which everything repelled instead of attracted the things around it. It would be wicked to write a tale representing a man it called good as always doing bad things, or a man it called bad as always doing good things. The notion itself is absolutely lawless. In physical things a man may invent. In moral things he must obey, and take their laws with him into his invented world as well. You write as if a fairy tale were a thing of importance. Must it have a meaning? It cannot help having some meaning. If it have proportion and harmony, it has vitality, and vitality is truth. The beauty may be plainer in it than the truth, but without the truth the beauty could not be, and the fairy tale would give no delight. Everyone, however, who reads the story will read its meaning after his own nature and development. One man will read one meaning in it, another will read another. If so, how am I to assure myself that I am not reading my own meaning into it, but yours out of it? Why should you be so assured? It may be better that you should read your meaning into it. That may be a higher operation of your intellect than the mere reading of mine out of it. Your meaning may be superior to mine. Suppose my child asks me what the fairy tale means. What am I to say? If you do not know what it means, what is easier than to say so? If you do see a meaning in it, there it is for you to give him. A genuine work of art must mean many things. The truer its art, the more things it will mean. If my drawing, on the other hand, 
is so far from being a work of art that it needs this is a horse written under it what can it matter that neither you nor your child should know what it means it is there not so much to convey a meaning as to wake a meaning if it do not even wake an interest throw it aside a meaning may be there but it is not for you if again you do not know a horse when you see it the name written under it will not serve you much at all events the business of the painter is not to teach zoology but indeed your children are not likely to trouble you about the meaning they find what they are capable of finding and more would be too much for my part i do not write for children but for the child like whether of 5 or 50 or 75 a fairy tale is not an allegory there may be allegory in it but it is not an allegory he must be an artist indeed who can in any mode produce a strict allegory that is not a weariness to the spirit an allegory must be mastery or mordich a fairy tale like a butterfly or a bee helps itself on all sides sips at every wholesome flower and spoils not one the true fairy tale is to my mind very like the sonata we all know that a sonata means something and where there is the faculty of talking with suitable vagueness and choosing metaphor sufficiently loose mind may approach mind in the interpretation of a sonata with the result of more or less contenting consciousness of sympathy but if two or three men sat down to write each what the sonata meant to him what approximation to definite idea would be the result little enough and that little more than needful we should find it had roused related if not identical feelings but probably not one common thought has the sonata therefore failed had it undertaken to convey or ought it to be expected to impart anything to find anything notionally recognizable but words are not music words at least are meant and fitted to carry a precise meaning it is very seldom indeed that they carry the exact meaning of any user of them and if they can be so used as to convey definite meaning it does not follow that they ought never to carry anything else words are live things that may be variously employed to various ends they can convey a scientific fact or throw a shadow of her child's dream on the heart of a mother they are things to put together like the pieces of a dissected map or to arrange like the notes on a staff is the music in them to go for nothing it can hardly help the definiteness of a meaning is it therefore to be disregarded they have length and breadth and outline have they nothing to do with depth have they only to describe never to impress has nothing any claim to their use but the definite the cause of a child's tears may be altogether undefinable has the mother therefore no antidote for his vague misery that may be strong in color which has no evident outline a fairy tale a sonata a gathering storm a limitless night seizes you and sweeps you away do you begin at once to wrestle with it and ask whence its power over you whither it is carrying you the law of each is in the mind of its composer that law makes one man feel this way another man feel that way to one the sonata is a world of odor and beauty to another of soothing only and sweetness to one the cloudy rendezvous is a wild dance with a terror at its heart to another a majestic march of heavenly hosts with truth in their center pointing their course but as yet restraining her voice the greatest forces lie in the region of the uncomprehended i will go farther the best thing you can do for your fellow next to rousing his conscience is not to give him things to think about but to wake things up that are in him or say to make him think things for himself the best nature does for us is to work in us such moods in which the thoughts of high import arise 
Does any aspect of nature wake but one thought? Does she ever suggest only one definite thing? Does she make any two men in the same place at the same moment think the same thing? Is she, therefore, a failure, because she is not definite? Is it nothing that she rouses the something deeper than the understanding, the power that underlies thoughts? Does she not set feeling, and so thinking, at work? Would it be better that she did this after one fashion, and not after many fashions? Nature is mood-engendering, thought-provoking. Such ought the sonata, such ought the fairy tale to be. But a man may then imagine in your work what he pleases, what you never meant. Not what he pleases, but what he can. If he be not a true man, he will draw evil out of the best. We need not mind how he treats any work of art. If he be a true man, he will imagine true things. What matter whether I meant them or not? They are there nonetheless that I cannot claim putting them there. One difference between God's work and man's is that, while God's work cannot mean more than he meant, man's must mean more than he meant. For in everything that God has made, there is layer upon layer of ascending significance. Also, he expresses the same thought in higher and higher kinds of that thought. It is God's things, his embodied thoughts, which alone a man has to use, modified and adapted to his own purposes for the expression of his thoughts. Therefore, he cannot help his words and figures falling into such combinations in the mind of another as he had himself not foreseen. So many are the thoughts allied to every other thought. So many are the relations involved in every figure. So many the facts hinted in every symbol. A man may well himself discover truth in what he wrote. For he was dealing all the time with things that came from thoughts beyond his own. But surely you would explain your idea to one who asked you. I say again, if I cannot draw a horse, I will not write, this is a horse, under what I foolishly meant for one. Any key to a work of imagination would be nearly, if not quite, as absurd. The tale is there, not to hide, but to show. If it show nothing at your window, do not open your door to it. Leave it out in the cold. To ask me to explain is to say, Roses, boil them, or we won't have them. My tale may not be roses, but I will not boil them. So long as I think my dog can bark, I will not sit up to bark for him. If a writer's aim be logical conviction, he must spare no logical pains, not merely to be understood, but to escape being misunderstood. Where his object is to move by suggestion, to cause to imagine, then let him assail the soul of his reader as the wind assails an aeolian harp. If there be music in my reader, I would gladly wake it. Let fairy tale of mine go for a firefly, that now flashes, now is dark, but may flash again. Caught in a hand which does not love its kind, it will turn to an insignificant, ugly thing, that can neither flash nor fly. The best way with music, I imagine, is not to bring the forces of our intellect to bear upon it, but to be still and let it work on that part of us for whose sake it exists. We spoil countless precious things by intellectual greed. He who will be a man and will not be a child must, he cannot help himself, become a little man, that is, a dwarf. He will, however, need no consolation, for he is sure to think himself a very large creature indeed. If any strain of my broken music make a child's eyes flash, or his mother's grow for a moment dim, my labor will not have been in vain. End of The Fantastic Imagination by George MacDonald Fort Duquesne and Fort Pitt, Early Names of Pittsburgh Streets, published by Fort Pitt Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, 
of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Fort Duquesne. Conflicting Claims of France and England in North America. On maps of British America in the earlier part of the 18th century, one sees the eastern coast, from Maine to Georgia, gashed with ten or twelve colored patches, very different in size and shape, and defined more or less distinctly by dividing lines, which in some cases are prolonged westward until they reach the Mississippi, or even across it and stretch indefinitely towards the Pacific. These patches are the British provinces, and the western prolongation of their boundary represents their several claims to vast interior tracts founded on ancient grants, but not made good by occupation or vindicated by an exertion of power. Each province remained in jealous isolation, busied with its own work, growing in strength, in the capacity of self-rule, in the spirit of independence, and stubbornly resisting all exercise of authority from without. If the English-speaking population flowed westward, it was in obedience to natural laws, for the king did not aid the movement, and the royal governor had no authority to do so. The power of the colonies was that of a rising flood, slowly invading and conquering by the unconscious force of its own growing volume, unless means be found to hold it back by dams and embankments within appointed limits. In the French colonies it was different. Here the representatives of the crown were men bred in the atmosphere of broad ambition and masterful far-reaching enterprise. They studied the strong and weak points of their rivals, and with a cautious forecast and a daring energy set themselves to the task of defeating them. If the English colonies were comparatively strong in numbers, these numbers could not be brought into action, while if French forces were small, they were vigorously commanded and always ready at a word. It was union confronting division, energy confronting apathy, and military centralization opposed to industrial democracy, and for a time the advantage was all on one side. Yet in view of what France had achieved, of the patient gallantry of her explorers, the zeal of her missionaries, the adventurous hardihood of her bushrangers, revealing to mankind the existence of this wilderness world while her rivals plotted at their workshops, their farms, their fisheries. In view of all this, her pretensions were moderate and reasonable compared to those of England. Forks of the Ohio, Washington's First Visit The Treaty of Utrecht had decided that the Iroquois, or Five Nations, were British subjects, Therefore, it was insisted that all countries conquered by them belonged to the English crown. The range of the Iroquois war parties was prodigious, and the English laid claim to every mountain, forest, and prairie where an Iroquois had taken a scalp. This would give them not only all between the Alleghenies and the Mississippi, but all between Ottawa and Huron, leaving nothing to France but the part now occupied by the province of Quebec. The Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, and that of aix la chapelle in 1748, were supposed to settle the disputed boundaries of the French and English possessions in America. France, however, repented of her enforced concessions and claimed the whole American continent as hers, except a narrow strip of sea coast. To establish this boundary, it was resolved to build a line of forts from Canada to the Mississippi following the Ohio, for they perceived that the forks of the Ohio, so strangely neglected by the English, formed together with Niagara, the key of the Great West. This chain of forts began at Niagara, then another was built of squared logs at Prescott Isle, now Erie, and a third called Fort Leboeuf, on what is now called French Creek. Here the work stopped for a time, and Le Gardeur de Saint-Pierre went into winter quarters with a small garrison at Fort Leboeuf. On the 11th of December, 1753, Major General George Washington, with Christopher Gist as guide, Abraham Van Braam as interpreter, and several woodsmen, presented himself as a bearer of a letter from Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia, to the commander of Fort Leboeuf. He was kindly received. In fact, no form of courtesy was omitted during the three days occupied by Saint-Pierre in framing his reply to Governor Dinwiddie's letter. This letter expressed astonishment that his, Saint-Pierre's, troops should build forts upon land so notoriously known to be the property of Great Britain, and demanded that their immediate and peaceable departure occur. In his answer, Saint-Pierre said he acted in accordance with the commands of his general, that he would forward Governor Dinwiddie's letter to the Marquis Duquesne and await his orders. It was on his return journey that Washington twice escaped death, first from the gun of a French Indian, then in attempting to cross the Allegheny, which was filled with ice, on a raft that he and his companions had hastily constructed with the help of one hatchet between them. He was thrown into the river and narrowly escaped drowning, but Gist succeeded in dragging him out of the water, and the party landed on Wainwright's Island, about opposite the foot of 33rd Street. 
On making his report, Washington recommended that a fort be built at the Forks of the Ohio. Men and money were necessary to make good Governor Dinwiddie's demand that the French evacuate the territory they had appropriated. These he found it difficult to get. He dispatched letters, orders, couriers from New Jersey to South Carolina asking aid. Massachusetts and New York were urged to make a feint against Canada, but as the land belonged to either Pennsylvania or Virginia, the other colonies did not care to vote money to defend them. In Pennsylvania, the placid obstinacy of the Quakers was matched by the solid obstinacy of the German farmers. Notwithstanding, Pennsylvania voted 60,000 pounds and raised 1,200 men at 18 pence per day. All Dinwiddie could muster elsewhere was the promise of three or four hundred men from North Carolina, two companies from New York, and one from South Carolina, with what recruits he could gather in Virginia. In accordance with Washington's recommendation, Captain William Trent, once an Indian trader of the better class, now a commissioned officer, had been sent with a company of backwoodsmen to build a fort at the Forks of the Ohio, and it was hoped he would fortify himself sufficiently to hold the position. Trent began the fort, but left it with forty men under Ensign Ward, and went back to join Washington. The recruits gathered in Virginia were to be commanded by Joshua Fry, with Washington as second in command. Fort Duquesne, Washington at Fort Necessity On the 17th of April, 1754, Ward was surprised by the appearance of a swarm of canoes and bateaux descending the Allegheny, carrying, according to Ward, about 1,000 Frenchmen, who landed, planted their cannon, and summoned the ensign to surrender. He promptly complied and was allowed to depart with all his men. The French soon demolished the unfinished fort and built in its place a much larger and better one, calling it Fort Duquesne, in honor of the Marquis Duquesne, then governor of Canada. Washington, with his detachment of ragged recruits, without tents and scarcely armed, was at Wills Creek, about 140 miles from the forks of the Ohio, and he was deeply chagrined when Ward joined him and reported the loss of the fort. Dinwiddie then ordered Washington to advance. In order to do so, a road must be cut for wagons and cannon through a dense forest. Two mountain ranges must be crossed, and innumerable hills and streams. Towards the end of May, he reached Great Meadows with 150 men. While encamped here, Washington learned that a detachment of French had marched from the fort in order to attack him. They met in a rocky hollow, and a short fight ensued. Coulon de Jumonville, the commander, was killed. All the French were taken prisoners or killed except one Canadian. This skirmish was the beginning of the war. Washington then advanced as far as Christopher Gist's settlement, 12 or 14 miles on the other side of the Laurel Ridge. He soon heard that strong reinforcements had been sent to Fort Duquesne, and that another detachment was even then on the march, under Coulon de Villiers. And so, on June 28th, he began to retreat. Not having enough horses, the men had to carry the baggage on their backs, and drag nine swivels over miserable roads. Two days brought them to Great Meadows, and they had but one full day to strengthen the slight fortification they had made there, which Washington named Fort Necessity. The fighting began at eleven and lasted for nine hours, the English notwithstanding their half-starved condition and their want of ammunition, keeping their ground against double their number. When darkness came, a parley was sounded, to which Washington at first paid no attention, but when the French repeated the proposal and requested that an officer might be sent, he could refuse no longer. There were but two in Washington's command who could understand French, and one of them was wounded. Captain Van Bram, a Dutchman, acted as interpreter. The articles were signed about midnight. The English troops were to march out with drums beating, carrying with them all their property. The prisoners taken in the Jumonville affair were to be released, Captain Van Bram and Major Stobo to be detained as hostages, for their safe return to Fort Duquesne. This defeat was disastrous to the English. There was now not an English flag waving west of the Alleghenies. Villiers went back exultant to Fort Duquesne, and Washington began his wretched march to Wills Creek. No horses, no cattle, most of the baggage must be left behind, while the sick and wounded must be carried over the Alleghenies on the backs of their weary, half-starved comrades. And this was the 4th of July, 1754. The conditions of the surrender were never carried out. The prisoners taken in the skirmish with Jumonville were not returned. Van Bram and Stobo were detained for some time at Fort Duquesne, then sent to Quebec, where they were kept prisoners for several years. While a prisoner on parole, Major Stobo made good use of his opportunities by acquainting himself with the neighborhood. Afterwards, he was kept in close confinement and endured great hardships, but in the spring of 1759 he succeeded in making his escape in the most miraculous manner. While Wolfe was besieging Quebec, he returned from Halifax, and, it is said, it was he who guided the troops up the narrow wooded path to the heights of Abraham. Strange that one taken prisoner in a far distant province, in a skirmish which began the war, should guide the gallant Wolfe to victory at Quebec, which virtually closed the war in America. Braddock 
Nothing of importance was done in Virginia and Pennsylvania until the arrival of Braddock in February 1755, bringing with him two regiments. Governor Dinwiddie hailed his arrival with joy, hoping that his troubles would now come to an end. Of Braddock, Governor Dinwiddie's secretary, Shirley, wrote to Governor Morris, We have a general most judiciously chosen for being disqualified for the service he is in in almost every respect. Braddock issued a call to the provincial governors to meet him in council, which was answered by Dinwiddie of Virginia, Dobbs of North Carolina, Sharp of Maryland, Morris of Pennsylvania, Delancey of New York, and Shirley of Massachusetts. The result was a plan to attack the French at four points at once. Braddock was to advance on Fort Duquesne, Fort Niagara was to be reduced, Crown Point seized, and a body of men from New England to capture Beausejour and Acadia. We will follow Braddock. In his case, prompt action was of the utmost importance, but this was impossible, as the people refused to furnish the necessary supplies. Franklin, who was postmaster general in Pennsylvania, was visiting Braddock's camp with his son when the report of the agent sent to collect wagons was brought in. The number was so wholly inadequate that Braddock stormed, saying the expedition was at an end. Franklin said it was a pity he had not landed in Pennsylvania, where he might have found horses and wagons more plentiful. Braddock begged him to use his influence to obtain the necessary supply, and Franklin, on his return to Pennsylvania, issued an address to the farmers. In about two weeks, a sufficient number was furnished, and at last the march began. He reached Wills Creek on May 10, 1755, where fortifications had been erected by the colonial troops, and called Fort Cumberland. Here Braddock assembled a force numbering about 2,200. Although Braddock despised the provincial troops and the Indians, he honored Colonel George Washington, who commanded the troops from Virginia, by placing him on his staff. A month elapsed before this army was ready to leave Fort Cumberland. Three hundred axemen led the way, the long, long train of pack horses, wagons, and cannon following, as best they could, along the narrow track, over stumps and rocks and roots. The road cut was but twelve feet wide, so that the line of march was sometimes four miles long, and the difficulties in the way were so great that it was impossible to move more than three miles a day. On the 18th of June they reached Little Meadows, not thirty miles from Fort Cumberland, where a report reached them that 500 regulars were on their way to reinforce Fort Duquesne. Washington advised Braddock to leave the heavy baggage and press forward, and following this advice, the next day, June 19th, the advance corps of about 1,200 soldiers with what artillery was thought indispensable, 30 wagons, and a number of pack horses began its march, but the delays were such that it did not reach the mouth of Turtle Creek until July 7th. The distance to Fort Duquesne by a direct route was about eight miles, but the way was difficult and perilous so Braddock crossed the Monongahela and recrossed farther down at one o'clock. Washington describes the scene at the ford with admiration. The music, the banners, the mounted officers, the troops of light cavalry, the naval detachment, the red-coated regulars, the blue-coated Virginians, the wagons and tumbrils, the cannon, howitzers, and cohorns, the track of pack horses and droves of cattle passed in long procession through the rippling shallows and slowly entered the forest. Fort Duquesne was a strong little fort, compactly built of logs, close to the point of where the waters of the Allegheny and the Monongahela unite. Two sides were protected by these waters, and the other two by ravelins, a ditch and glasses and a covered way, enclosed by a massive stockade. The garrison consisted of a few companies of regulars and Canadians, and 800 Indian warriors, under the command of Contrecoeur. The captains under him were Beaujeu, Dumas, and Lunier. When the scouts brought the intelligence that the English were within six leagues of the fort, the French, in great excitement and alarm, decided to march at once and ambuscade them at the ford. The Indians at first refused to move, but Beaujeu, dressed as one of them, finally persuaded them to march, and they filed off along the forest trail that led to the ford of the Monongahela, six hundred Indians and about three hundred regulars and Canadians. They did not reach the ford in time to make the attack there. Braddock's Defeat Braddock advanced carefully through the dense and silent forest, when suddenly this silence was broken by the war-whoop of the savages, of whom not one was visible. Gage's column wheeled deliberately into line and fired, and at first the English seemed to carry everything before them, for the Canadians were seized by a panic and fled, but the scarlet coats of the English furnished good targets for their invisible enemies. The Indians, yelling their war cries, swarmed in the forest, but were so completely hidden in gullies and ravines, behind trees and bushes and fallen trunks, that only the trees were struck by volley after volley fired by the English, who at last broke ranks and huddled together in a bewildered mass. Both men and officers were ignorant of this mode of warfare. The Virginians alone were equal to the emergency, and might have held the enemy in check, but when Braddock found them hiding behind trees and bushes, as the Indians, he became so furious at the seeming want of courage and discipline that he ordered them with oaths to join the line, even beating them with his sword, 
they replying to his threats and commands that they would fight if they could see anyone to fight with. The ground was strewn with the dead and dying, maddened horses were plunging about, the roar of musketry and cannon, and above all the yells that came from the throats of six hundred invisible savages, formed a chaos of anguish and terror indescribable. Braddock saw that all was lost in order to retreat, but had scarcely done so when a bullet pierced his lungs. It is alleged that the shot was fired by one of his own men, but this statement is without proof. The retreat soon turned into a rout. All who remained dashed pell-mell through the river to the opposite shore, abandoning the wounded, the cannon, and all the baggage and papers to the mercy of the Indians. Beaujeu had fallen early in the conflict. Dumas and Lignoret did not pursue the fleeing enemy, but returned to the fort, abandoning the field to the savages, which soon became a pandemonium of pillage and murder. Of the 86 English officers, all but 23 were killed or disabled, and but a remnant of the soldiers escaped. When the Indians returned to the fort, they brought with them 12 or 14 prisoners, their bodies blackened and their hands tied behind their backs. These were all burned to death on the bank of the Allegheny, opposite the fort. The loss of the French was slight. Of the regulars, there were but four killed or wounded, and all the Canadians returned to the fort unhurt, except five. The miserable remnant of Braddock's army continued their wild flight all that night and the next day, when before nightfall those who had not fainted by the way reached Christopher Gist's farm, but six miles from Dunbar's camp. The wounded general had shown an incredible amount of courage and endurance. After trying in vain to stop the flight, he was lifted onto a horse, when, fainting from the effects of his mortal wound, some of the men were induced by large bribes to carry him in a litter. Braddock ordered a detachment from the camp to go to the relief of the stragglers, but as the fugitives kept coming in with their tales of horror, panic seized the camp, and the soldiers and teamsters fled. The next day, whether from orders given by Braddock or Dunbar is not known, more than 100 wagons were burned, cannon, cohorns, and shells were destroyed, barrels of gunpowder were saved and the contents thrown into a brook, and provisions scattered about through the woods and swamps, while the enemy, with no thought of pursuit, had returned to Fort Duquesne. Braddock died on the 13th of July, 1755, and was buried on the road, men, horses, and wagons passing over the grave of their dead commander as they retreated to Fort Cumberland, thus effacing every trace of it, lest it should be discovered by the Indians and the body mutilated. Thus ended the attempt to capture Fort Duquesne, and for about three years, while the storm of blood and havoc raged elsewhere, that point was undisturbed. Brigadier General Forbes In the meantime, Dinwiddie had gone and a new governor was in his place, while in the plans of Pitt the capture of Fort Duquesne held an important place. Brigadier General John Forbes was charged with it. He was Scotch by birth, a well-bred man of the world, and unlike Braddock, by his conduct toward the provincial troops, commanded both the respect and affection of the colonists. He only resembled Braddock in his determined resolution, but he did not hesitate to embrace modes of warfare that Braddock would have scorned. He wrote to Bouquet, I have been long of your opinion of equipping numbers of our men like the savages, and I fancy Colonel Byrd of Virginia has most of his men equipped in that manner. In this country we must learn our art of war from the Indians, or anyone else who has carried it on here. He arrived in Philadelphia in April 1758, but it was the end of June before his troops were ready to march. His force consisted of Montgomery's Highlanders, 1,200 strong, provincials from Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, and a detachment of Royal Americans, amounting to about six or 7,000 men. The Royal Americans were Germans from Pennsylvania, the colonel-in-chief being Lord Amherst, Colonel Commandant Frederick Haldemand, and conspicuous among them was Lieutenant Colonel Henry Bouquet, a brave and accomplished Swiss who commanded one of the four battalions of which the regiment was composed. General Forbes was detained in Philadelphia by a painful and dangerous malady. Bouquet advanced and encamped at Raystown, now Bedford. Then arose the question of opening a new road through Pennsylvania to Fort Duquesne or following the old road made by Braddock. Washington, who commanded the Virginians, foretold the ruin of the expedition unless Braddock's road was chosen, but Forbes and Bouquet were firm, and it was decided to adopt the new route through Pennsylvania. Forbes was able to reach Carlisle early in July, but his disorder was so increased by the journey that he was not able to leave that place until the 11th of August, and then in a kind of litter swung between two horses. In this way he reached Shippensburg, where he lay helpless until far in September. His plan was to advance slowly, establishing fortified magazines as he went, and at last, when within easy distance of the fort, to advance upon it with all force, as little impeded as possible with wagons and pack horses. Having secured the magazines at Raystown and built a fort which he called Fort Bedford, in honor of his friend and patron, the Duke of Bedford, Bouquet was sent with his command to forward the heavy work of road-making over the main rage of the Alleghenies and the Laurel Hills, hewing, digging, blasting, laying fascines and gabions, 
to support the track along the sides of the steep declivities, or worming their way like moles through the jungle of swamp and forest. As far as the eye or mind could reach, a prodigious forest vegetation spread its impervious canopy over hill, valley, and plain. His next post was on the loyal Hannah Creek, scarcely fifty miles distant from Fort Duquesne, and here he built a fortification, naming it Fort Ligonier, in honor of Lord Ligonier, commander-in-chief of His Majesty's armies. Forbes had served under Ligonier, and his influence, together with that of the Duke of Bedford, secured to Forbes his appointment. Now came the difficult and important task of securing Indian allies. Sir William Johnston for the English, and John Kerr for the French, were trying in every way to frighten or cajole them into choosing sides, but that which neither of them could accomplish was done by a devoted Moravian missionary, Christian Frederick Post. Post spoke the Delaware language, had married a converted squaw, and by his simplicity, directness, and perfect honesty had gained their full confidence. He was a plain German, upheld by a sense of duty and single-hearted trust in God. The Moravians were apostles of peace, and they succeeded in a surprising way in weaning their converts from their vicious instincts and savage practices, while the Mission Indians of Canada retained all their native ferocity, and their wigwams were strung with scalps, male and female, adult and infant. These so-called missions were but nests of baptized savages who wore the crucifix instead of the medicine bag. Post accepted the dangerous mission as envoy to the camp of the hostile Indians, and making his way to a Delaware town on Beaver Creek, he was kindly received by the three kings, but when they conducted him to another town, he was surrounded by a crowd of warriors who threatened to kill him. He managed to pacify them, but they insisted that he should go with them to Fort Duquesne. In his journal, he gives thrilling accounts of his escape from dangers threatened by both the French and Indians but he at last succeeded in securing a promise from both Delaware and Shawnees, and other hostile tribes, to meet with the Five Nations, the governor of Pennsylvania, and commissioners from other promises in the town of Easton, before the middle of September. The result of this council was that the Indians accepted the white wampum belt of peace, and agreed on a joint message of peace to the tribes of Ohio. A few weeks before this, Colonel Bouquet, from his post at Fort Ligonier, forgot his usual prudence, and at his urgent request allowed Major Grant, commander of the Highlanders, to advance. On the 14th of September, at about 2 a.m., he reached an eminence about half a mile from the fort. He divided his forces, placing detachments in different positions, being convinced that the enemy was too weak to attack him. Infatuated with this idea, when the fog had cleared away, he ordered the Revaya to be sounded. It was as if he put his foot into a hornet's nest. The roll of drums was answered by a burst of war whoops, while the French came swarming out, many of them in their nightshirts just as they had jumped from their beds. There was a hot fight for about three quarters of an hour, when the Highlanders broke away in a wild flight. Captain Bullitt and his Virginians tried to cover the retreat, and fought until two-thirds of them were killed and Grant taken prisoner. The name of Grant's Hill still clings to the much-ambushed hump where the courthouse now stands. The French pushed their advantages with spirit, and there were many skirmishes in the forest between Fort Ligonier and Fort Duquesne, but their case was desperate. Their Indian allies had deserted them, and their supplies had been cut off. So Ligneri, who had succeeded Contrecoeur, was forced to dismiss the greater part of his force. The English, too, were enduring great hardships. Rain had continued almost without cessation all through September. The newly made road was liquid mud, into which the wagons sunk up to the hubs. In October, the rain changed to snow, while all this time Forbes was chained to a sickbed at Raystown, now Fort Bedford. In the beginning of November, he was carried from Fort Bedford to Fort Ligonier in a litter, and a council of officers, then held, decided to attempt nothing more that season. But a few days later, a report of the condition of the French was brought in, which led Forbes to give orders for an immediate advance. On November 18, 1758, 2,500 picked men, without tents or baggage, without wagons or artillery except a few light pieces, began their march. Fort Pitt French abandoned Fort Duquesne. Fort Pitt is built. On the evening of the 24th, they encamped on the hills around Turtle Creek, and at midnight the sentinels heard a heavy boom as if a magazine had exploded. In the morning the march was resumed. After the advance guard came Forbes, carried in a litter, the troops following in three columns, the Highlanders in the center, headed by Montgomery, the Royal Americans and Provincials on the right and left under Bouquet and Washington. Slowly they made their way beneath an endless entanglement of bare branches. The Highlanders were goaded to madness by seeing, as they approached the fort, the heads of their countrymen, who had fallen when Grant made his rash attack, stuck on poles, around which their plaids had been wrapped in imitation of petticoats. Foaming with rage, they rushed forward, abandoning their muskets and drawing their broadswords, but their fury was in vain, for when they reached a point where the fort should have been in sight, 
There was nothing between them and the hills on the opposite banks of the Monongahela and Allegheny, but a mass of blackened and smoldering ruins. The enemy, after burning the barracks and storehouses, had blown up the fortifications and retreated, some down the Ohio, others overland to Prescott Isle, and others up the Allegheny to Venango. There were two forts, and some idea may be formed of their size, with barracks and storehouses, from the fact that John Hazlitt writes to the Reverend Dr. Allison, two days after the English took possession, that there were thirty chimney stacks standing. The troops had no shelter until the first fort was built. Colonel Bouquet wrote to Miss Anne Willing from Fort Duquesne, November 25, 1758, They have burned and destroyed to the ground their fortifications, houses, and magazines, and left us no other cover than the heavens, a very cold one for an army without tents or equipages. Colonel Bouquet, in a letter written to Chief Justice Allen of Pennsylvania on November 26, enumerated the needs of the garrison, which he hopes the provinces of Pennsylvania and Virginia will immediately supply. He adds, After God, the success of this expedition is entirely due to the general. He has shown the greatest prudence, firmness, and ability. No one is better informed than I am who had an opportunity to see every step that has been taken from the beginning and every obstacle that was thrown in his way. Forbes's first care was to provide defense and shelter for his troops, and a strong stockade was built around the traders' cabins and soldiers' huts, which he named Pittsburgh, in honor of England's great minister, William Pitt. Two hundred Virginians under Colonel Mercer were left to defend the new fortification, a force wholly inadequate to hold the place if the French chose to return and attempt to take it again. Those who remained must for a time depend largely on stream and forest to supply their needs, while the army, which was to return, began their homeward march early in December, with starvation staring them in the face. No sooner was this work done than Forbes utterly succumbed. He left with the soldiers and was carried all the way to Philadelphia in a litter, arriving there January 18, 1759. He lingered through the winter, died in March, and was buried in Christ Church, March 14, 1759. Parkman says, If his achievement was not brilliant, its solid value was above price. It opened to the Great West to English enterprise, took from France half her savage allies, and relieved the western borders from the scourge of Indian war. From southern New York to North Carolina, the frontier population had caused to bless the memory of this steadfast and all-enduring soldier. Just sixty days after the taking of Fort Duquesne, William Pitt wrote a letter, dated Whitehall, January 23, 1759, of which the following extract will show how important this place was considered in Great Britain. Sir, I am now to acquaint you that the king has been pleased immediately upon receiving the news of the success of his armies on the River Ohio to direct the commander-in-chief of his majesty's forces in North America, and General Forbes, to lose no time in concerting the properest and speediest means for completely restoring, if possible, the ruined Fort Duquesne to a defensible and respectable state, or for erecting another in the room of it of sufficient strength, and every way adequate to the great importance of the several objects of maintaining his majesty's subject in the undisputed possession of the Ohio, etc., etc. In a letter dated Pittsburgh, August 1759, Colonel Mercer writes to Governor Denny, Captain Gordon, chief engineer, has arrived with most of the artificers, but does not fix the spot for constructing the fort till the general comes up. We are preparing the materials for building with what expeditions so few men are capable of. There was no attempt to restore the old fortifications, but about a year afterwards work was begun on a new fort. General John Stanwix, who succeeded General Forbes, is said to have been a man of high military standing, with a liberal and generous spirit. In 1760, he had appeared on the Ohio at the head of an army, and with full power to build a large fort where Fort Duquesne had stood. The exact date of his arrival and the day when work was commenced is not known, but the work must have been begun the last of August or the first of September, 1759. A letter dated September 24, 1759, gives the following account. It is now near a month since the army has been employed in erecting a most formidable fortification, such a one as will to latest posterity secure the British Empire on the Ohio. There is no need to enumerate the abilities of the chief engineer, nor the spirit shown by the troops in executing the important task. The fort will be a lasting monument of both. The fort was built near the point where the Allegheny and Monongahela unite their waters, but a little farther inland than the site of Fort Duquesne. It is stood on the present site of the Duquesne Freight Station, while all the ground from the point to 3rd Street and from Liberty Street to the Allegheny River was enclosed in a stockade and surrounded by a moat. It was a solid and substantial building, constructed at an enormous expense to the English government. It was five-sided, two sides facing the land of brick, the other stockade. The earth around was thrown up so all was enclosed by a rampart of earth, surrounded on the land side by a perpendicular wall of brick. 
On the other sides, a line of pickets was fixed on the outside of the slope, and a moat encompassed the entire work. Casemates, barracks, and storehouses were completed for a garrison of 1,000 men and officers, and 18 pieces of artillery mounted on the bastions. This strong fortification was thought to establish the British Dominion of the Ohio. The exact date of its completion is not known, but on March 21, 1760, Major General Stanwix, having finished his work, set out on his return journey to Philadelphia. Conspiracy of Pontiac and Colonel Bouquet the effect of this stronghold was soon apparent in the return of about 4,000 settlers to their lands on the frontiers of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland, from which they had been driven by their savage enemies, and the brisk trade which at once began to be carried on with the now, to all appearance, friendly Indians. However, the security was not of long duration. The definite treaty of peace between England, Spain, and France was signed February 10, 1763, but before that time, Pontiac, the great chief of the Ottawas, was planning his great conspiracy, which carried death and desolation throughout the frontier. The French had always tried to ingratiate themselves with the Indians. When their warriors came to French forts, they were hospitably welcomed and liberally supplied with guns, ammunition, and clothing, until the weapons and garments of their forefathers were forgotten. The English, on the contrary, either gave reluctantly or did not give at all. Many of the English traders were of the coarsest stamp, who vied with each other in rapacity and violence. When an Indian warrior came to an English fort, instead of the kindly welcome he had been accustomed to receive from the French, he got nothing but oaths and menaces and blows, sometimes being assisted to leave the premises by the butt of a sentinel's musket. But above and beyond all, they watched with wrath and fear the progress of the white man into their best hunting grounds, for as the English colonists advanced, their beloved forest disappeared under the strokes of the axe. The French did all in their power to augment this discontent. In this spirit of revenge and hatred, a powerful confederacy was formed, including all the western tribes, under the command of Pontiac, alike renowned for his warlike spirit, his wisdom and bravery, and whose name was a terror to the entire region of the lakes. The blow was to be struck in the month of May, 1763. The tribes were to rise simultaneously and attack the English garrisons. Thus, a sudden attack was made on all the western posts. Detroit was saved after a long and close siege. Forts Pitt and Niagara narrowly escaped, while LeBeouf, Venango, Prescott Isle, Miami's, St. Joseph, Quashtanon, Sandusky, and Michilimackinac all fell into the hands of the Indians. Their garrisons were either butchered on the spot or carried off to be tortured for the amusement of their cruel captors. The savages swept over the surrounding country, carrying death and destruction wherever they went. Hundreds of traders were slaughtered without mercy, while their wives and children, if not murdered, were carried off captives. The property destroyed or stolen amounted, it is said, to 500,000 pounds. Attacks were made on Forts Bedford and Ligonier, but without success. Fort Ligonier was under siege for two months. The preservation of this post was of the utmost importance, and Lieutenant Blaine, by his courage and good conduct, managed to hold it until August 2, 1763, when Colonel Bouquet arrived with his little army. In the meantime, every preparation was made at Fort Pitt for an attack. The garrison at that post numbered 330, commanded by Captain Simon Ecuyer, a brave Swiss. The fortifications, having been badly damaged by floods, were with great labor repaired. The barracks were made shot-proof to protect the women and children, and as the buildings inside were all of wood, a rude fire engine was constructed to extinguish any flames kindled by the fire arrows of the Indians. All the houses and cabins outside the walls were leveled to the ground. The fort was so crowded by the families of the settlers who had taken refuge there that Ecuyer wrote to Colonel Bouquet, "'We are so crowded in the fort that I fear disease.' for in spite of every care I cannot keep the place as clean as I should like. Besides, the smallpox is among us, and I have therefore caused a hospital to be built under the drawbridge. Several weeks, however, elapsed before there was any determined attack from the enemy. On July 26, some chiefs asked for a parley with Captain Ecuyer, which was granted. They demanded that he and all in the fort should leave immediately, or it and they would all be destroyed. He replied that they would not go, closing his speech with these words, Therefore, my brother, I will advise you to go home, Moreover, I tell you, if any of you appear again about this fort, I will throw bombshells which will burst and blow you to atoms, and fire cannon upon you loaded with a whole bag full of bullets. Take care, therefore, for I don't want to hurt you. On the night succeeding this parley, the Indians appeared in great numbers, crawling under the banks of the two rivers, digging holes with their knives, in which they were completely sheltered from the fire of the fort. On one side, the entire bank was lined with these burrows, from which they shot volleys or bullets, arrows and fire arrows, into the fort. The yelling was terrific, and the women and children in the crowded barracks clung to each other in abject terror. The attack lasted five days. 
On August 1st, the Indians heard the rumor of Colonel Bouquet's approach, which caused them to move on, and so the tired garrison was relieved. When the news of this Indian uprising reached General Amherst, he ordered Colonel Bouquet to march with a detachment of 500 men to the relief of the besieged forts. The force was composed of companies from the 42nd Highlanders and 77th Regulars, to which were added six companies of rangers. Bouquet established his camp in Carlisle at the end of June. Here he found every building, every house, every barn, every hovel crowded with refugees. He writes to General Amherst on July 13th as follows. The list of people known to be killed increases every day. The desolation of so many families, reduced to the last extreme of wanton misery, the despair of those who have lost their parents, relations, and friends, with the cries of distracted women and children who fill the streets, form a scene painful to humanity and impossible to describe. Strange as it may seem, the province of Pennsylvania would do nothing to aid the troops who gathered for its defense. The Quakers, who had a majority in the assembly, were non-combatants from principle and practice, and the Swiss and German Mennonites, who were numerous in Lancaster County, professed, like the Quakers, the principle of non-resistance, and refused to bear arms. Wagons and horses had been promised, but promises were broken. Bouquet writes again to Amherst, I hope we shall be able to save that infatuated people from destruction, notwithstanding all their endeavors to defeat your vigorous measures. While Bouquet, harassed and exasperated, labored on at this difficult task, the terror of the country people increased, until at last, finding that they could hope for but little aid from the government, they bestirred themselves with admirable spirit in their own defense. They raised small bodies of riflemen, who scoured the woods in front of the settlements, and succeeded in driving the enemy back. In some instances, these men dressed themselves as Indian warriors, painted their faces red and black, and adopted the savage mode of warfare. On the 3rd of July, a courier from Fort Bedford rode into Carlisle, and as he stopped to water his horse, he was immediately surrounded by an anxious crowd, to whom he told his tale of woe, adding, as he mounted his horse to ride on to Bouquet's tent, the Indians will soon be here. Terror and excitement spread everywhere. Messengers were dispatched in every direction to give the alarm, and the reports, harrowing as they had been, were fully confirmed by the fugitives who were met on the road and bypath, hurrying to Carlisle for refuge. A party armed themselves and went out to warn the living and bury the dead. They found death and desolation everywhere, and sickened with horror at seeing groups of hogs tearing and devouring the bodies of the dead. After a delay of eighteen days, having secured enough wagons, horses, and oxen, Bouquet began his perilous march, with a force much smaller than Braddock's, to encounter a foe far more formidable. But Bouquet, the man of iron will and iron hand, had served seven years in America and understood his work. On July 25th, he reached Fort Bedford, where he was fortunate in securing 30 backwoodsmen to go with him. This little army toiled on through the blazing heat of July over the Alleghenies and reached Fort Ligonier August 2nd. The Indians, who had besieged the fort for two months, disappeared at the approach of the troops. Here Bouquet left his oxen and wagons and resumed his march on the 4th. On the 5th, about noon, he encountered the enemy at Bushy Run. The battle raged for two days and ended in a total rout of the savages. The loss of the British was 115 and 8 officers. The distance to Fort Pitt was 25 miles, which place was reached on the 10th. The enemy had abandoned the siege and marched to unite their forces with those which attacked Colonel Bouquet at Bushy Run. The savages continued their hasty retreat, but Colonel Bouquet's force was not sufficient to enable him to pursue the enemy beyond the Ohio, and he was obliged to content himself with supplying Fort Pitt and other forts with provisions, ammunition, and stores. It was at this time that Colonel Bouquet built the Little Redoubt, which is now not only all that remains of Fort Pitt, but the only existing monument of British occupancy in this region. The Indians abandoned all their former settlements and retreated to the Muskingum. Here they formed new settlements, and in the spring of 1764 again began to ravage the frontier. To put an end to these depredations, General Gage planned a campaign into this western wilderness from two points. General Bradstreet was to advance by way of the lakes, and Colonel Bouquet from Fort Pitt. After the usual delays and disappointments in securing troops from Pennsylvania and Virginia to aid in this expedition, the march from Carlisle was begun, and Colonel Bouquet arrived at Fort Pitt September 17th, and was detained there until October 3rd. He followed the north bank of the Ohio until he reached the Beaver, when he turned towards central Ohio. Holding on his course, they refused to listen to either threats or promises from the Indians, declining to treat with them at all until they should deliver up the prisoners. Although not a blow was struck, the Indians were vanquished. Bouquet continued his march down the valley of the Muskingum until he reached a spot where some broad meadows offered a suitable place for an encampment. Here he received a deputation of chiefs, listened to their offers of peace, and demanded the delivery of the prisoners. Soon after, the band of captives arrived, until the number exceeded 300. The scenes which followed the restoring of the prisoners to their friends beggar all description. 
wives recovering their husbands, parents seeking for children whom they could scarcely recognize, brothers and sisters meeting after a long separation, and sometimes scarcely able to speak the same language. The story is told of a woman whose daughter had been carried off nine years before. The mother recognized her child, but the girl, who had almost forgotten her mother tongue, showed no sign of recognition. The mother complained to Colonel Bouquet that the daughter she had so often sung to sleep on her knee had forgotten her. "'Sing the song to her that you used to sing when she was a child,' said Colonel Bouquet. She did so, and with a passionate flood of tears the long-lost daughter flung herself into her mother's arms. Everything being settled, the army broke camp November 18th and arrived at Fort Pitt on the 28th. Early in January, Colonel Bouquet returned to Philadelphia, receiving wherever he went every possible mark of gratitude and esteem from the people. The Assembly of Pennsylvania and the House of Burgesses of Virginia each unanimously voted him addresses of thanks, and on the arrival of the first account of this expedition, the king promoted him to the rank of Brigadier General to command the Southern District of North America. Conflict between Pennsylvania and Virginia We have seen two of the most powerful nations of Europe contending for possession of the forks of the Ohio. We have seen the efforts of the Indians to destroy the fort and regain possession of their hunting grounds. In October 1770, Washington again visited the forks of the Ohio, this time on a peaceful errand. He reached Fort Pitt October 17, 1770, and says in his journal, Lodged in what is called the town, distant about 300 yards from the fort, at one Semples, who keeps a very good house of entertainment. He describes both the town and the fort, where the garrison at this time consisted of two companies of Royal Irish, commanded by Captain Edmund Stone. In his journal, we find the following entry on October 18th. Dined in the fort with Colonel Crogan and the officers of the garrison. Supped there also, meeting with great civility from the gentlemen, and engaged to dine with Colonel Crogan the next day, at his seat about four miles up the Allegheny. Washington and his party, numbering nine or ten persons, with three Indians, continued their journey down the Ohio in a large canoe. On November 2nd, we find that the party encamped and went to hunting, killed five buffaloes and wounded some others, three deer, etc. This country abounds in buffaloes and wild game of all kinds, as also in all kinds of wild fowl, there being in the bottoms a great many small, grassy ponds or lakes, which are full of swan, geese, and ducks of different kinds. The party returned to Pittsburgh November 21st, were again hospitably entertained, and on the 23rd mounted their horses on the return journey to Virginia. This was Washington's last visit to Fort Pitt. Now, after the season of rest and quiet, there comes another contest, this time between the provinces of Pennsylvania and Virginia. The British government, as the trouble with the colonies increased, deemed it advisable to abandon Fort Pitt and to withdraw the troops. Major Edmund Stone, then in command, sold the buildings and material October 10, 1772, to Alexander Ross and William Thompson, for 50 pounds New York currency. The fort was evacuated by the British forces in October 1772, and in January 1774, troops from Virginia, sent by the governor, Lord Dunmore, under command of Dr. James Connolly, took possession and changed the name to Fort Dunmore. Dr. Connolly was arrested by Arthur St. Clair, then a magistrate of Westmoreland County, of which Allegheny County was at that time a part, and put in jail, but was soon released on bail. He went back to Virginia, but shortly returned with civil and military authority to enforce the laws of Virginia. This contest continued for several years, until a prominent citizen wrote to Governor Penn, The deplorable state of affairs in this part of your government is truly distressing. We are robbed, insulted, and dragooned by Connolly and his militia in this place and its environs. Maryland, too, had contended, sometimes with the shedding of blood, for possession of that important point. It was not until 1785 that commissioners were appointed, the boundary of the western part of the state finally run, and Pennsylvania established in the possession of her territory. Revolutionary Period During the struggle for independence, the settlements west of the Alleghenies had little to fear from the invading armies of Great Britain, but, influenced by the English, the Indians again began their ravages. Fort Pitt at that time was under the command of Captain John Neville, and was the center of government authority. Just two days after the Declaration of Independence, but long before news of it could have crossed the mountains, we read of a conference at Fort Pitt between Major Trent, Major Ward, Captain Neville, and other officers of the garrison, with the famous Pontiac Giasuda, Captain Pipe, and other representatives of the Six Nations. Giasuda was the chief speaker. He produced a belt of wampum, which was to be sent from the Six Nations to other Western tribes, informing them that the Six Nations would take no part in the war between England and America, and asking them to do the same. In the address, Giasuda said, Brothers, we will not suffer either the English or the Americans to pass through our country. Should either attempt it, we shall forewarn them three times, and should they persist, they must take the consequences. I am appointed by the Six Nations to take care of this country, that is, of the Indians on the other side of the Ohio, 
which included the Allegheny. And I desire you will not think of an expedition against Detroit, for, I repeat, we will not suffer an army to pass through our country. The Six Nations was the most powerful confederacy of Indians in America, and whichever side secured their allegiance might count on other tribes following them. Instigated by the agents of Great Britain, it was not long before a deadly struggle began. Scalping parties of Indians ravaged the frontier, sparing neither age nor sex, and burning and destroying all that came in their path. Companies were formed to protect the settlements, whose headquarters were at Fort Pitt, and expeditions were made into the enemy's country, but with no very great success. On June 1, 1777, Brigadier General Edward Hand took command of the post and issued a call for 2,000 men. He did not receive a very satisfactory response to this call. After considerable delay, he made several expeditions against the Indians, but was singularly unfortunate in all his attempts. These fruitless efforts only emboldened the savages to continue their ravages. In 1778, General Hand, at his own request, was recalled, and Brigadier General McIntosh succeeded him. General McIntosh planned a formidable expedition into the enemy's country. He marched to the mouth of the Beaver, where he built a fort and called it Fort McIntosh. Then he advanced 75 miles farther, built another fort, and called it Fort Lawrence. But on hearing alarming reports of the Indians and for want of supplies, he left Colonel John Gibson with 150 men there and returned to Fort Pitt. The depredations of the Indians continued, and General McIntosh, utterly disheartened from the want of men and supplies, asked to be relieved of his command. He was succeeded by Colonel Daniel Broadhead, who, like his predecessor, planned great things but never had the means of carrying out his plans. By this time, Fort Pitt was badly in need of repairs, and the garrison, in half-fed and badly equipped, was almost mutinous. In November 1781, General William Irvine took command of the post. He describes the condition of the fort and of the soldiers as deplorable. He writes, The few troops that are here are the most licentious men and worst behaved I ever saw, owing, I presume, in a great measure, to their not hitherto being kept under any subordination or tolerable degree of discipline. The firmness of the commander soon restored order, but not without the free application of the lash and the execution of two soldiers. The winter of 1782 and 1783 was comparatively quiet, and October 1st, 1783, General Irvine took his final leave of the Western Department. The state of Pennsylvania acknowledged her gratitude for his service by donating him a valuable tract of land. In 1790, there was another Indian outbreak. Major Isaac Craig was then acting as quartermaster in Pittsburgh. On May 19, 1791, he wrote to General Knox, representing the terror occasioned by the near approach of the Indians, and asking permission to erect another fortification, as Fort Pitt was in a ruinous condition. This request was granted, and Major Craig erected a fortification occupying the ground from Garrison Alley to Hand, now 9th Street, and from Liberty to the Allegheny River. This he named Fort Lafayette. The expeditions of General Harmer and of General St. Clair against the Indians had been ineffectual and disastrous. In 1794, General Anthony Wayne was more successful, and defeated and scattered the Indians so effectually that they never again gave trouble in this region. The Old Blockhouse, Mrs. Mary E. Shenley's Gift to the Daughters of the American Revolution of Allegheny County The close of the century found Fort Pitt in ruins, and this spot over which had waved the flags of three nations and the banners of two states was left to the peaceable possession of the mechanic and artisan, the trader and farmer. The little redoubt built by Colonel Bouquet in 1764 and the names of the streets in Pittsburgh are all that is left as remainders of the struggle for the forks of the Ohio, the only relics of the contest of the courtly Frenchman with the intrepid British, of the daring of the indomitable colonist and the craft and cruelty of the Indian. This redoubt was not built by General Stanwix when the fort was erected in 1759 and 60, but by Colonel Bouquet in 1764. At the time of Pontiac's war, when Colonel Bouquet came to Pittsburgh, he found that the moat which surrounded the fortifications were perfectly dry when the river was low, so that the Indians could crawl up the ditch and shoot any guard or soldier who might show his head above the parapet. To prevent this, Colonel Bouquet ordered the erection of the redoubt, or blockhouse, which completely commanded the moat on the Allegheny side of the fort. The little building is of brick, five-sided with two floors, having a squared oak log with loopholes through each floor. There were two underground passages, one connecting it with the fort and the other leading to the Monongahela River. The ground from Fort Pitt to the Allegheny River was sold in 1784 to Isaac Craig and Stephen Bayard, and, after passing through various hands, was purchased by General James O'Hara, September 4, 1805. When General O'Hara died in 1819, the property passed to his daughter Mary, who in 1821 married William Croggan. Mrs. Croggan died in 1827, and her daughter, Mary Elizabeth, an infant barely a year old, became her sole heir. 
she married Captain E. W. H. Shenley of the English Army, and to Mrs. Mary E. Shenley, who might be called Pittsburgh's fairy godmother, the daughters of the American Revolution of Allegheny County are indebted for the gift of the blockhouse and surrounding property. While the property was in possession of Craig and Baird, a large dwelling house was built and connected with the blockhouse. This was occupied one year by Mr. Turnbull, and for two years subsequently by Major Craig. From that time, 1785, until it came into the possession of the Daughters of the American Revolution, April 1st, 1894, it continued to be used as a dwelling house. Time and decay had done their work in 130 years, and the Daughters found the old blockhouse fast crumbling away. If it had been left much longer without repairs, it would soon have been nothing but a heap of broken brick. Mrs. Shenley's gift to the Daughters of the American Revolution was the blockhouse, with a plot of ground measuring 100 by 90 feet, and a passageway leading to Penn Avenue of 90 feet by 20. As soon as the Daughters of the American Revolution received the deed for the property, the work of clearing away the tumble-down tenements which covered the ground was commenced. It was not without great difficulty, and no little expense, that the occupants of these houses were induced to give them up. While the blockhouse was used as a dwelling, the stone tablet placed over the door of the inscription, Colonel Bouquet, 1764, was removed and inserted in the wall of the staircase in City Hall. The Daughters of the American Revolution petitioned councils for permission to restore it to its original position. The petition was granted, and the tablet now fills the space which it occupied 138 years ago. I do love these ancient ruins. We never tread upon them, but we set our foot upon some reverend history. Pittsburgh, September 1898. Matilda Wilkins Denny. Names of Pittsburgh Streets their historical significance. By Julia Morgan Harding M. from the Pittsburgh Bulletin, February 15, 1893. We are told in his autobiography that Benjamin Franklin ever took pleasure in obtaining many little anecdotes of his ancestors, and in these days of reawakened interest in things of the past, many people may be found who, like the great prototype of American character, Pennsylvania's apostle of common sense, take pleasure in looking into the old records of their family history. A still richer inheritance is the story of the lives of the men who conquered the wilderness and subdued the Indians, French and British, and this inheritance is held in common by all good citizens of Pittsburgh, whether or not their ancestors fought with Braddock or Bouquet, or marched with Forbes. In the stir and bustle of the busy city, above the noise of the trolley and the iron wagon, one faintly hears the names of streets whose unfamiliar sound recalls to our minds these illustrious dead. With but little effort, the inward eye quickly sees an impenetrable forest clothing hills and river banks dark, mysterious, forbidding, crossed by occasional narrow and obstructed paths, war parties of painted savages, a few scattered settlers' and traders' cabins, here and there a canoe on the swift and silent rivers, a silence too often broken by the war whoop of the Indian and the scream of his tortured victim. From the eastern slopes of the endless hills to the unknown and unbounded Indian country that lay beyond the forks of the Ohio, such was the region into which Washington, Braddock, Forbes, and Bouquet led their forlorn hopes. In days when a less utilitarian spirit prevailed, and association was still powerful, the city of Pittsburgh acknowledged its debt of gratitude to the soldiers, statesmen, and early settlers who made this unexampled prosperity possible, by naming for them many of its streets and suburbs. Its early history can be traced thereby, much as the historian and archaeologist discovers the successive Roman, Saxon, Danish, and Norman occupations of London and other English towns. Aliquippa, Mingo, Shanopin, Shangus, Giasuda, and Kilbuck recall the Indian tribes and chiefs who once possessed the country. Gist, Montour, Gurdy, McKee, Chartiers, and Van Bram, the guides and traders who first penetrated the wilderness. Dinwiddie brings to mind the crusty but far-seeing Scotch governor of Virginia, who first comprehended the value of the disputed land. Forbes, Bouquet, Ligonier, Halkett, Grant, Stanwix, Neville, Crawford, Hay, Marbury, Ormsby, Tannehill, O'Hara, Butler, Wayne, Bayard, Stobo, Steuben, St. Clair, Craig, Smallman, and Irwin recall, or did recall, the soldiers and commandants who won the West. Duquesne, St. Pierre, and Jumonville speak of the French governor of Canada, the officer who received Washington at Fort LaBeouf, and the captain who fell at Great Meadows. Smithfield owes its name to Devereux Smith, prominent in colonial and revolutionary days, and Wood Street was called for George Woods, surveyor. In Penn Avenue, or Street, as it used to be and still ought to be called, the name of the founder of the Commonwealth, the Quaker feudal proprietor, is preserved, and the great city itself, as well as two shabby, sooty little streets, forever immortalizes William Pitt, the friend of America, and makes him a splendid and enduring monument. But let us dig into the lowest historical stratum and discover the real local relationships of names and places with the first occupants of the land. Aliquippa tells of the great queen of the Delawares, who lived at the mouth of the Yafiani, where McKeesport now is, 
and whom it must be remembered Washington visited on his first memorable journey to the Ohio. From what he relates to us, she could not have been a very temperate sovereign lady, but she was a celebrity and a power in her day, with a prestige that long survived her, and when, in full savage regalia, surrounded by her warriors, she granted an audience to the young Virginian, she was doubtless most impressing and condescending. Shingis, who bore a name that suggests the subject of Queen Wilhelmina rather than a North American Indian, was a mighty warrior in his day and a king of the Delawares. Some of the chroniclers give him a very bad name, and tell us that his exploits in war would form an interesting though shocking document. Others, among them Christian Post, give him a much better character. Nevertheless, it is true that the colony of Pennsylvania offered a thousand dollars for his scalp. Washington met him on his first visit to Ohio, and speaks of him in his journal. This brave and much-feared chief was small in stature for an Indian, and lived near the Ohio on Chartier's Creek. A chieftain as renowned as Shingis, and more frequently mentioned in the histories of the olden time, was Giasuda, or Kiyashuda, a Seneca, who first appears on the scene as one of the three Indians who accompanied Washington to Fort LaBeouf. He was a conspicuous figure in all the Indian wars and treaties which followed that event, and was present at the treaty Colonel Bouquet held with the Shawnees, Delawares, and Senecas on the Muskingum. We hear of him again in Lord Dunmore's War. He was frequently at or in the neighborhood of Fort Pitt, and had unbounded influence with his people, an influence he generally exerted for good and in the interest of the colonies, though finally won over to the British during the Revolution. His speeches at the various councils he attended were eloquent, and his language that of an aristocrat who had an unquestioning confidence in the power of his people and his own might. He was deeply concerned in the conspiracy of Pontiac, and is believed to have inspired the attack on Hannestown. Giasuda found his last resting place near the Allegheny on General O'Hara's farm, which is still called by his name. The stray visitor, who from time to time threads his devious way through the alleys and courts which surround the blockhouse, may find himself perhaps in Fort Street, on historic ground once trodden by Washington, Forbes, Bouquet, and the Indian kings of whom we have just been speaking. The echoes of the English drums, Scottish bagpipes, and clash of arms have long since died away from the scarred sides of Mount Washington and Duquesne Heights, and in their stead we hear them the steam whistle and the hollow reverberations from neighboring boiler shops. Hibernians and Italians inhabit the fields and river banks where Kilbuck, White Eyes, Chingis, and Cornstalk once lit their campfires and held eloquent councils with Jum and V, the Ligneri, and Bouquet. Squalid tenements crowd the narrow promontory where Robert de la Salle stood at the headwaters of the Ohio, in all probability of the discoverer of the three rivers. The fort that Pontiac besieged has disappeared. The painted post to which the Indian tied his victim, the wigwam, the wampum belts, have vanished. The tomahawk is buried forever, though the readiness once observed among the residents of the point to draw knives on each other, on occasions of super-hilarity, may be but of the survival of the good old customs which prevailed in that neighborhood more than one hundred years ago. Inspired by the suggestion of hereditary, the imaginative mind turns to the past for other instances. On any pleasant Monday morning during the spring or summer months, the thrifty housekeepers in Fort Street or Point Alley, and the shadow of the blockhouse itself, may be seen doing their week's washing in front of their houses. But little are they thinking of those Monday mornings in the middle of the 18th century, when the women of the fort were escorted by bands of soldiers to the banks of the Allegheny, where laundry work was carried on under rather embarrassing circumstances for Indians were dodging about behind trees and bushes, and dancing in full view on the opposite shore, with threatening cries, and only kept at a distance by the presence of a guard. The custom seems to still prevail on this classic ground, but do the conveniences of soap and hydrant water make up for the spice and variety that characterize the lives of colonial laundresses? Pittsburgh has always been preeminently a hospitable city, and it is possible that in no other town of its size is there as much entertaining. At weddings, too, the display of presents is an object of surprise to the out-of-town guests, unused to such lavishness. Tracing our provincial characteristics back to their remote origins, we discover that Pittsburgh at the end of the 19th century, in the grip of hereditary, imitates the traders and early settlers in this region, who were in the habit of entertaining whole tribes of Indians, and of making them frequent gifts. Gay blankets, red paint, strings of wampum, and barrels of whiskey are not now exchanged on Christmas and New Year's Day, or shown at wedding feasts, as we have improved somewhat upon the primitive customs of our forefathers, but the instinct is unchanged. Noted for the beauty and brilliancy of our balls, and the excellence of our dinners, it may be interesting to know something of our first attempts in the art of social entertaining. In a letter from Captain Ecuyer, commandant at Fort Pitt, dated January 8, 1763, written to Colonel Bouquet, he informs the latter that they have a ball every Saturday evening, graced by the presence of the most beautiful ladies of the garrison. No mention is made of any solid refreshment, but we are informed that the punch was abundant, and it is also intimated that if the fair sex did not find it strong enough for their taste, they knew where the whiskey was kept and how to remedy that fault. 
Gay indeed must have been the dancing and the merriment inspired by the frontier punch and the shrieks of the Indians outside the stockade, for at that very time hostile savages surrounded and threatened the lonely fort. No wonder the revellers needed strong drinks to keep up their spirits. It is indeed very doubtful if the very strongest ever brewed would give nerve enough to Pittsburgh bells of today to enable them to dance a cotillon to the tune of Indian whoops and yells. As to more intellectual pursuits, it would at first seem impossible to discover what our frontier ancestors did in the way of reading. News from the outside world was not to be depended upon, and books a rare article, one would presume, but information often comes from unexpected sources. In an edition of Robertson's Charles V, printed for the subscribers in America in 1770, is a list of subscribers whose names posterity may respect, because of their seasonable encouragement, the American edition hath been accomplished at a price so moderate that the man of the woods, as well as the man of the court, may solace himself with sentimental delight. In this list we find the name of Ensign Francis Howard of the Royal Irish at Fort Pitt, the only subscriber west of the mountains. We can imagine the young soldier, far from home and friends, reading of those far-off times of war and peril, the winter wind howling up and down the river and beating against the blockhouse, carrying with it the echo, perhaps, of an Indian death halloo. Doubtless he wondered what the stern Spanish campaigner would have done if brought to the western wilderness to fight the red man, and, if he lived to return to his English home with his scalp intact, it is more than probable that Ensign Francis Howard's Tales of America, Warfare, and Adventures were the delight of many a hunting dinner or evening fireside. Few indeed are the tangible relics of the most romantic period of our local history. The writer owns a copy of the edition of Charles V, and in all probability it is the one that the English ensign read at Fort Pitt. A few old letters, maps, and account books, some cannonballs, rusty swords, and bayonets, the handsome carved stone sundial which the chapter has placed for safekeeping in Carnegie Museum until its own home is built, are about all we can show of the works and possessions of the men who made our early history. Here was the scene of a mighty struggle for empire a struggle of which the only vestiges left are the blockhouse and the names of our streets, too many of which have been changed in recent years to suit the vulgar needs of convenience and at the cost of our historical identity. Julia Morgan Harding Postscript, 1914 Much water has run under the bridges of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers since the sketch, The Names of Pittsburgh Streets, was written, and changes as radical as those that took place between the first years of the 19th century and the early days of the 20th, have revolutionized the historic point in the last decade. Just as the French and Indians stole down the river before the advance of General Forbes and his British and colonial troops in 1758, so did the denizens of the aforesaid point melt away in every direction before the steam shovels, creaking derricks, and snorting engines of the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1904 and 1905. With the consolidation of Pittsburgh and Allegheny into one city came other changes. Some of the old streets whose names commemorated dead patriots associated with colonial and revolutionary Pittsburgh are buried under embankments, concrete walls, and brick warehouses. Other names have been dropped, and certain etymological curiosities have been put in their places. Still others have been transferred to distant and irrelevant localities, and an old resident, returning from the world of shades, would be sadly confused if looking for old landmarks, Fort Pitt and all pertaining to it, excepting only the blockhouse, vanished long ago. There is nothing left of the later age which saw Rice's castle in its glory. The new industrialism is steadily and rapidly blotting out the picturesque and historic all around us. Let all good Pittsburghers unite to preserve the little that is left, the redoubt built by Colonel Bouquet in 1764. Julia Morgan Harding, 1914. End of Fort Duquesne and Fort Pitt, Early Names of Pittsburgh Streets By Fort Pitt Society, Daughters of the American Revolution of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania How Five Notable Women Were Educated by Kate Sanborn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How Five Notable Women Were Educated by Kate Sanborn. Which five shall be honored? Men and women are such curious and often pathetic combinations of the traits of their ancestors that if we look back far enough, we can always find the different elements that produce a notable character. Some are born educated, some come with an intense longing for knowledge, others with every advantage refuse to be educated. Women have not often had a fair chance, but now our colleges for women offer such opportunities for mental discipline and steady drill in any desired direction that all will be altered. Thus far, women who have distinguished themselves have achieved their success by their own genius and persistence, aided by a father's guidance and a good library, 
were obliged to almost fight for what they were determined to obtain. Fanny Burney had less education than any of her sisters, but she had an impulse for writing and produced a novel which Burke sat up all night to read. Evelina created a tremendous sensation, and by it she will always be remembered. Walpole said, quote, she knew the world and penetrated character before she had stepped over the threshold, unquote. Surly Johnson said he was too proud to eat as he sat by Fanny at their first dinner party. Education and experience spoiled her style and made her tedious, so we will not count her. Many notable women owe their love of learning to a father's teaching, as Elizabeth Carter, the famous linguist, and Matilda Betham, author and artist, yet all in the best sense educated themselves. Maria Edgeworth, 1767 to 1849, was trained carefully by her eccentric and conceited father. Their lives blended, their names cannot be separated. Quote, he gave her the most bracing kind of education, moral and intellectual, unquote. In one of his frequent letters, he says, I wish to communicate to you what little knowledge I have acquired, that you may have a tincture of every species of literature and form your taste by choice and not by chance. He always talked with her as an equal, suggesting the subjects upon which, as a child, she was to write for his criticism. She always told him her first rough plan. He wanted to judge of the bare skeleton, then would give it to her to fill out. Mr. Day, a learned man still more crotchety than Mr. Edgeworth, was interested in Miss Maria, to whom he opened his library and enjoyed directing her studies. The little girl was also sent to a fashionable boarding school where she underwent all the usual tortures of backboards, iron collars, and dumbbells, with the unusual one of being hung by the neck to draw out the muscles and increase the growth, a signal failure in her case. Like Miss Bronte, she was a tiny woman. She always had unusual powers of concentration, and at this school would sit absorbed in her book while the other children were romping round her, as in after years she was obliged to do her literary work in the sitting room where all the family were required to assemble. As there were eighteen children who lived to grow up, that sitting room must have been a trying place for the young author, and it was well she possessed such capacity for abstraction. She was early noted for her entertaining stories and delighted to keep her schoolmates awake at night with her improvised tales, a sure proof of their charm. You remember that both Scott and Turgenev, the great Russian novelist, owned their indebtedness to this little lady. Sir Walter averred it was her tender, humorous, admirable delineations of Irish character that led him to try to do the same thing for his own country, and the Russian said he should never have written about the woes of the peasantry of his land if he had not been inspired by what Miss Edgeworth had done. If you want to know more of her, read Miss Thackeray's sketch. Mary Somerville, 1780 to 1872, has always interested me greatly. I want no more delightful reading than her personal recollections edited by her daughter, a woman of indomitable energy and perseverance, by which in her ardent thirst for knowledge she overcame obstacles apparently insurmountable at a time when well-nigh totally debarred from education. But she would be educated, though father and mither and ah should go mad, and she succeeded in becoming the most learned woman in England. She was interested in everything, science, art, literature. What a grand nature! What a big brain! What appreciation of the world she lived in, always progressing, always ready for more knowledge. To condense from her daughter's words and her own inimitable narrative gives but a faint idea of her struggles, her ambition, her versatility. Her mother did not forbid her reading, but an old maid aunt did disapprove, saying, I wonder you let Mary waste her time in reading. She never sews more than if she were a man. So she was sent to the village school to learn plain needlework, and afterward the house linen was given into her charge to make and to mend. Mary thought it unjust that women should have been given a desire for knowledge if it were wrong to acquire it. Among their books she found Chapone's Letters to Young Women and resolved to follow the course of history there recommended. One in French she read with the help of a dictionary. The village schoolmaster taught her a few weeks in the winter evenings, but only the ordinary studies. He taught Latin and navigation, but only to boys. She was allowed to learn the use of two small globes, and at night she spent many hours by her window studying the stars by the aid of the celestial globe. She also taught herself Latin enough to read Caesar's commentaries. Her uncle, Dr. Somerville, was the first friend or relative who approved of her ambition. 
she had the courage to tell him, when visiting at his home, of her efforts to learn Latin, and he assured her that in ancient times many women in England had been distinguished scholars, and that if she would go to his study an hour or two before breakfast, he would read Virgil with her. She says she was never happier in her life than during visits to this uncle. Strange to say she found in an illustrated magazine of fashions an introduction to the great study of her life. She was invited to call on a young lady and see some fancy work she was doing. I will now give her version. I went next day, and after admiring her work and being told how it was done, she showed me a monthly magazine with colored plates of ladies' dresses, charades, and puzzles. At the end of a page I read what appeared to me to be simply an arithmetical question, but on turning the page I was surprised to see strange-looking lines mixed with letters, chiefly X's and Y's, and asked, What is that? Oh, said Miss Ogilvy, it's a kind of arithmetic. They call it algebra, but I can tell you nothing about it. Her persistency in finding out all that was to be known about algebra and geometry after this was marvelous. She sat up so late studying, when she had at last obtained a Euclid, that her candle had to be taken away from her as soon as it was time for her to be in bed. Then she would depend on her memory and demonstrate a certain number of problems every night. Her father was distressed and said to her mother, Peg, we must put a stop to this, or we shall have Mary in a straitjacket one of these days. There was X, who went raving mad about the longitude. With all this fervor for study, Mary was a healthy, natural, fun-loving girl, and never devoted herself exclusively to her favorite study. She was passionately fond of poetry, especially Shakespeare and Dante, read the Greek dramatist in the original, was a good musician, painted well from nature, was skilled in housekeeping and sewing, making all her own dresses, even for balls, fond of dancing, and never without partners, did exquisite pieces of fancy work, womanly in every way. Until her second marriage, she never had any sympathy in her studies in her own home and Mr. Somerville's sister wrote, when told of the engagement, that she hoped Mary would give up her foolish manner of life and studies and become a useful and respectable wife. Even in later years, she did not escape criticism. After publishing her physical geography, she was preached against by name in York Cathedral for holding heretical theories on geology. What she achieved by her self-gained education, the books she wrote, the honors she received, her friendships with noted scientists of her time, her foreign travel and interesting records of experiences, her beautiful old age, and her lasting influence, all this must merely be hinted. Carolyn Herschel, 1750 to 1848, another woman distinguished for her astronomical researches, was the ideal sister, and through her devotion to her brother William, she educated herself to be his assistant, his amanuensis, his willing slave. As a child, she often stood freezing on the shore to see her brother skating on the Stadtgraven till he chose to go home. In afterlife, she would stand beside his telescope in the nights of midwinter to write down his observations when the very ink was frozen in the bottle. By sheer force of will and devoted affection, she learned enough of mathematics and of methods of calculation to be invaluable to him. During one of her brother's vacations, she hoped to receive a little instruction but he was too weary after his winter's work, so he would retire to bed with a basin of milk or a glass of water, and Smith's Harmonies of Nature or Ferguson's Astronomy, and his first thoughts on rising were how to obtain instruments for viewing those objects himself, of which he had been reading. She had a remarkably fine voice and could have succeeded as a public singer. She also longed to support herself as a music teacher, but she says, I was much hindered in my musical practice by my help being continually wanted in the execution of the various contrivances. I found that I was to be trained as an assistant astronomer, and by way of encouragement, a telescope adapted for sweeping was given me. I was to sweep for comets. She did discover eight, but she never thought of fame for herself. When William was polishing mirrors, she would feed him, putting bits in his mouth, or read aloud his favorite books. She polished the brass of the instruments, ran to the clock, measured the ground with poles, ground mirrors, and all with real enthusiasm because it would help her brother. Her mother was not willing that she should be educated, denying her all privileges for study, but she was well trained in every department of housekeeping and was always a famous knitter. After sixteen years of unselfish devotion to her brother, he married, and she afterward lived in lodgings, still minding the heavens for his sake 
but necessarily sad and lonely. She made three elaborate catalogues of stars, star clusters, and nebulae, and was duly honored by various astronomical societies. But she lived only for her brother and his advancement, caring nothing for her own distinction. She was educated by affection. Her dominant idea was always the same. I am nothing. I have done nothing. All I am, all I know, I owe to my brother. I am only the tool which he shaped to his use. A well-trained puppy dog would have done as much. This brief outline is condensed from her memoir by Mr. John Herschel and a life study by Monsieur Betham Edwards. After thinking over a long list of women, I have decided to select Georges Sand and Mary Lyon for a closing contrast. No two could be more unlike, more exactly opposite in ancestry, education, character, and general surroundings. Taine gives this idea, tell me the climate, the epoch, the environment, and I show you the man. These two women, each so strong in her own way, are most striking illustrations of his belief. At the time Georges Sand appeared, there was, in France, above all other countries, a tropical luxuriance of literary production. Victor Hugo, Théophile Gautier, Alfred de Musset, etc. Her curiously mixed lineage led naturally to the combination that made her just what she was. In her veins ran the blood of heroes, kings, artists, nobles, grisettes. All was irregular, wild, impulsive, undisciplined. With this came genius, courage, and many fascinating qualities. Her father was a handsome, accomplished, unprincipled army officer, her mother a dark-eyed, passionate, uneducated woman, the daughter of a poor bird seller. Their child was named for the decorous grandmother, Aurora, the only person of irreproachable life in the entire connection. There was no sympathy between the two women except their intense love for the beautiful little girl. After her father's sudden death, it was decided that Aurora should remain in her grandmother's home at Noan. The special bent of a nature is soon developed. Before she could read, she loved to lisp out wondrous tales conjured out of her vivid imagination. Later, she would tell long, rambling stories, full of romance and rhapsody. A fault, she said, which I contracted then and have never lost. Was it not rather an uncontrollable inborn impulse? At eight, she tried to write out one of these stories, and her fond grandmother saw in it proofs of genius. There was always a strong devotional tendency in this queer makeup. Discovering that Santa Claus was only a myth, she was deeply grieved, but she soon raised altars of stone and moss in a corner of the old garden to an imaginary deity whom she named Karamb. And what education was hers? Most important was the education from nature in her country home a place she never tired of describing in her novels. Her father's old tutor gave her a somewhat desultory training in the rudiments. Then came a few winters in Paris with the despised accomplishment lessons and the detested dinner parties where her grandmother's venerable friends gossiped and took snuff. At thirteen, she was sent to a convent where she figured first as Madcap and then as Saint Aurora, for she had a period of intense religious interest and wished to become a nun. Of serious religious education, she received none at all. On her return, she educated herself by miscellaneous reading. Is the rest of her life a puzzle to anyone? She says herself, What we call fatality is the character of the individual. The character of the individual is his organization, and the organization of each of us is the result of a mixture of joining of races and the modified continuation of a succession of types. On the other hand, the ancestors of Mary Lyon, 1797 to 1849, were of irreproachable character. As far back as can be traced, all were followers of Christ. Her maternal grandfather was eminently pious. His six children all became Christians in early life. His father and his son each bore the name of Isaac, each held the office of deacon. And it was the same story all through. On both sides you find ministers, deacons, and praying, God-fearing women. Her own father was never known to speak an angry word, was often sent for to pray with the sick and dying. Her mother was a person of strong mind and active piety. Mary Lyon's childhood was spent on a rock-bound upland farm. She has well described that mountain home and her mother's prayers day by day for her fatherless children. Her opportunities for education were limited to the usual district school of the country, but she would learn, for she was a born student so she contrived to stay with relatives who lived near an academy, 
help about the work to pay board, and study tremendously, unceasingly, dangerously. Few constitutions, fewer brains, could have stood such a strain. She slept only four hours out of the twenty-four. She seemed also to be born religious. There were then no Sabbath schools, and on pleasant Sundays the nooning was spent in the woods or the graveyard, quite a social rendezvous still for villagers. But Mary stayed by herself, wondering at the levity of her friends. She was also a born teacher, and her services began to be eagerly sought. As soon as she gained a little money, she would go somewhere to study up some branch in which she felt herself deficient. At first, she was too much like the traditional blue stocking, no order, no interest in such trivial matters as clothes. You must read her life compiled by ex-president Hitchcock of Amherst College to realize how bravely she conquered her bad habits, developed her good qualities, and educated herself that she might educate others. More than 3,000 pupils were trained and helped by her because she had so earnestly, so conscientiously, helped herself. I leave the lesson from these lives to be drawn by my readers. End of How Five Notable Women Were Educated by Kate Sanborn Letter from Francois Dubigny to Madame de Fontaines April 20, 1713 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Madame de Fontaines, April 20, 1713. Do not let us complain, my dear sister, and fear the future. Let us rather try to establish the present as best we can. You can contribute better than any one to this purpose, for you are sufficiently prudent not to vex the sisters. At the same time, you will never allow the young ladies to speak in a low tone to one another. The sisters must excuse a great deal of poor talk that they will hear, and do not reprove it when there is no real harm in it. Madame de Oxy this was Jeanette de Pincre, an adopted daughter of Madame de Montenon, is quite beside herself when she has a new gown. She consults me about the trimming. I enter into it and give her my advice, telling her that her joy and liking for adornment belongs to her age, but that youth must pass, and that I hope she will come sooner or later to better inclinations. I think that such compliance does more good than severity, which serves only to rebuff the young and make them dissimulating. I am told that one of the little girls was scandalized in the parlor because her father talked of his breeches. That is a word in common usage. What refinement do they mean by this? Does the arrangement of the letters form an immodest word? Do they feel distress at the words breed or breeze or brevery? It is pitiable. Others only whisper under their breath that a woman is pregnant. Do they wish to be more modest than our Lord who talked of pregnancy and childbirth, etc.? One of the young ladies stopped short when I asked her how many sacraments there were, not being willing to name marriage. She began to laugh and told me they were not allowed to name it in the convent from which she came. What? A sacrament instituted by Jesus Christ, which he honored with his presence, the obligations of which his apostles explained, and which we ought to teach to our daughters, must not be named to them? These are the things that turn a convent education into ridicule. There is much more immodesty in such proceedings than there is in speaking openly of what is innocent, and with which all pious books are filled. When our young ladies have passed through marriage, they will know that it is not a thing to be laughed at. They ought to be accustomed to speak of it very seriously, and even sadly, for I think it is the state of life in which we suffer most tribulation, even in the best marriages. They should be taught, when occasion offers, the difference between immodest words, which must never be uttered, and coarse words, the first being sinful, the second simply against good breeding. 
adieu my daughter i never can finish when it is a question of our girls and the good of the establishment end of letter from francois dubigny to madame de fontaines april twenty seventeen thirteen lighthouse illumination the electric light from on the various forces of nature by michael faraday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. lighthouse illumination the electric light by michael faraday this lecture was delivered before the Royal Institution on Friday, 9th of March, 1860. There is no part of my life which gives me more delight than my connection with the Trinity House. The occupation of nations joined together to guide the mariner over the sea to all a point of great interest is infinitely more so to those who are concerned in the operations which they carry into effect and it certainly has astonished me since i have been connected with the trinity house to see how beautifully and how wonderfully shines forth amongst nations at large the desire to do good and you will not regret having come here to-night if you follow me in the various attempts which have been made to carry out the great object of guiding in safely all people across the dark and dreary waste of waters it is wonderful to think how eagerly efforts at improvement are made by the various public bodies the trinity house in this country and commissions in france and other nations and whilst the improvements progress we come to the knowledge of such curious difficulties and such odd modes of getting over these difficulties as are not easy to be conceived i must ask you this evening to follow me from the simplest possible method of giving a sign by means of a light to persons at a distance to the modes at which we have arrived in the present day and to consider the difficulties which arise when carrying out these improvements to a practical result and the extraordinary care which those who have to judge on these points must take in order to guard against the too hasty adoption of some fancied improvement thus as has happened in some few cases doing harm instead of good if i try to make you understand these things partly by old models and partly by those which we have here it is only that i may the better be enabled to illustrate that which i look forward to as the higher mode of lighting by means of the electric lamp and the limelight there is nothing more simple than a candle being set down in a cottage window to guide a husband to his home but when we want to make a similar guide on a large scale not merely over a river or over a moor but over large expanses of sea how can we then make the signal using only a candle i have shown in this diagram figure fifty five what we may imagine to be the rays of a candle or any other source of light emanating from the centre of a sphere in all directions round to infinite distances after this simple kind of light had been used for some time it being found to be liable to be obscured by fogs or distance or other circumstance there arose the attempt to make larger lights by means of fires and after that there was introduced a very important refinement in the mode of dealing with the light namely the principle of reflection for understand this which is not known by all and not known by many who should know it that when we take a source of light a single candle for instance giving off any quantity of light we can by no means increase that light we can make arrangements around and about the light as you see here but we can by no means increase the quantity of light the utmost i can do is to direct the light which the lamp gives me by taking a certain portion of the rays going off on one side and reflecting them on to the course of the rays which issue in the opposite direction first of all let us consider how we may gather in the rays of light which pass off from this candle 
you will easily see that if I could take the half-rays on the one side and could send them by any contrivance over to the other side, I should gain an advantage in light on the side to which I directed them. This is effected in a beautiful manner by the parabolic mirror, by means of which I gather all that portion of the rays which are included in it, upwards, downwards, sideways, anywhere within its sphere of action. They are all picked up and sent forward. You thus see what a beautiful and important invention is that of the parabolic reflector for throwing forward the rays of light. Before I go further into the subject of reflection, let me point out a further mode of dealing with the direction of the light. For instance, here is a candle, and I can employ the principle of refraction to bend and direct the ray of light. And if I want to increase the light in any one direction, I must either take a reflector or use the principle of refraction. I will place this lens, figure 56, in front of the candle, and you will easily see that by its means I can throw onto that sheet of paper a great light. That is to say that instead of the light being thrown all about, it is refracted and concentrated onto that paper. So here I have another means of bending the light and sending it in one direction. And you see above a still better arrangement for the same purpose, one which comes up to the maximum, I may say, of the ability of directing light by this means. You are aware that without that arrangement of glass, the light would be dispersed in all directions. But the lens being there, all the light which passes through it is thrown into parallel beams and cast horizontally along. There is consequently no loss of light. The beam goes forward of the same dimensions and will consequently continue to go forward for five or ten miles or so long as the imperfection of the atmosphere does not absorb it. And see what a glorious power that is to be able to convert what was just now darkness on that paper into brilliant light. Whenever we have refraction of this sort, we are liable to an evil consequent upon the necessary imperfections in the form of the lens, and Dr. Tyndall will take this lens and will show you even in this small and perfect apparatus what is the evil of spherical aberration with which we have to fight. This can be illustrated by means of the electric lamp. If you look at the screen, you will see, produced by means of this lens, a figure of the coal points. This image is produced by the rays which pass through the middle of the lens, a piece of card with the hole in the center being placed in front. But if, keeping the rest of the apparatus in the same position, I change this card for another piece, which will only allow the rays to pass through the edge of the lens, you observe how inferior the image will be. In order to get it distinct, I have to bring the screen much nearer the lamp. And so, if I take the card away altogether and allow the light to pass through all parts of the lens, we cannot get a perfect image because the different parts of the lens are not able to act together. This spherical aberration is therefore what we try to avoid by building up compound lenses in the manner here shown, figure 58. Look at this beautiful apparatus. Is it not the most charming piece of workmanship? Buffoon first, and Fresnel afterwards, built up these kind of lenses, ring within ring, each at its proper adjustment, to compensate for the effects of spherical aberration. The ring round that center lens is ground so as to obviate what would otherwise give rise to spherical aberration, and the next ring being corrected in the same manner, you will perceive, if you look at the disk of light thrown by the apparatus upstairs, that there is nothing like the amount of aberration that there would have been if it had been one great bull's-eye. Here is one of Fresnel's lamps of the fourth order, so constructed. Figure 57. 
observe the fine effect obtained by these different lenses as you see them revolve before you and understand that all this upper part is made to form part of the lens each prism throwing its rays to increase the effect and although you may think it is imperfect because if you happen to sit below or above the horizontal line you perceive but little if any of the light yet you must bear in mind that we want the rays to go in a straight line to the horizon so that all that building up of the rings of glass is for the purpose of producing one fine and glorious lens of a large size to send the rays all in one direction here is another apparatus used to pull the rays down to the horizontal sheet of light so that the mariner may see it as a constant and uniform fixed light the former lamp is a revolving one and the light is seen only at certain times as the lenses move around and these are the points which make them valuable in their application there are various orders and sizes of lights in lighthouses to shine for twenty or thirty miles over the sea and to give indications according to the purposes for which they are required but suppose we want more effect than is produced by these means how are we to get more light here comes the difficulty we cannot get more light because we are limited by the condition of the burner in any of these cases if the spreading of the ray or divergence as it is called is not restrained it soon fails from weakness and if it does not diverge at all it makes the light so small that perhaps only one in a hundred can see it at the same time the south foreland lighthouse is i think three hundred or four hundred feet above the level of the sea and therefore it is necessary to have a certain divergence of the beam of light in order that it may shine along the sea to the horizon i have drawn here two wedges one has an angle of fifteen degrees and shows you the manner in which the light opens out from the reflector seen at the distance of half a mile or more the other wedge has an angle of six degrees which is the beautiful angle of fresnel when the angle is less than six degrees the mariner is not quite sure that he will see the light he may be beneath or above it and in practice it is found that we cannot have a larger angle than fifteen degrees or a less one than six degrees in order therefore to get more light we must have more combustion more cotton more oil but already there are in that lamp four wicks put in concentric rings one within the other and we cannot increase them much more owing to the divergence which would be caused by an increase in the size of the light the more the divergence the more the light is diffused and lost we are therefore restrained by the condition of the light and the apparatus to a certain sized lamp at teenmouth some of the revolving lights have ten lamps and reflectors all throwing their light forward at once but even with ten lamps and reflectors we do not get sufficient light and we want therefore a means of getting a light more intense than a candle in the space of a candle not merely an accumulation of candle upon candle but a concentration in the space of a candle of a greater amount of light and it is here that the electric light comes to be of so much value let me now show you what are the properties of that light which make it useful for lighthouse illumination and which has been brought to a practical condition by the energy and constancy of professor holmes i will first of all show you the image of the charcoal points on the screen and draw your attention to the spot where the light is produced there are the coal points the two carbons are brought within a certain distance the electricity is being urged across by the voltaic battery and the coal points are brought into an intense state of ignition you will observe that the light is essentially given by the carbons you see that one is much more luminous than the other and that is the end which principally forms the spark 
the other does not shine so much and there is a space between the two which although not very luminous is most important to the production of the light dr tyndall will help me in showing you that a blast of wind will blow out that light the electric light can in fact be blown out easier than a candle we have the power of getting our light where we please if i cause the electricity to pass between carbon and mercury i get a most intense and beautiful light most of it being given off from the portion of the mercury between the liquid and the solid pole i can show you that the light is sometimes produced by the vapor between the two poles better if i take silver than when i use mercury here is the carbon pole there is the silver and there is the beautiful green light which comes from the intervening portions now that light is more easily blown out than the common lamp the slightest puff of wind being sufficient to extinguish it as you will see if dr tyndall breathes upon it you see therefore how we are able by using this electric spark to get first of all the light into a very small space that oil lamp has a burner three and three quarters inches in diameter compare the size of the flame with the space occupied by this electric light next compare the intensity of this light with any other if i take this candle and place it by the side i actually seem to put out the candle we are thus able to get a light which while it surpasses all others in brilliancy is at the same time not too large for i might put this light into an apparatus not larger than a hat and yet i could count upon the rays being useful moreover when such large burners are used in a lantern we have to consider whether the bars of the window do not interfere to throw a shadow or otherwise but with this light there will be no difficulty of that sort as a single small speculum no larger than a hat will send it in any direction we please and it is wonderful what advantages by reason of its small bulk we have in the consideration of the different kinds of apparatus required reflecting or refracting irrespective of other reasons for using the electric light and it is these kinds of things which make us decide most earnestly and carefully in favor of the electric light i am going to show you the effect that will take place with that large lens when we throw the oil lamp out of action and put the electric light into use it is astonishing to find how little the eye can compare the relative intensities of two lights look at that screen and try to recollect the amount of light thrown upon it from the three and three quarter inch lamp of fresnel and now when we shift the lens sideways look at the glorious light arising from that small carbon point figure fifty eight see how beautifully it shines in the focus of that lens and throws the rays forward at present the electric light is put at just the same distance as the oil light and therefore being in the focus of the lens we have parallel rays which are thrown forward in a perfectly straight line as you will see by comparing the size of the lens with that of the light thrown on the screen you will now see how far we can affect this beam of light by increasing or diminishing the distance of the lamp we are able by a small adjustment to get a beam of a large or small angle and observe what power i have now over it for if i want to increase the degrees of divergence i am limited by the power of light in the case of the oil lamp but with the electric light i can make it spread over any width of the horizon by this simple adjustment these then are some of the reasons which make it desirable to employ the electric light by means of a magnet and of motion we can get the same kind of electricity as i have here from the battery and under the authority of the trinity house professor holmes has been occupied in introducing the magneto-electric light in the lighthouse at the south foreland for the voltaic battery has been tried under every conceivable circumstance and i take the liberty of saying it has hitherto proved a decided failure here however is an instrument wrought only by mechanical motion 
the moment we give motion to this soft iron in front of the magnet we get a spark it is true in this apparatus it is very small but it is sufficient for you to judge of its character it is the magnetoelectric light and an instrument has been constructed as there shown in figure fifty nine which represents a number of magnets placed radially upon a wheel three wheels of magnets and two sets of helices when the machine which is worked by a two horsepower engine is properly set in motion and the different currents are all brought together and thrown by professor holmes up into the lantern we have a light equal to the one we have been using this evening for the last six months the south foreland has been shining by means of this electric light beyond all comparison better than its former light it has shone into france and has been seen there and taken notice of by the authorities who work with beautiful accord with us in all these matters never for once during six months has it failed in doing its duty never once more than was expected by the inventor it has shone forth with its own peculiar character and this even with the old apparatus for as yet no attempt has been made to construct special reflectors or refractors for it because it is not yet established i will not tell you that the problem of employing the magnetoelectric spark for lighthouse illumination is quite solved yet although i desire it should be established most earnestly for i regard this magnetic spark as one of my own offspring the thing is not yet decidedly accomplished and what the considerations of expense and other matters may be i cannot tell i am only here to tell you as a philosopher how far the results have been carried but i do hope that the authorities will find it a proper thing to carry out in full if it cannot be introduced at all the lighthouses if it can only be used at one why really it will be an honor to the nation which can originate such an improvement as this one which must of necessity be followed by other nations you may ask what is the use of this bright light it would not be useful to us were it not for the constant changes which are taking place in the atmosphere which is never pure even when we can see the stars clearly on a bright night it is not a pure atmosphere the light of a lighthouse more than any other is liable to be dimmed by vapors and fogs and where we most want this great power is not in the finest condition of the atmosphere but when the mariner is in danger when the sleet and rain are falling and the fogs arise and the winds are blowing and he is nearing coasts where the water is shallow and abounds with rocks then is his time of danger when he most wants this light i am going to show you how by means of a little steam i can completely obscure this glorious sun this electric light which you see the cloud now obscuring the light on the screen is only such a cloud as you see when sitting in a train on a fine summer's day you may observe that the vapor passing out of the funnel casts as deep a shadow on the ground as the black funnel the very sun itself is extinguished by the steam from the funnel so that it cannot give any light and the sun itself if set in the lighthouse would not be able to penetrate such a vapor now the haze of this cloud of steam is just what we have to overcome and the electric light is as soon proportionally extinguished by an obstruction of this kind as any other light if we take two lights one four times the intensity of the other and we extinguish half of one by a vapor we extinguish half of the other and that is a fact which cannot be set aside by any arrangement but then we fall back upon the amount of light which the electric spark does give us in aid of the power of penetrating the fog for the light of the electric spark shines so far at times that even before it has arisen above the horizon twenty-five miles off it can be seen this intense light has therefore that power which we can take advantage of of bearing a great deal of obstruction before it is entirely obscured by fogs or otherwise taking care that we do not lead our authorities into error by the advice given 
we hope that we shall soon be able to recommend the trinity house from what has passed to establish either one or more good electric lights in this country end of lighthouse illumination the electric light by michael faraday read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in june two thousand twenty one Looking Ahead for Democracy by Arthur Sullivan Hoffman, Editor From Adventure Magazine, October 3rd, 1919 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Dale Grothman Looking Ahead for Democracy by Arthur Sullivan Hoffman are you a party man, a Democrat, Republican, or any of the others? If you are, are you willing to admit it? Why not be an American instead? Is there any one of the political parties that isn't working for its own interests before the interests of the country and the people as a whole? What is a political party? At best, and in theory only, merely a piece of machinery for helping express the people's will. At its worst, what it really is in this country today, a piece of machinery for enabling politicians to further their personal ambitions and selfish greed, to prevent a full, real expression of the people's will, and to gather control of the many into the hands of a few. Even fairly dull-witted Americans can see the evil and danger of letting capital, labor, or any other one class or few control things. But when the few doesn't happen to be a class in itself, many Americans are too dull to see that control by them is equally evil and dangerous. Aren't you tired of seeing Congress, for example, settle national questions? most of which have really nothing to do with the question of party, on party lines, and the evil has gone on so long that it's accepted as a matter of course. Why shouldn't our representatives, and we ourselves, be Americans first and always? The man who boasts that he has voted any one party ticket for ten or twenty years is not only a pitiable dupe, but a very poor American. The End of Looking Ahead for Democracy by Arthur Sullivan Hoffman Murder at Sea by Sir Archibald Hurd This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. It was a large hall in a great seaport town. At the sides and up and down the middle lay rows of shrouded objects with narrow passages opening between them. The blinds of the long windows had been drawn. The light was dim. From time to time men appeared at one or another of the doors, bearing other objects, which they laid reverently on the floor. No word was spoken but now and again whispers suggested that orders were being given as to where the object should be placed. Along the aisles running up and down the hall, two old seamen, bent with years, moved without noise. Here and there were little groups of people, men and women, in the distress of overwhelming sorrow. A shroud would be raised, and a hasty furtive shrinking glance taken at the feature of a man or woman, wax-like and immobile. Or again, a covering would be lifted to reveal the innocence of childhood, little hands empty and idle, little feet never again to chase elusive shadows, dancing eyes never again to sparkle, soft downy hair, damp with the sea water which still stood in beads on baby faces, no more to light up with heaven-sent smiles at the coming of father or mother, or break into ripples of welcome to some new toy, teddy bear or doll. About thirty little children had been laid out, their bodies cold and still. 
nearby were scores of silent women beautiful with the beauty of death and in other parts of the hall strong men slept the last sleep the hall had been transformed into a sepulchre of death a sudden emergency had made the change necessary news had come to the town that a splendid ship had sunk and that bodies were being brought ashore very soon the townspeople had everything prepared for the reception of their dumb unresponsive guests those quiet figures walking quietly up and down i was told were men and women searching for their loved ones husbands looking for wives and wives for husbands sisters for brothers and brothers for sisters mothers endeavoring through their tears to recognize in one or other of the silent forms little boy or girl whose merry laughter would never again bring sunshine into their lives it's a bad business this one of the old sailors a well-spoken man said to me as a grief-stricken mother bent to kiss the cold brow of her newly found child whose body had been taken from the sea a few hours before about a thousand others have gone they say these are only some of those whose bodies have been rescued scores upon scores of others went down in the ship and are now lying dead in their steel prison mocked as a gentleman said to me just now by the very comforts of stateroom and cabin children and women as well as men have you travelled in foreign parts sir spain portugal france or italy i have often stood before the pictures of the mother and the child and thought well if there is nothing in christianity as some people say it is a fine thing that men were taught to treat women tenderly and to regard children as though well as though they were visitors from heaven and now i shall never forget that hundreds of defenceless women and scores of children have gone down in this ship not by accident mind but as the result of a deliberate act carefully planned somewhere in the bible and i often used to read it at sea it is said that it were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones offend why these poor little things lying there so quiet have been murdered wickedly murdered and why then came the story of a crime without its parallel in all the long records of the human race for never before in so short a period had so many human beings been done to death in the high seas by the act of one small group of men about two thousand human beings were on board the great ship lusitania when she put out from new york on her passage across the atlantic the vessel was one of the finest riding the seas a ship which had cost a million sterling to build her passengers included men and women of every degree and of many nationalities nearly two hundred americans greeks dutch swiss mexicans russians french italians and british there were many children before the vessel sailed a statement was published warning passengers that she would be attacked by german submarines though the announcement was supposed to come from the german embassy in washington no one regarded it seriously america being a neutral state the german ambassador it was confidently assumed would not dare to declare such a policy of murder it would be an insult to the american people moreover the passengers assured themselves in this twentieth century of the christian era it was impossible to believe that there existed men in high places who would fashion or other men though under authority who would execute such a policy of cold-blooded murder on a wholesale scale such an act would cause the whole world to rise and determine upon vengeance swift and overwhelming everyone on board the great ship was confident that threat or no threat they were protected not less by the universally accepted law of nations than by the dictates of common humanity which even the pirates of the long-dead past respected the threat was dismissed as either the clumsy invention of some enemy of germany anxious to blacken her in the eyes of the world or as an effort on the part of some war-maddened and irresponsible germans to frighten women and children and thus bring the american people to a realization of what the policy of frightfulness might mean to them if pursued to its ultimate limit of all the hundreds of passengers who had booked their passages men and women of many nationalities none abandoned their plans 
the events proved that the warning had come from the German government, its agents enjoying American hospitality, protected by the United States Navy and Army and the laws of the Republic, had been directed to advertise the coming murder of Americans and others. The ship sailed as though no dastardly threat had been issued. Neither passengers nor crew entertained any doubts as to their safety, though they had no means of defense. They placed their reliance, rich men like Alfred Vanderbilt and poor men in the steerage, on the laws of God and of man. They were convinced of their safety. Furthermore, because the ship was not leaving Europe, but was on her way to Europe, and there could, therefore, be no suspicion, though she flew the British flag, that she was carrying troops. In any case, it was argued, the worst that could happen, if troops or munitions were discovered on board, would be that the Germans, if they intercepted the ship, would take the soldiers prisoners and throw any munitions overboard. As there was neither one or the other, apart from 5,000 cartridge cases, and the vessel was merely a passenger ship making a peaceful voyage, there could be no danger. Footnote. The ship was inspected by officials of the United States government before sailing, and they satisfied themselves that she had no guns mounted or unmounted on board, and that she carried no war material. End of footnote. All went well on the passage across the Atlantic, and the ship drew in towards the Irish coast. Some of the passengers had just finished their lunch, and others were still seated in the great saloons, when the captain, standing on the port side of the lower bridge, heard the cry, There is a torpedo coming, sir. Determined to prepare for the worst, Captain Turner, a veteran seaman of over thirty years' experience, had already ordered every possible bulkhead to be closed, as well as the portholes, and the lifeboats had been swung out. The ship was traveling at eighteen knots. The weather was clear, and the sea smooth when the first torpedo was seen approaching. There was no vessel of any kind within view, no challenge to stop when given, no warning was made. While still submerged, the German submarine fired a torpedo, though her commander knew that it might mean death to two thousand human beings. The great ship was struck on the starboard side between the third and fourth funnels, and one of the lifeboats, in which the hopes of those on board resided, was instantly reduced to splinters. A great gaping hole was made in the hull of the vessel. Immediately afterwards, a second torpedo delivered its shattering blow. The German submarine officer was evidently determined that none on board should escape. Both these torpedoes hit the ship on the starboard side, tearing great cavities in the hull. Then another torpedo, coming from the port side and discharged from another submarine, sped toward the crippled mammoth at a speed of forty miles an hour. Though released at a distance of not more than five hundred yards, it failed to hit the hull. But already the ship was doomed. The water rushed into the engine rooms, putting the engines out of commission, and the captain's order to head towards the land could not be carried out. Frantic signals by wireless were sent out over the desolate waste of waters, once, twice, thrice repeated. They were acknowledged, but the replies came from a long distance, and it was realized that help could not arrive in time. Then the dynamo supplying the current to the wireless installation gave out. The Germans had done their work. The ship had already taken a heavy list to starboard. In less than twenty minutes she sank in deep water, taking with her to their nameless graves eleven hundred and ninety-eight defenseless men, weak women and innocent little children. No words can convey a picture of the scenes enacted on the great liner after the two fatal assassin blows had been struck. It was a British ship with a large number of Americans on board. The captain's cry, women and children first, raised as the vessel heeled over, was instantly obeyed in the chivalrous spirit which makes men of all civilized races heroic when danger confronts them and women and children have to be saved. There were many heroes that day on board the Lusitania. Among them stands out the figure of Alfred Vanderbilt, the American millionaire, whom Englishmen, Frenchmen, and others had learnt to love as a sportsman who always thought and acted straight. When the ship was sinking, his valet, Ronald Denyer, was by his side. A few days later, a Canadian lady, Mrs. Lines, 
told the story of how these two men, master and valet, acted when they realized that either they must play the coward's part or sink in the great ship. People will not talk of Mr. Vanderbilt in future as the millionaire sportsman and man of pleasure, this Canadian lady declared. He will be remembered as the children's hero. Men and women will salute his name. When death was nearing him, he showed a gallantry which no words of mine can adequately describe. He stood outside the Palm Saloon on the starboard side, with Ronald Denyer by his side. He looked round on the scene of horror and despair with pitying eyes. "'Find all the kiddies you can, boy,' he said to his valet. The man rushed off immediately to collect the children, and as he brought them to Mr. Vanderbilt, the millionaire dashed to the boats with two little ones in his arms at a time. When he could no longer find any children, he went to the assistance of the women and placed as many as he could in safety. In all his work he was gallantly assisted by Ronald Denyer, and the two continued their efforts to the very end. Mr. Vanderbilt was a conspicuous passenger, and hence his record has been preserved. He was not the only hero who gave up hope of life in order that women and children might be saved. As the huge ship went under, and the water became black with men and women struggling for life and with little children full of terror but hardly realizing the terrible fate before them, many men, British, American, or otherwise, courted death in the very effort to rescue others. The destruction of the Lusitania was a crime without parallel in human history, but it is left behind memories which may well be a glorious heritage to those who, in beating along life's highway, have not abandoned those heroic, those simple traits of character which distinguish men from beasts. The news of the loss of the Lusitania and the assassination of those hundreds of defenseless people struck a note of horror throughout the civilized world. Men clenched their teeth and swore that such a crime should be fully punished. Women's eyes in every continent were dimmed with tears as they pictured the drowning babies on the broad bosom of the Atlantic and remembered their mothers. The conscience of the world was still very tender. Engineers tell us that as train after train, week after week, rolls over the steel rails of the permanent way, the metal gradually loses its character. It becomes dead. The conscience of the world is in process of becoming atrophied as horror secedes horror. Many months have passed since the Lusitania went down. Germany is still unpunished. The passage of time has in no way lessened the character of the crime, but throughout the world men and women have become, almost imperceptibly perhaps, immune from the sharp sense of personal grief and horror which came to them in the early days of the war. We have almost forgotten the sensations which this great crime created when first the news spread. The world suddenly awoke to realize that humanity was divided into two camps, the one consisting of men and women with hearts to bleed for sufferers, the others recognizing no law except military necessity. Let us recall the voices which came from these two camps. What did decent men throughout the world think and say? This represents not mere piracy, but piracy on a vaster scale of murder than any old-time pirate ever practiced. Mr. Roosevelt. This act is opposed to every law and every sentiment of humanity, and we raise our voice, however powerless it may be, in protest. A seafaring people which has any self-respect does not make a war of annihilation against defenseless people. Handelsbad, Amsterdam. The commander of the German submarine who performed this work can look with pride upon it, is it not so, Satan? Tajid, Amsterdam. This is an unpardonable crime against humanity. It is difficult to understand how an officer of the German navy could consent to perform such an act. Naya Daglid Alejandra, Stockholm. Whenever, in future, the Germans venture to speak of their culture, the answer will be it does not exist. It committed suicide on May 7, 1915. Wort Land, Copenhagen. The mad and reckless actions of the German submarine has now reached its culminating point. The whole world looks with horror and detestation on the event. Often Posten, Norway. 
there is a limit dividing like an abyss the soldier and the scoundrel germany crossed it yesterday idea nazionale italy this is one of the most atrocious episodes of this horrible war one cannot understand how the sinking of the lusitania can profit germany great britain has lost a liner germany has assumed the responsibility for the painful impression caused thereby giornale d'italia the sinking of the lusitania with its heavy freightage of peaceful travellers including hundreds of women and children was not an act of war it was a deed of wholesale murder all considerations of the law of war have vanished in face of so great a catastrophe which violates all laws of common humanity new york american even in the days of piracy maritime history never recorded crimes of such character germany has exceeded the limits of cruelty and barbarity we believe that humanity will not contemplate such abominations impassively liberal spain only the spontaneous and collective protest of the whole civilized world outside the pale of which germany has placed herself can be the answer of all right-minded people to this new challenge by this brutal country telegraph amsterdam how was the news received in germany that other camp it was welcomed with shameless demonstrations of glee while british and irish sailors out on the atlantic with sad hearts were gathering in the bodies of the men women and children who had been slain hundreds of telegrams a berlin message stated has been sent to admiral von tirpitz congratulating him from new york came a message that riotous scenes of jubilation took place amongst germans in the german clubs and restaurants it being added that many germans got drunk in toasting der tag the press of germany and austria applauded the achievement as an exhibition of german virility and ruthlessness this war on women and babies filled those newspapers with satisfaction unbounded the sinking of the lusitania is a success for our submarines which must be placed besides the greatest achievements in this naval war the sinking of the great british steamer is a success the moral significance of which is still greater than the material success with joyful pride we contemplate the latest deed of our navy and it will not be the last kolnitsche volzeitung may tenth nineteen fifteen the news will be received by the german people with unanimous satisfaction since it proves to england and the whole world that germany is quite in earnest in regard to her submarine warfare cologne gazette may fifteenth nineteen fifteen we rejoice over this new success of the german navy nu frei presse may fifteenth nineteen fifteen the city of magdeburg distinguished itself by proposing to honor the actual murderers from that place on may nineteenth came the news that a committee had been formed for the purpose of collecting money as a national gift for the officers and crew of the submarine which sent the lusitania to the bottom and slaughtered so many defenseless men women and children of many nations within a few days the american government had sent to the authorities at berlin a note of protest its terms may be recalled if only as a reminder of the official view which was taken by a neutral nation of an event which had robbed over a hundred americans of their lives reference was first made to the sinking of the passenger steamer falaba by a german submarine on march twenty eighth through which mr leon c thrasher an american citizen was drowned the ship was attacked without warning and even after the terrified women and children had scrambled into the boats the germans continued to rain shots on them from quick-firing guns the american note also referred to the attack on the american vessel cushing by a german aeroplane and the torpedoing of the american vessel gulf light by a german submarine as a result of which two or more americans met their death and then attention was called to the unparalleled circumstances of cruelty amounting to wholesale murder in which the lusitania was sunk the american government recited the law of nations and the dictates of humanity which hitherto had been the foundation of that sacred freedom of the seas which all nations in the past had combined to maintain 
it does not understand the imperial german government to question those rights but assumes on the contrary that the imperial government accept as a matter of course the rule that the lives of non-combatants whether they be of neutral citizenship or citizens of the nations at war cannot lawfully or rightfully be put in jeopardy by the capture or destruction of unarmed merchantmen and recognize also as all other nations do the obligation to take the usual precaution of visit and search to ascertain whether a suspected merchantman is in fact of belligerent nationality or is in fact carrying contraband under a neutral flag the government of the united states desires to call the attention of the imperial german government with the utmost earnestness to the fact that the objection to their present method of attack against the trade of their enemies lies in the practical impossibility of employing submarines in the destruction of commerce without disregarding those rules of fairness reason justice and humanity which all modern opinion regards as imperative it is practically impossible for officers of submarines to visit a merchantman at sea and examine her papers and cargo it is practically impossible for them to make a prize of her and if they cannot put a prize crew on board they cannot sink her without leaving her crew and all on board to the mercy of the sea and her small boats these facts it is understood the imperial german government frankly admits we are informed that in the instances of which we have spoken time enough for even that poor measure of safety was not given and in the last two of the cases cited not so much as a warning was received manifestly submarines cannot be used against merchantmen as the last few weeks have shown without an inevitable violation of many sacred principles of justice and humanity american citizens act within their indisputable rights in taking their ships and in traveling wherever their legitimate business calls them upon the high seas and exercise their rights in what should be a well-justified confidence that their lives will not be endangered by acts done in clear violation of universally acknowledged international obligations and certainly in the confidence that their own government will sustain them in the exercise of their rights finally the american note refers in scathing terms to the formal warning purporting to come from the imperial embassy at washington and added that no warning that an unlawful and inhumane act will be committed can possibly be accepted as an excuse or palliation for that act or as an abatement for the responsibility of its commission the horror with which civilized people receive the news of the murder of nearly twelve hundred men women and children who were traveling by the lusitania in the stern terms of the american note had no effect on german policy under the horrified gaze of the world the slaughter of non-combatants continued without mercy and without regret as also without fear apparently of any action which neutral nations might take below are cited the outstanding crimes of this campaign during subsequent months of nineteen fifteen june twenty eighth nineteen fifteen the armenian british lives lost thirty august nineteen nineteen fifteen arabic british lives lost thirty september fourth nineteen fifteen hesperian british thirty two lives lost november seventh nineteen fifteen ancona italian two hundred and eight lives lost december twenty fourth nineteen fifteen ville de ciotat french eighty lives lost december thirtieth nineteen fifteen persia british three hundred and eighty five lives lost the arabic like the lusitania was a great liner carrying passengers she also was struck down without warning by a german submarine when outward bound from liverpool to new york in charge of captain finch there were many children and many women on board the arabic as the germans well knew in ten minutes the arabic had disappeared the discipline of passengers and crew was magnificent in that short period almost all on board were transferred to the boats fortunately unlike the lusitania the arabic kept on an even keel and the work of rescue by the heroic officers and men of the ship assisted by the male passengers was greatly facilitated 
a graphic picture of the last terrible scene was given by mr kenneth douglas of london an actor i was in my cabin and was in pajamas when i heard the cry that a steamer was being torpedoed whether it was the arabic or another ship attacked by a german foe i did not know but i hastened to dress myself and rushed on deck to see the british steamship dunsley in trouble after the torpedo had penetrated her hull a loud explosion followed i naturally thought that the next steamer the german submarine would attack would be the white star liner i was on and my premonition proved only too true the tramp liner succumbed to the torpedo and had disappeared with a plunge in the ocean within a very short time the lifeboats were quickly launched as were also the life-saving rafts and were floating in the water the arabic was then struck without any warning whatever being given she was hit on the port side with a torpedo and a similar explosion to that on the dunsley followed it was a deafening sound and thrilling in the extreme and made all the passengers considerably alarmed but there was no time to think of the seriousness of the situation life was at stake and no one knew what to do to save it excitement reigned there was a bit of a swell on that made it difficult to get into the boats as they were bobbing up and down however i got into one where i had an opportunity of seeing the arabic take her final dip in the ocean she caused a great suction and the water turned it into whirlpools which drew the various lifeboats and rafts into it and twisted them round and round and made one think that they were finally going to be submerged and sent to the bottom i saw several women men and children in the water struggling for their lives our boat proceeded toward two men in the water who had life-saving apparatus on we rescued them by dragging them into the boat for a fleeting moment the submarine which had dealt the fatal blow at the arabic was seen and then she disappeared officers and men caring nothing for the human agony on which they turned their backs one incident in particular may be recalled as an illustration of the way in which sailors can face death the third engineer an officer named london though he knew his end was at hand stood by his engines unshrinkingly in order that all orders from the bridge might be carried out to the very last an electrician named burns was faithful to the end performing his duties courageously and unflinchingly these two men and others remained at their post to the last and gave up their lives in order that others might be saved in the case of the hesperian the death roll was comparatively small as in that of the arabic but no gratitude is due to the germans on that account the intention was to commit acts of wholesale murder the attempt to consign to the pitiless ocean the six hundred people who were traveling in the hesperian was aggravated by the fact that a week before count bernstorff the german ambassador at washington had in the name of his government given to mr lansing the american secretary of state a promise that passenger liners will not be sunk without warning and without ensuring the safety of the non-combatants aboard provided that the liner do not try to escape or offer resistance the pledge had hardly been made before it was violated the hesperian received no warning she did not try to escape she did not offer resistance without mercy the submarine struck her down bringing over six hundred human beings face to face with death in the most terrible form the campaign of murder on the high seas which had been undertaken against british and french ships was afterwards extended to the italian mercantile marine the passenger liner ancona outward bound from naples to new york with over five hundred passengers and crew the former mostly emigrants and including many children was sunk in the mediterranean by a torpedo fired by a submarine flying the austrian flag but believed to be manned in part by germans in this instance the submarine carried more powerful guns than other submarines which had been active and when yet far off brought the ship under a heavy bombardment killing and injuring passengers then without pause although the ancona stopped a torpedo was fired hitting the ship in a vulnerable spot amid the piteous screaming of women and the heart-rending panic of the children the captain and his officers endeavored to transfer their human freight to the boats 
while this work of mercy was still in progress the submarine continued the deadly onslaught with her guns pouring shot after shot on the ship and on the boats with callous indifference the only explanation from vienna of this murderous outrage which closed in death the eyes of over two hundred men women and children was that the ancona had tried to escape this was the excuse made in an austrian official communique the real facts ascertained after the fullest inquiry were set forth by the italian government the austrian communique is false in its fundamental facts all the survivors of the ancona testify that the submarine made no signal whatsoever to bring the ship to a stop nor did it even fire a blank warning shot this armed aggression took place without any preliminary warning the ancona was bound for new york and could not have been carrying either such passengers or cargo as could justify capture and therefore she had no reason for attempting to avoid examination moreover it is a false and malicious assertion to state that the loss of so many human lives was due to the conduct of the crew on the contrary the bombardment by the submarine continued after the ancona had stopped and was also directed against the boats filled with people thereby causing numerous victims one of the third-class passengers of the ancona who escaped by a miracle has described the scenes of suffering and agony which the crew of the submarine witnessed without one pang of regret exactly at one o'clock on monday afternoon we sighted a submarine at a great distance she came up to the surface and made full speed in our direction firing as she did so a shot which went wide across our bows we took this to be a warning to stop immediately there was the wildest panic on board not only among the women and children but among the men too the former screamed piteously and the frightened children clung desperately to their mothers meantime he continued the submarine continued to shell us while gaining rapidly upon us after the fifth shot the chart house was partly carried away and another shot completely destroyed it the engines then ceased going and the ancona was at a standstill the submarine which we could now see dimly was austrian she came alongside and then we heard the commander talking to the captain of the ancona in a somewhat curt manner we were told that the austrian commander had given a few minutes time for the passengers and crew to abandon the ship then the submarine withdrew to a little distance no time was lost in making the necessary arrangements but soon there ensued a regular pandemonium all the passengers women and men big and little appeared to have completely lost their heads the submarine continued to fire around the vessel there was a rush for the boats which were being lowered the passengers got into the boats but in the confusion many of them were not altogether free from the davits and were overturned by their heavy load the occupants being thrown into the water many struggled before our eyes until they were drowned the shrieks of the women and children rent the air but no help it appeared could be given during this indescribable and heart-rending scene the submarine continued to discharge shot after shot such ruthless conduct was all the more incomprehensible as not one shot was directed at the ship itself the assailants firing all around the vessel as if to create as much terror as possible the assassination of the passengers on board the ancona was followed by the destruction of the ville de ciotat and then as the year nineteen fifteen was drawing to its close the world was shocked by the news of the destruction of the british liner persia three hundred and eighty-five human beings were offered up as a sacrifice to the modern Malak. the ship was bound from london to bombay and when off the island of crete she was torpedoed there were five hundred and fifty people on board including nearly a score of americans between the fatal blow and the sinking of the ship five minutes only elapsed in which to make hurried preparation for the safety of passengers and crew the majority of those on board were women and children by the merciful intervention of providence or other cause beyond human comprehension nearly two hundred passengers after indescribable experiences in small boats places of safety at last reached land not one of them but will carry to the grave 
indelible memories of the last scene as the great ship plunged beneath the water they will never forget the cries of anguish of the women they will always remember when they see a child playing unconscious of danger confiding in the protection of father or mother the fate of the little children of the persia who in those last moments found that their simple faith had no substance such are a few incidents in the campaign of murderous piracy conducted in the high seas with an inhumanity without its parallel in the world's annals there were pirates in the past outlaws who committed incidental murders in pursuit of their policy of robbery the destruction of life was trivial they seldom killed merely for the sake of killing the most callous destroyed a few men here and there in order to remove witnesses who might tell tales of their villainy whatever the nationality of these pirates all the law-abiding nations of the world conspired to punish them with the direst punishment known to men german piracy is in a class alone and apart no precedent can be found for it never before by the deliberate act of a small body of men have twelve hundred people defenceless on the high seas been sent to their death in a matter of a few minutes that constitutes germany's record it has never been equalled and who can doubt that except by germany it will never be approached by any nation however much its passions may be roused by the fierce pursuit of war the german campaign shows to the world the prussian spirit in its maritime manifestation and unhappily austria's future is indelibly condemned by the same mark of cain as the years roll on is the world to forget those little children and defenceless women to say nothing of the non-combatant men who lie at the bottom of the restless sea dumb memorials to this twentieth century outburst of something more than barbaric brutality mark the conditions under which all these murders have been committed the only excuse which the germans and austrians can advance is that they are exercising the rights under prize law of attacking their opponents commerce what is prize law it consists in the right of a belligerent to take property from an enemy and sequester it for his own use the very word prize indicates the character of this right before the war the routine recognized by civilized states was that a merchant ship might be captured and taken into a convenient port there to be adjudicated upon by a prize court it was admitted that the non-combatants passengers and crew should not be injured much less killed in exceptional circumstances the man of war after visiting the ship and examining her papers in order to ascertain beyond doubt her nationality and character might sink her if there was no port to which she could be taken but in that event every precaution it was declared had to be taken to remove passengers and crew to a place of safety is a small boat cast adrift on the face of stormy waters and shelled by enemy guns a place of safety throughout the war germany and austria have infringed the laws of nations and have outraged the dictates of humanity they have slaughtered unarmed men including men of neutral nationalities delicately nurtured women and tiny children the submarine is mistakenly regarded by some people as a small frail craft of comparatively recent invention it is nothing of the kind over a hundred years ago an american engineer named fulton a mechanical genius built a submarine boat nelson had heard of submarines the earlier vessels constructed to travel under water were impracticable instruments of war because for many years it was difficult to provide suitable means of locomotion the coming of the motor engine solved the problem which had already been simplified by the discovery of electricity the submarine as a practicable and destructive agent of war was developed not by the germans but by the french and the americans it was the germans however who pressed the submarine boat into their service in order to enable them to commit acts of villainy and murder of a character and on a scale which excel any demoniacal scheme which ever entered the brain of a drink-sodden pirate of the past a very outlaw among men but the condemnation of germany does not end there before the war opened submarines were building as large as many ships which germany has always described as cruisers by immemorial custom there are limits to the action which a cruiser may take in warring against an enemy's commerce 
on approaching a merchant ship she must fire two blunt shots across the bows as a warning to stop if these produce no result she may discharge a live shot not at but across the bow of the vessel if this fails then the merchant ship must accept the risk but these preliminaries seldom failed in past wars and the world was spared such tragedies as have been of frequent occurrence during this war without excuse or justification when the merchant vessel has stopped the commander of the cruiser must send a boarding party the papers must be examined the captain questioned and then in accordance with the rules sanctified by time and the promptings of mercy towards those who are defenceless every possible measure must be taken to provide for the comfort and safety of passengers and crew that is the routine of the sea the modern submarine is a cruiser she displaces from one thousand to two thousand tons of water she carries as her main armament tubes from which she can discharge torpedoes with from two to three hundred pounds of explosive material she also mounts guns some of the german submarines carry more powerful weapons than were mounted in the frigates which took part in the american revolutionary war and they are far more powerful than the average armament of the privateers which periodically swept the seas in the eighteenth and early nineteenth centuries many german submarines are also armored as a protection against gunfire over and above all the submarine has offensive and defensive powers which no frigate or cruiser ever possessed she can submerge herself in order to approach unseen a defenseless merchant ship and she can also adopt these tactics to avoid attack if a more powerful man-of-war of enemy character comes on the scene the submarine is a cruiser with powers of attack and defense greater than an ordinary cruiser footnote a cruiser it may be added is armed with torpedoes similar to those carried by submarines as well as by guns End footnote. but her hull is devoted largely to her engines the surface engines and the engines for use when submerged and to the storage of torpedoes and shells for the guns can it be pleaded because the germans to obtain high speed and offensive power fill the space in the hull with engines torpedoes and other equipment for war that therefore they can make that an excuse for not attempting to save the lives of those who are traveling by ships which they attack without warning and with callous disregard of every human feeling if humanity admits that claim then whatever two nations are at war in years to come the seas will be unsafe for peaceful travel by neutrals for the submarine has come to stay these craft will increase in size power and speed contrast with the record of the british fleet these manifestations of hideous cruelty revealed in the course of the only maritime operations of the second greatest naval power in the world since her cruisers were driven off the seas and the main fleet imprisoned in a ring of steel the germans began hostilities by sowing mines contrary to the law of nations in the pathway of innocent commerce belligerent or neutral was no matter the british responded by organizing a vast service for the dangerous work of destroying these destructive agents with the result that hundreds of brave british lives have been spent in protecting the mercantile sailors of the world from the lurking perils that policy of outrage by mechanical minds the germans have continued with a mounting record of slaughter of defenseless seamen and fishermen of almost every state further light on the methods of the two services was shed by an incident in the north sea three british cruisers had been sunk by a german submarine using a neutral flag as cover a number of the seamen succeeded in getting on a raft and some british sailors in another ship attempted to rescue them a german submarine on successive occasions drove off the rescuers and the unhappy men perished when the british cruisers good hope and monmouth sank the germans made no effort to rescue a single officer or man of the two crews admiral and boy all perished imagine the callous inhumanity of men who could stand by unmoved and see hundreds of sailors perish for want of a helping hand and then mark the contrast a brush between destroyers occurred in the north sea in which the germans were worsted two destroyers being sunk in some pride for the divergence of practice of british and german sailors was then already becoming marked the admiralty announced 
after the destroyer action on saturday afternoon strenuous efforts were made to rescue the german sailors lieutenant hartnell going into the water himself to save a german in consequence two officers and forty-four men out of a total of fifty-nine were picked up the german prisoners stated that they had sunk a british trawler before being sighted by the la forêt the british destroyer and that they picked up a two-striped officer i e a lieutenant and two men when asked what had become of them they stated that their prisoners were below and time was short it must therefore be concluded that the officer and the two men have perished that story furnishes another picture of the inhumane methods of the navy of the nouveau riche nation of the world which in its mad career for power and wealth has not had time or inclination to learn what humanity and mercy mean the germans in the early months of the war in short made it a practice to take no prisoners and to make no effort to save from drowning poor men struggling for their lives in the water let them drown was in effect the german declaration of policy on the other hand not a man of war flying the german flag has been destroyed in honorable warfare by the british navy but endeavors have been made to save life in the north sea in the english channel in the far east off the falkland islands german sailors including the son of grand admiral von Tirpitz and captain von muller of the cruiser emden have been saved german naval prisoners by thousands are at this moment being treated with consideration and even indulgence in the british isles all of them having been rescued from drowning these officers and men bear testimony by their very lives that the british navy is still faithful to its ancient traditions when nelson was about to go into action on the eve of trafalgar he wrote on his knees a prayer may the great god whom i worship grant to my country and to europe in general a great and glorious victory and may no misconduct in any one tarnish it and may humanity after victory be the predominant feature in the british fleet that prayer was answered nelson's prayer was the prayer which all sailors of polite nations had been wont to put up seeking to extend to others that mercy for which they in extremity of circumstances would seek there is a fellowship of the sea from that fellowship first germany and then austria hungary have expelled themselves they have not only left men of war's men to sink under their very eyes but have murdered deliberately and in cold blood hundreds of merchant sailors unoffending and unarmed and thousands of peaceful passengers by sea defenseless men of many nationalities americans representing all parts of the great continent greeks swiss spaniards portuguese dutch swedes danes norwegians italians french russian and british have been mercilessly assassinated gentlewomen have been condemned to death little children have been ruthlessly slaughtered since the world began to move in its orbit there have been no such massacres on the high seas as those callously planned and executed by the bloodthirsty servants of the two kaisers this is the twentieth century of the christian era from every ocean rises from little children of a dozen or more states though all children are of the one kingdom a cry for the punishment of their murderers if only that other children may be spared their fate can you not hear their appeal nevertheless it is being made and with all the childish voices mingle the sobs of hundreds of gentlewomen and the deeper tones of men who have been done to death without opportunity of defence claiming that the vengeance of god if not the vengeance of man shall requite these attilas of the sea from every crested wave and every sea the same dirge will continue to rise and fill the ears of men women and children until such crimes have been punished and expiated in the one and only way explanation what explanation can there be apology what apology can wipe out all the stains of blood reparation can german money bring back to life those who have been foully murdered the record stands revealed to the civilized world nothing can efface it but the spirits of those men women and children whose minds have been racked in agony and whose bodies have been foully destroyed call aloud for the punishment of the murderers archibald heard End of Murder at Sea by Sir Archibald Hurd
Excerpt from Book Six of The Principles of Moral and Political Philosophy by William Paley, published in 1785. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book Six Elements of Political Knowledge, Chapter Two how subjection to civil government is maintained could we view our own species from a distance or regard mankind with the same sort of observation with which we read the natural history or remark the manners of any other animal there is nothing in the human character which would more surprise us than the almost universal subjugation of strength to weakness than to see many millions of robust men in the complete use and exercise of their personal faculties and without any defect of courage waiting upon the will of a child a woman a driveller or a lunatic and although when we suppose a vast empire in absolute subjection to one person and that one depressed beneath the level of his species by infirmities or vice we suppose perhaps an extreme case yet in all cases even in the most popular forms of civil government the physical strength resides in the governed in what manner opinion thus prevails over strength or how power which naturally belongs to superior force is maintained in opposition to it in other words by what motives the many are induced to submit to the few becomes an inquiry which lies at the root of almost every political speculation it removes indeed but does not resolve the difficulty to say that civil governments are nowadays almost universally upholden by standing armies for the question still returns how are these armies themselves kept in subjection are made to obey the commands and carry on the designs of the prince or state which employs them now although we should look in vain for any single reason which will account for the general submission of mankind to civil government yet it may not be difficult to assign for every class and character in the community considerations powerful enough to dissuade each from any attempt to resist established authority every man has his motive though not the same in this as in other instances the conduct is similar but the principles which produce it extremely various there are three distinctions of character into which the subjects of a state may be divided into those who obey from prejudice those who obey from reason and those who obey from self-interest one they who obey from prejudice are determined by an opinion of right in their governors which opinion is founded upon prescription in monarchies and aristocracies which are hereditary the prescription operates in favor of particular families in republics and elected offices in favor of particular forms of government or constitutions nor is it to be wondered at that mankind should reverence authority founded in prescription when they observe that it is prescription which confers the title to almost everything else the whole course and all the habits of civil life favor this prejudice upon what other foundation stands any man's right to his estate the right of primogeniture the succession of kindred the descent of property the inheritance of honors the demand of tithes tolls rents or services from the estates of others the right of way the powers of office and magistracy, the privileges of nobility the immunities of the clergy upon what are they all founded in the apprehension at least of the multitude but upon prescription to what else when the claims are contested is the appeal made it is natural to transfer the same principle to the affairs of government and to regard those exertions of power which have been long exercised and acquiesced in as so many rights in the sovereign 
and to consider obedience to his commands within certain accustomed limits as enjoined by that rule of conscience which requires us to render every man his due in hereditary monarchies the prescriptive title is corroborated and its influence considerably augmented by an ascension of religious sentiments and by that sacredness which men are wont to ascribe to the persons of princes princes themselves have not failed to take advantage of this disposition by claiming a superior dignity as it were of nature or a peculiar delegation from the supreme being for this purpose were introduced the titles of sacred majesty of god's anointed representative vice-regent together with the ceremonies of investitures and coronations which are calculated not so much to recognize the authority of sovereigns as to consecrate their persons where a fabulous religion permitted it the public veneration has been challenged by bolder pretensions the roman emperors usurped the titles and arrogated the worship of gods the mythology of the heroic ages and of many barbarous nations was easily converted to this purpose some princes like the heroes of homer and the founder of the roman name derived their birth from the gods others with numa pretended a secret communication with some divine being and others again like the incas of peru and the ancient saxon kings extracted their descent from the deities of their country the lama of tibet at this day is held forth to his subjects not as the offspring or successor of a divine race of princes but as the immortal god himself the object at once of civil obedience and religious adoration this instance is singular and may be accounted the farthest point to which the abuse of human credulity has ever been carried but in all these instances the purpose was the same to engage the reverence of mankind by an application to their religious principles the reader will be careful to observe that in this article we denominate every opinion whether true or false a prejudice which is not founded upon argument in the mind of the person who entertains it two they who obey from reason that is to say from conscience as instructed by reasonings and conclusions of their own are determined by the consideration of the necessity of some government or other the chief mischief of civil commotions and the danger of resettling the government of their country better or at all if once subverted or disturbed three they who obey from self-interest are kept in order by want of leisure by a succession of private cares pleasures and engagements by contentment or a sense of the ease plenty and safety which they enjoy or lastly and principally by fear foreseeing that they would bring themselves by resistance into a worse situation than their present inasmuch as the strength of the government each discontented subject reflects is greater than his own and he knows not that others would join him this last consideration has often been called opinion of power this account of the principles by which mankind are retained in their obedience to civil government may suggest the following cautions one let civil governors learn hence to respect their subjects let them be admonished that the physical strength resides in the governed that this strength wants only to be felt and roused to lay prostrate the most ancient and confirmed dominion that civil authority is founded in opinion that general opinion there ought always to be treated with deference and managed with delicacy and circumspection two opinion of right which follows the custom being for the most part founded on nothing else and lending one principal support to government every innovation in the constitution or in other words in the custom of governing diminishes the stability of government hence some absurdities are to be retained and many small inconveniences endured in every country 
rather than that the usage should be violated or the course of public affairs diverted from their old and smooth channel even names are not indifferent when the multitude are to be dealt with there is a charm in sounds it was upon this principle that several statesmen of those times advised cromwell to assume the title of king together with the ancient style and insignia of royalty the minds of many they contended would be brought to acquiesce in the authority of a king who suspected the office and were offended with the administration of a protector novelty reminded them of usurpation the adversaries of this design opposed the measure from the same persuasion of the efficacy of names and forms jealous lest the veneration paid to these should add an influence to the new settlement which might ensnare the liberty of the commonwealth three government may be too secure the greatest tyrants have been those whose titles were the most unquestioned whenever therefore the opinion of right becomes too predominant and superstitious it is abated by breaking the custom thus the revolution broke the custom of succession and thereby moderated both in the prince and in the people those lofty notions of hereditary right which in the one were become a continual incentive to tyranny and disposed the other to invite servitude by undue compliances and dangerous concessions four as ignorance of union and want of communication appear among the principal preservatives of civil authority it behooves every state to keep its subjects in this want and ignorance not only by vigilance in guarding against actual confederacies and combinations but by a timely care to prevent great collections of men of any separate party of religion or of like occupation or profession or in any way connected by a participation of interest or passion from being assembled in the same vicinity a protestant establishment in this country may have little to fear from its popish subjects scattered as they are throughout the kingdom and intermixed with the protestant inhabitants which yet might think them a formidable body if they were gathered together into one country the most frequent and desperate riots are those which break out amongst men of the same profession as weavers miners sailors this circumstance makes a mutiny of soldiers more to be dreaded than any other insurrection hence also one danger of an overgrown metropolis and of those great cities and crowded districts into which the inhabitants of trading countries are commonly collected the worst effect of popular tumults consists in this that they discover to the insurgents the secret of their own strength teach them to depend upon it against a future occasion and both produce and diffuse sentiments of confidence in one another and assurances of mutual support leagues thus formed and strengthened may overawe or overset the power of any state and the danger is greater in proportion as from the propinquity of habitation and intercourse of employment the passions and counsels of a party can be circulated with ease and rapidity it is by these means and in such situations that the minds of men are so affected and prepared that the most dreadful uproars often arise from the slightest provocations when the train is laid a spark will produce the explosion chapter three the duty of submission to civil government explained the subject of this chapter is sufficiently distinguished from the subject of the last as the motives which actually produce civil obedience may be and often are very different from the reasons which make that obedience a duty in order to prove civil obedience to be a moral duty and an obligation upon the conscience it hath been usual with many political writers at the head of whom we find the venerable name of locke to state a compact between the citizen and the state as the ground and cause of the relation between them which compact binding the parties for the same general reason that private contracts do 
resolves the duty of submission to civil government into the universal obligation of fidelity in the performance of promises this compact is twofold first an express compact by the primitive founders of the state who are supposed to have convened for the declared purpose of settling the terms of their political union and a future constitution of government the whole body is supposed in the first place to have unanimously consented to be bound by the resolutions of the majority that majority in the next place to have fixed certain fundamental regulations and then to have constituted either in one person or in an assembly the rule of succession or appointment being at the same time determined a standing legislature to whom under these pre-established restrictions the government of the state was thenceforward committed and whose laws the several members of the convention were by their first undertaking thus personally engaged to obey this transaction is sometimes called the social compact and these supposed original regulations compose what are meant by the constitution the fundamental laws of the constitution and form on the one side the inherent indefeasible prerogative of the crown and on the other the inalienable imprescriptible birthright of the subject secondly a tacit or implied compact by all succeeding members of the state who by accepting its protection consent to be bound by its laws in like manner as whoever voluntarily enters into a private society is understood without any other or more explicit stipulation to promise a conformity with the rules and obedience to the government of that society as the known conditions upon which he is admitted to a participation of its privileges this account of the subject although specious and patronized by names the most respectable appears to labor under the following objections that it is founded upon a supposition false in fact and leading to dangerous conclusions no social compact similar to what is here described was ever made or entered into in reality no such original convention of the people was ever actually holden or in any country could be holden antecedent to the existence of civil government in that country it is to suppose it possible to call savages out of caves and deserts to deliberate and vote upon topics which the experience and studies and refinements of civil life alone suggest therefore no government in the universe began from this original some imitation of a social compact may have taken place as a revolution the present age has been witness to a transaction which bears the nearest resemblance to this political idea of any of which history has preserved the account or memory i refer to the establishment of the united states of north america we saw the people assembled to elect deputies for the avowed purpose of framing the constitution of a new empire we saw this deputation of the people deliberating and resolving upon a form of government erecting a permanent legislature distributing the functions of sovereignty establishing and promulgating a code of fundamental ordinances which were to be considered by succeeding generations not merely as laws and acts of the state but as the very terms and conditions of the confederation as binding not only upon the subjects and magistrates of the state but as limitations of power which were to control and regulate the future legislature yet even here much is presupposed in settling the constitution many important parts were presumed to be already settled the qualifications of the constituents who were admitted to vote in the election of members of congress as well as the mode of electing the representatives were taken from the old forms of government 
that was wanting from which every social union should set off and which alone makes the resolution of the society the act of the individual the unconstrained consent of all to be bound by the decision of the majority and yet without this previous consent the revolt and the regulations which followed it were compulsory upon dissentience but the original compact we are told is not proposed as a fact but as a fiction which furnishes a commodious explication of the mutual rights and duties of sovereigns and subjects in answer to this representation of the matter we observe that the original compact if it be not a fact is nothing can confer no actual authority upon laws or magistrates nor afford any foundation to rights which are supposed to be real and existing but the truth is that in the books and in the apprehension of those who deduce our civil rights and obligations a pactus the original convention is appealed to and treated of as a reality whenever the disciples of this system speak of the constitution of the fundamental articles of the constitution of laws being constitutional or unconstitutional of inherent inalienable inextinguishable rights either in the prince or in the people or indeed of any laws usages or civil rights as transcending the authority of the subsisting legislature or possessing a force and sanction superior to what belongs to the modern acts and edicts of the legislature they secretly refer us to what passed at the original convention they would teach us to believe that certain rules and ordinances were established by the people at the same time that they settled the charter of government and the powers as well as the form of the future legislature that this legislature consequently deriving its commission and existence from the consent and act of the primitive assembly of which indeed it is only the standing deputation continues subject in the exercise of its offices and as to the extent of its power to the rules reservations and limitations which the same assembly then made and prescribed to it as the first members of the state were bound by express stipulation to obey the government which they had erected so the succeeding inhabitants of the same country are understood to promise allegiance to the constitution and government they find established by accepting its protection claiming its privileges and acquiescing in its laws more especially by the purchase or inheritance of lands to the possession of which allegiance to the state is annexed as the very service and condition of the tenure smoothly as this train of argument proceeds little of it will endure examination the native subjects of modern states are not conscious of any stipulation with the sovereigns of ever exercising an election whether they will be bound or not by the acts of the legislature of any alternative being proposed to their choice of a promise either required or given nor do they apprehend that the validity or authority of the laws depends at all upon their recognition or consent in all stipulations whether they be expressed or implied private or public formal or constructive the party stipulating must both possess the liberty of assent and refusal and also be conscious of this liberty which cannot with truth be affirmed of the subjects of civil government as government is now or ever was actually administered this is a defect which no arguments can excuse or supply all presumptions of consent without this consciousness or in opposition to it are vain and erroneous still less is it possible to reconcile with any idea of stipulation the practice in which all european nations agree of founding allegiance upon the circumstance of nativity that is of claiming and treating as subjects all those who are born within the confines of their dominions 
although removed to any other country in their youth or infancy in this instance certainly the state does not presume a compact also if the subject be bound only by his own consent and if the voluntary abiding in the country be the proof and intimation of that consent by what arguments should we defend the right which sovereigns universally assume of prohibiting when they please the departure of their subjects out of the realm again when it is contended that the taking and holding possession of land amounts to an acknowledgment of the sovereign and a virtual promise of allegiance to his laws it is necessary to the validity of the argument to prove that the inhabitants who first composed and constituted the state collectively possessed a right to the soil of the country a right to parcel it out to whom they pleased and to annex to the donation what conditions they thought fit how came they by that right an agreement amongst themselves would not confer it that could only adjust what already belonged to them a society of men vote themselves to be the owners of a region of the world does that vote unaccompanied especially with any culture enclosure or proper act of occupation make it theirs does it entitle them to exclude others from it or to dictate the conditions upon which it shall be enjoyed yet this original collective right and ownership is the foundation for all the reasoning by which the duty of allegiance is inferred from the possession of land the theory of government which affirms the existence and the obligation of a social compact would after all merit little discussion and however groundless and unnecessary should receive no opposition from us did it not appear to lead to conclusions unfavorable to the improvement and to the peace of human society first upon the supposition that government was first erected by and that it derives all its just authority from resolutions entered into by a convention of the people it is capable of being presumed that many points were settled by that convention anterior to the establishment of the subsisting legislature and which the legislature consequently has no right to alter or interfere with these points are called the fundamentals of the constitution and as it is impossible to determine how many or what they are the suggesting of any such serves extremely to embarrass the deliberations of the legislature and affords a dangerous pretense for disputing the authority of the laws it is this sort of reasoning so far as reasoning of any kind was employed in the question that produced in this nation the doubt which so much agitated the minds of men in the reign of the second charles whether an act of parliament could of right alter or limit the succession of the crown secondly if it be by virtue of a compact that the subject owes obedience to civil government it will follow that he ought to abide by the form of government which he finds established be it ever so absurd or inconvenient he is bound by his bargain it is not permitted to any man to retreat from this engagement merely because he finds the performance disadvantageous or because he has an opportunity of entering into a better this law of contracts is universal and to call the relation between the sovereign and the subject to contract yet not to apply to it the rules or allow of the effects of a contract is an arbitrary use of names and an unsteadiness of reasoning which can teach nothing resistance to the encroachments of the supreme magistrate may be justified upon this principle recourse to arms for the purpose of bringing about an amendment of the constitution never can no form of government contains a provision for its own dissolution and few governors will consent to the extinction or even to any abridgment of their own power it does not therefore appear how despotic governments can ever in consistency with the obligation of the subject be changed or mitigated 
despotism is the constitution of many states and whilst a despotic prince exacts from his subjects the most rigorous servitude according to this account he is only holding them to their agreement a people may vindicate by force the rights which the constitution has left them but every attempt to narrow the prerogative of the crown by new limitations and in opposition to the will of the reigning prince whatever opportunities may invite or success follow it must be condemned as an infraction of the compact between the sovereign and the subject thirdly every violation of the compact on the part of the governor releases the subject from his allegiance and dissolves the government i do not perceive how we can avoid this consequence if we found the duty of allegiance upon compact and confess any analogy between the social compact and other contracts in private contracts the violation and non-performance of the conditions by one of the parties vacates the obligation of the other now the terms and articles of the social compact being nowhere extant or expressed the rights and offices of the administrator of an empire being so many and various the imaginary and controverted line of his prerogative being so liable to be overstepped in one part or another of it the position that every such transgression amounts to a forfeiture of government and consequently authorizes the people to withdraw their obedience and provide for themselves by a new settlement would endanger the stability of every political fabric in the world and has in fact always supplied the disaffected with a topic of seditious declamation if occasions have arisen in which this plea has been resorted to with justice and success they have been occasions in which a revolution was defensible on other and plainer principles the plea itself is at all times captious and unsafe wherefore rejecting the intervention of a compact as unfounded in its principle and dangerous in the application we assign for the only ground of the subject's obligation the will of god as collected from expediency the steps by which the argument proceeds are few and direct it is the will of god that the happiness of human life be promoted this is the first step and the foundation not only of this but of every moral conclusion civil society conduces to that end this is the second proposition civil societies cannot be upholden unless in each the interest of the whole society be binding upon every part and member of it this is the third step and conducts us to the conclusion namely that so long as the interest of the whole society requires it that is so long as the established government cannot be resisted or changed without public inconveniency it is the will of god which will universally determines our duty that the established government be obeyed and no longer this principle being admitted the justice of every particular case of resistance is reduced to a computation of the quantity of the danger and grievance on the one side and the probability and expense of redressing it on the other but who shall be the judge of this we answer every man for himself in contentions between the sovereign and the subject the parties acknowledge no common arbitrator and it would be absurd to refer the decision to those whose conduct has provoked the question and whose own interest authority and fate are immediately concerned in it the danger of error and abuse is no objection to the rule of expediency because every other rule is liable to the same or greater and every rule that can be propounded upon the subject like all rules which indeed appeal to or bind the conscience must in the application depend upon private judgment it may be observed however that it ought equally to be accounted the exercise of a man's own private judgment 
whether he be determined by reasonings and conclusions of his own or submit to be directed by the advice of others provided he be free to choose his guide we proceed to point out some easy but important inferences which result from the substitution of public expediency into the place of all implied compacts promises or conventions whatsoever one it may be as much a duty at one time to resist government as it is at another to obey it to wit whenever more advantage will in our opinion accrue to the community from resistance than mischief two the lawfulness of resistance or the lawfulness of a revolt does not depend alone upon the grievance which is sustained or feared but also upon the probable expense and event of the contest they who concerted the revolution in england were justifiable in their counsels because from the apparent disposition of the nation and the strength and character of the parties engaged the measure was likely to be brought about with little mischief or bloodshed whereas it might have been a question with many friends of their country whether the injuries then endured and threatened would have authorized the renewal of a doubtful civil war three irregularity in the first foundation of a state or subsequent violence fraud or injustice in getting possession of the supreme power are not sufficient reasons for resistance after the government is once peaceably settled no subject of the british empire conceives himself engaged to vindicate the justice of the norman claim or conquest or apprehends that his duty in any manner depends upon that controversy so likewise if the house of lancaster or even the posterity of cromwell had been at this day seated upon the throne of england we should have been as little concerned to inquire how the founder of the family came there no civil contests are so futile although none have been so furious and sanguinary as those which are excited by a disputed succession Four not every invasion of the subject's rights or liberty or of the constitution not every breach of promise or of oath not every stretch of prerogative abuse of power or neglect of duty by the chief magistrate or by the whole or any branch of the legislative body justifies resistance unless these crimes draw after them public consequences of sufficient magnitude to outweigh the evils of civil disturbance nevertheless every violation of the constitution ought to be watched with jealousy and resented as such beyond what the quantity of estimable damage would require or warrant because a known and settled use of governing affords the only security against the enormities of uncontrolled dominion and because this security is weakened by every encroachment which is made without opposition or opposed without effect five no usage law or authority whatever is so binding that it need or ought to be continued when it may be changed with advantage to the community the family of the prince the order of succession the prerogative of the crown the form and parts of the legislature together with the respective powers offices duration and mutual dependency of the several parts are all only so many laws mutable like other laws whenever expediency requires either by the ordinary act of the legislature or if the occasion deserve it by the interposition of the people these points are wont to be approached with a kind of awe they are represented to the mind as principles of the constitution settled by our ancestors and being settled to be no more committed to innovation or debate as foundations never to be stirred as the terms and conditions of a social compact to which every citizen of the state has engaged his fidelity by virtue of a promise which he cannot now recall such reasons have no place in our system to us 
if there be any good reason for treating these with more deference and respect than other laws it is either the advantage of the present constitution of government which reason must be of different force in different countries or because in all countries it is of importance that the form and usage of governing be acknowledged and understood as well as by the governors as by the governed and because the seldomer it is changed the more perfectly it will be known by both sides six as all civil obligations is resolved into expediency what it may be asked is the difference between the obligation of an englishman and a frenchman or why since the obligation of both appears to be founded in the same reason is a frenchman bound in conscience to bear anything from his king which an englishman would not be bound to bear these conditions may differ but their rights according to this account should seem to be equal and yet we are accustomed to speak of the rights as well as the happiness of a free people compared with what belongs to the subjects of absolute monarchies how you will say can this comparison be explained unless we refer to a difference in the compacts by which they are respectively bound this is a fair question and an answer to it will afford a farther illustration of our principles we admit then that there are many things which a frenchman is bound in conscience as well as by coercion to endure at the hands of his prince to which an englishman would not be obliged to submit but we assert that it is for these two reasons alone first because the same act of the prince is not the same grievance where it is agreeable to the constitution as where it infringes it secondly because redress in the two cases is not equally attainable resistance cannot be attempted with equal hopes of success or with the same prospect of receiving support from others where the people are reconciled to their sufferings as where they are alarmed by innovation in this way and in no otherwise the subjects of different states possess different civil rights the duty of obedience is defined by different boundaries and the point of justifiable resistance placed at different parts of the scale of suffering all which is sufficiently intelligible without a social compact seven the interest of the whole society is binding upon every part of it no rule short of this will provide for the stability of civil government or for the peace and safety of social life wherefore as the individual members of the state are not permitted to pursue their private emoluments to the prejudice of the community so is it equally a consequence of this rule that no particular colony province town or district can justly concert measures for their separate interest which shall appear at the same time to diminish the sum of public prosperity i do not mean that it is necessary to the justice of a measure that it profit each and every part of the community for as the happiness of the whole may be increased whilst that of some parts is diminished it is possible that the conduct of one part of an empire may be detrimental to some other part and yet just provided one part gain more in happiness than the other part loses so that the common weal be augmented by the change but what i affirm is that those counsels can never be reconciled with the obligations resulting from civil union which cause the whole happiness of the society to be impaired for the convenience of a part this conclusion is applicable to the question of right between great britain and her revolted colonies had i been an american i should not have thought it enough to have had it even demonstrated that a separation from the parent state would produce effects beneficial to america my relation to that state imposed upon me a further inquiry namely whether the whole happiness of the empire was likely to be promoted by such a measure not indeed the happiness of every part that was not necessary nor to be expected but whether what great britain would lose by the separation 
was likely to be compensated to the joint stock of happiness by the advantages which america would receive from it the contested claims of sovereign states and their remote dependencies may be submitted to the adjudication of this rule with mutual safety a public advantage is measured by the advantage which each individual receives and by the number of those who receive it a public evil is compounded of the same proportions whilst therefore a colony is small or a province thinly inhabited if a competition of interests arise between the original country and their acquired dominions the former ought to be preferred because it is fit that if one must necessarily be sacrificed the less give place to the greater but when by an increase of population the interest of the provinces begins to bear a considerable proportion to the entire interest of the community it is possible that they may suffer so much by their subjection that not only theirs but the whole happiness of the empire may be obstructed by their union and the rule and the principle of the calculation being still the same the result is different and this difference begets a new situation which entitles the subordinate parts of the state to more equal terms of confederation and if these be refused to independency End of excerpt from the principles of moral and political philosophy by william paley published in 1785read and you will know by james baldwin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org mother what are the clouds made of why does the rain fall where does all the rain water go what good does it do little william jones was always asking questions. I want to know, he said. I want to know everything. At first, his mother tried to answer all his questions, but after he had learned to read, she taught him to look in books for that which he wished to know. Mother, what makes the wind blow? Read, and you will know, my child. Who lives on the other side of the world? Read, and you will know. Why is the sky so blue? read and you will know oh mother i would like to know everything you can never know everything my child but you can learn many things from books yes mother i will read and then i will know he was a very little boy but before he was three years old he could read quite well when eight years of age he was the best scholar at the famous school at harrow he was always reading learning inquiring I want to know. I want to know, he kept saying. Read and you will know, said his mother. Read books that are true. Read about things that are beautiful and good. Read in order to become wise. Do not waste your time in reading foolish books. Do not read bad books. They will make you bad. No book is worth reading that does not make you better or wiser. And so, William Jones went on reading and learning. He became one of the most famous scholars in the world. The King of England made him a knight and called him Sir William Jones. Sir William Jones lived nearly 200 years ago. He was noted for his great knowledge, the most of which he obtained from books. It is said that he could speak and write 40 languages. End of Read and You Will Know by James Baldwin Recording by Jacqueline Burrell Walton The Road to Success by Silas Xavier Floyd This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The world is constantly looking for the man who knows the most. 
and it pays little regard to those who are proficient in the usual degree in the same things. One must excel, or in other words, know more than his associates in order to succeed notably. The world will bid high for you if you know more than other men. So that boys and girls who are preparing themselves for the duties of life should not aim simply at being as good as somebody else, but they should aim at being the best that it is possible to be in any chosen line of life or business. I have noticed in my short lifetime that there is a great tendency on the part of young people to cut short their education. Being able to shine in the intellectual and social worlds with the small attainments made in some college or a normal school or industrial school, the average young Negro man is content to stop with a diploma or a certificate from one or another of these institutions. They will never realize what injury they have done themselves by so doing until it's too late. On the other hand, there is another large class of young people that stop short even before they have finished the course in even any one of the normal or industrial schools. They must go out to work. They know enough to make a living. What's the use of so much education? Anyhow, this is the way some of them talk. This is what some of them believe. Boys and girls, no man or woman with such low ideals will ever reach the topmost round of the ladder of fame. Such boys and girls will always play a second-rate part in the great drama of life. The boys and girls who are going to the front, the boys and girls who are going to have the leading parts, are the boys and girls who are willing to take time to prepare themselves. And preparation means hard work. And not only hard work, but hard and long-continued work. A person can learn a great deal in one year. A person can learn a good deal in two years, but nobody can learn enough in one or two years or in three or four years to make it at all likely that he will ever be sought by the great world. Aside from the rudimentary training, it ought to take at least 10 years to make a good doctor or a good lawyer or a good electrician or a good preacher. Four of these years ought to be spent in college and four in the professional school, and the other two ought to be spent in picking up a practical or working knowledge of the calling, whatever it may be. The young doctor obtains this practical knowledge in hospitals and in practice among the poor. The electrician obtains it by entering some large electrical industry or manufactory in which a thorough practical knowledge of mechanical engineering and electricity can be secured. It is true that some men have become distinguished in these callings without this long preparation of which I have spoken. Yet it is also true that they would have been better off. They would have been more likely to have become eminent if they had taken the longer course. College is a little world which everyone other things being equal, ought to enter and pass through before launching in the great world. End of The Road to Success by Silas Xavier Floyd Recording by Jacqueline Burrell Walton Rural Free Delivery of Mail by Perry S. Heath July 14, 1900, Saturday Evening Post. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Among the agencies which are changing the habits and broadening the horizon of the American people, the extension of the free delivery of mails to rural communities is most prominent. The far-reaching effects of this great change in postal administration as an aid to the moral, intellectual, and material advancement of those brought within its influences are not yet fully appreciated, though with every extension of the system its benefits become more clearly demonstrated. It is obvious at a glance that there must be something behind a movement which has caused Congress, without solicitation from the Post Office Department, 
to increase the appropriation for its development within four years from $50,000 in 1897 to $150,000 in 1898, then to $450,000 in 1899, and now to $1,750,000 for the fiscal year 1900 to 1901. Yet outside of the rural neighborhoods where the service has been put into effect, that is to say in the large cities, where the free delivery of mails, now ranging from three and four to as many as seven deliveries in a day, has been accepted for twenty years or more as a matter of course, without any one giving thought to the question whether all the other people in our part of the Western Hemisphere were similarly favored. There are probably few who clearly understand what rural free delivery is and what it means to the country farmer who has it now for the first time and who, after six months' trial, would be willing almost to mortgage house and lands to secure its continuance should such an extreme course be necessary. At the risk, perhaps, of repeating facts which have become matters of official record, but which necessarily have been presented heretofore in a somewhat disjointed form, I will endeavor to explain what rural free delivery is. Rural free delivery, established on the basic principles which led to its successful test, is a service which starts from a small post office in the heart of a district devoted exclusively to agricultural pursuits, where wheat, corn, cotton, and sugar are grown, where cattle are raised and creameries flourish, where fruits and vegetables are cultivated to supply the needs of the larger towns, and where the people live miles from a railroad or a post office and labor from dawn to dusk with little opportunity for social intercourse or amusement, with no magazines or other current literature to break the monotony of the long winter evenings, and no chance to keep track of the stirring events of their own and other countries by perusal of the daily newspaper. In the inauguration of a rural service, preference is given to a post office of the second or third class, where the postmaster receives a salary for his services and does not derive his compensation from his cancellations, as in the minor offices of the fourth class. In some instances, in great agricultural states like Iowa, for example, where the farms run close up to the towns, rural service has been started from postal stations on the outskirts of a free delivery city. But these cases are the exception and not the rule. The rural carrier is chiefly sent into communities where no visible representative of the government of the United States has heretofore been known. To the average farmer, the Army and Navy of the United States are almost names only. He has never seen them or any part of them. He has no direct dealings with officers of customs or internal revenue, and does not want to have any. The courts of the United States are held in the big cities, and he never voluntarily attends them. Hence the daily visit of the rural carrier is to him a revelation of a new order of things. It brings him into actual touch with the government and causes him to feel that he is getting something back for the taxes he has so long and so willingly paid. Before the establishment of rural free delivery, the residents of these isolated farmhouses had to go or send for their mails to the nearest village post office perhaps six miles or more away. In the busy season, this cost loss of time and labor. In the inclement winter weather, the journey was always inconvenient and sometimes impracticable. Consequently, they sent for their mails only at infrequent intervals, neglected their correspondence, became estranged from relatives and friends at a distance, subscribed to no daily newspapers, and lost interest in the doings of the outside world. Rural free delivery has given them a new interest in life. The rural carrier provides his own vehicle, usually a buggy or light wagon, and has his horse or horses, two horses to be used alternate days are often necessary, and drives on an average from 20 to 25 miles a day over a circuitous route, so arranged that he does not traverse the same road twice on the same day. He leaves the distributing office immediately after the arrival of the principal mail of the day, 
returning in time to turn in his collections for dispatch by the evening trains. He prepares a list of the heads of families on the line of his delivery. Each of these is required to put up a box by the roadside, mounted on a post at such convenient height that the carrier can reach it to deposit his mail without alighting, as shown in the accompanying illustration. The carrier does not leave the main road nor enter door yards to hand in his mails. The country for a mile or more on each side of his route is tributary to him. People living quite a distance back from the road, which the carrier traverses, find it much more convenient to come or send to meet him, knowing the time at which he passes daily, and thus to collect their mail, then to drive several miles to the village post office on the off chance that there might be some mail there for them. If taking advantage of the facilities which rural delivery affords, they subscribe for a daily newspaper and a weekly or monthly magazine, they know that there is something always awaiting them, and that each trip to the family letter box at the crossroads corner will result in something of interest. Scenes like the one depicted of a Maryland farmer crossing lots to meet the rural carrier and receive his mail are of frequent occurrence. The private boxes now in use by the patrons of rural free delivery are of various makes and patterns ranging in cost from 75 cents to four and five dollars each. In the absence of the asked for authority from Congress to furnish a uniform rural letter box of approved design to be rented to patrons of rural delivery at a nominal yearly charge, which would be a great improvement over the present system and would cast over all the mails deposited in rural letter boxes, the unquestioned protection of the United States laws, the department has not felt justified in requiring the adoption of any particular kind of box. It only insists that whatever receptacle is provided for the United States mails shall be decent and appropriate, and shall be of such a character as to be protected against the weather and against mischievous or malicious depredations. These letter boxes serve both for delivery and collection purposes. In some of the best models, one end of the box is devoted to collections, and for this compartment the rural postman alone has the key. The other end is for delivery purposes, and the patron has the only key to that compartment. Should anyone on the rural delivery route find himself without the necessary stamps to prepay the postage, all he has to do is to drop the money in his box with the letter, and the carrier is authorized to affix the requisite stamps. At designated points along the route, at crossroads, schoolhouses, much frequented country stores, or points near which village post offices, superseded by rural free delivery, have been discontinued, the United States mail collection boxes, such are as used in cities, are placed for the deposit of mails only, and collections from these boxes are made by the carriers on their rounds, the letters being delivered for cancellation to the post office, from which the rural delivery starts. Each rural postman carries with him for sale a supply of stamps, stamped envelopes, and postal cards. He is authorized to receipt for money orders and to receive and deliver registered letters, proper forms of receipt being provided. He is generally a traveling post office and is under bond to the government for the faithful performance of his duties. The methods of installation of the service have been simplified and systematized as the service has increased. When experimental rural free delivery was started on October 1, 1896, the post office department arbitrarily selected the localities where it should be applied, and in some instances imposed it upon communities which did not need it and did not desire it. It is now made a prerequisite that those who wish this service shall petition for it, presenting their petitions through their representatives in Congress and with their favorable endorsement. Each rural route, before it is ordered established, is carefully investigated by a special agent of rural free delivery. He drives over the ground, prepares a map of which he carefully notes the number of residences which can be served, which must never be less than 100 to each carrier, and distinctly outlines the route 
the carrier is to follow. A copy of this map is left with the postmaster, so that there shall be no excuse for applications after service has been ordered for trivial changes in the direction of the route to accommodate particular persons. In the selection of carriers, the agents are instructed to give favorable consideration to the recommendations of the congressional representatives of the states or districts in which the office is sought without regard to political affiliations. This being essentially a service for the people, it is thought proper to confide its local execution to men who have the confidence of those whom the people have chosen to represent them in Congress, as far as this can be done with proper regard to efficient postal administration. The rate of compensation paid to rural carriers does not necessitate their taking a preliminary civil service exam. They are appointed to serve during good behavior. Their pay, originally fixed at $300 per annum, was raised last year to $400 and will be further increased to $500 when the new appropriation goes into effect the 1st of July next. In the early days of the experiment, rural carriers were authorized to perform a number of outside services for their patrons in order thereby to increase their small pay. With the increased responsibilities thrown upon the carriers by the adaptation of the registration system to the rural service and the consequent increase of direct pay allowed, the tendency is to curtail rather than enlarge these extraneous services and to bring carriers in the rural service as far as practicable under the regulations which prevail in city free deliveries. Some difficulty has been found in equalizing the rate of compensation according to the varying conditions which prevail in different states, because of the uncertain elements of horse hire and forage, which cost little in some parts of the country and are a source of heavy expense in others. This is one of many matters of detail which will adjust themselves as the service grows. Great changes and improvements have been made in the last two years in the outfit of the carriers and in the routes they traverse. In Alabama and Illinois, the service was started in 1896 on horseback because the roads were not passable for vehicles. In Virginia, the pioneer rural carrier had to take down fences and cross farms to make his daily trips over the route selected for him. There are no such irregularities now. Many of the rural carriers have provided themselves or have had provided for them by popular subscription, specially built rural postal wagons, fitted with pigeonholes and other facilities for sorting their mails in transit. Numbers of them wear the regulation uniform of city carriers and are governed by similar regulations. In one district in Massachusetts, where the roads are exceptionally good the year round, the proposition was made by the people to introduce an automobile into the rural service. The rural carrier, however, in transmitting to the department a sketch of a specially devised machine adapted for rural purpose to cost $850, suggested with much plausibility a doubt as to whether he would be able to meet the expenditure out of his $500 a year pay. Nevertheless, an automobile is being tested on another of the Massachusetts routes and with considerable success. The service which has demonstrated begotten Cavill the possibility of extending rural free delivery over all well-settled farming communities in the United States is now in operation in Carroll County, Maryland. It was established as an object lesson. Those who favored the further extension of the rural free delivery system were met by the contention that the service, if made general, would be so expensive as to swamp the postal revenues, and that if only partly applied, it would give an unjust preference to some communities over others equally entitled to a share of the benefits of the delivery. Those who believed in the practicability of this service knew that the contention as to excessive cost was erroneous, but they were unable to prove it, because wherever rural free delivery superseded the old service of village post offices led by star routes, the cost of the rural delivery was charged against the appropriation for that purpose, 
administered by the first assistant postmaster general, and the saving of expense through the discontinuance of other service, went to the credit of other funds administered by the fourth and second assistant postmaster generals, respectively. It was felt that the only way to test the question was to take one entire county, cover it with rural free delivery, discontinuing all other service, and then count the cost. This has been done in Carroll County, Maryland. On the 20th of December last, in the middle of the winter, when the roads were at their worst, 63 minor post offices and 35 star routes and star route messenger services were discontinued at one swoop in Carroll County by a special order of Postmaster General Smith and rural free delivery was substituted in their stead. The second class post office of Westminster was made the distributing point for the whole county. Four two-horse postal wagons equipped as post offices started over routes which radiated north, south, east, and west and were intercepted and fed at designated points by 39 rural carriers, some driving in buggies, some few performing their shorter journeys on foot. Thus the whole country was covered and a free delivery was brought within easy reach of nearly every domicile. The cost of the new service for three months was found to be $4,543. The cost of the service it superseded for a corresponding period was $2,805. The increase of postal receipts directly resulting from the increased accommodation was $1,501.75, thus leaving the net cost of the improved service for the quarter only $236, or less than $1,000 a year, for giving practically a house-to-house -house delivery instead of compelling every farmer to be his own postman and send for his mails. The Carroll County experiment served its purpose and served it well. It may not be necessary, it may not even be desirable, to repeat that experiment on so expensive a scale elsewhere. For everyday practical purposes, the simpler method of establishing rural delivery by piecemeal, selecting such routes as seemed to be best adapted for it, and leaving each carrier to provide his own conveyance, may be found better adapted to the wide dissemination and will require less cumbersome machinery to put it into effect than the plan of taking up a whole county at once. The rural carrier at Owasso, Michigan, handled last year over 113,000 pieces of mail in his delivery. Making due allowances for newspapers carried at pound rates and for official documents sent under the franking privilege and paying no postage, a very reasonable estimate would be an average of one cent postage for each piece of mail handled. This implies a revenue to the government of $1,113. The cost of the service was just $400. The saving can be easily estimated. There can be no question now as to the permanency of the rural free delivery service. The only wonder is that its necessity and practicability were not sooner discovered. It cost less per capita than free delivery did when first established in many of the smaller cities of the United States. The compensating returns in increased postal receipts and diminished expenditures in other branches of the service are more direct and immediate than any results which followed the initiation of city-free delivery. Of course, the new service produces heartburnings and complaints from the postmasters of the little offices interfered with by the better delivery. Some of them persuade their neighbors to sign protests to endeavor to convince their representatives in Congress that the entire underpinning of his political future will drop away if a particular village store is deprived of its post office. But there have been very few instances where, after three months' trial of the new service, the people have asked for the restoration of the old system. Only three rural services have been permanently discontinued, since the experiment was started four years ago. One of the discontinued routes was a service started in 1896 
over a roadless territory in Kentucky, where the people did not want it. Another simply accommodated visitors to a winter resort in Florida for four months and was useless the rest of the year. The third instance of discontinuance occurred in Virginia, where the fourth-class postmasters and the star route contractors raised sufficient clamor to override the wishes of the rest of the people, and this remains the only case of its kind. I think the future of rural free delivery is bright with promise, not only for the farmers whom it directly benefits, but for the country at large. Wherever it has gone, it has brought good roads. These, in fact, are made a prerequisite of the establishment of the service. It is causing a revolution almost as marked in its influence on the people as that of the establishment of the great trunk railroads across the continent. It is welding city and country together and will in time turn the tide of emigration, which now sets in from the country into the cities, back from the overcrowded purlieus of the cities into the free air and wholesome vocations of the country. Of course, like all great changes, it removes old landmarks and disarranges long-established habits. There were sentimentalists who complained that the Pacific Railroads had exterminated the buffalo and driven the blanket Indians from their happy hunting grounds. But where the buffalo once roamed, descendants of the finest-blooded cattle of Europe now graze in countless numbers. And where the buffalo grass once sprouted, waving fields of wheat now make Kansas, Minnesota, and the Dakotas the granary of the world. With well-built agricultural roads traversing every part of this great country and the free delivery of the mails brought to nearly every farmer's home, I confidently believe that a social revolution will be affected the benefits of which will be felt for generations to come. Editor's Note In the heading is shown a crowd of farmers as they were departing with their boxes for rural route at Attica, Indiana, May 12, 1900. Of the 20 farmers shown, six drove 24 miles on one of the busiest days of the year to get a box that cost them $2.50, eight drove 18 miles, and the remainder 12 and 14 miles. This delivery of boxes was made two days before the route opened and over 100 farmers took out and paid for the high-priced boxes during the day. End of Rural Free Delivery of Mail by Perry S. Heath Read by Mary in Arkansas Who is Browning? By the Editor of The Popular From The Popular Magazine, October 20 1918. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Who is Browning? By the editor of The Popular. We hear a great deal about the gun, but hardly anything about the man. That is as John Browning would have it. He is a quiet, diffident sort of man, between sixty and seventy years of age, who prefers to remain in the background while his guns take the foremost position in the world. John Browning lives in Ogden, Utah, where he was born, and where he has performed practically all his wonders of gun-making. His father before him was a gunsmith and it was from him that the inventor learned the fundamental principles of the trade. For many years Browning produced guns with which his name is not publicly associated. Thus, he is the inventor of every rifle that the Winchester Arms Company has manufactured, from the single-shot rifle to the repeater. He also invented the Remington shotgun, the Remington automatic rifle, and the Stevens repeating shotgun. The famous guns made by Fabrique Nationale of Liege, Belgium, before the war, represented his labors and patents. All the Colt automatic pistols from 22 caliber to 45 caliber were the product of his genius, as well as the Colt machine gun. 
but the supreme achievement of his career was the creation of the Browning machine guns, light and heavy types. To these he was willing to give his name. As almost everyone knows, they are marvels of mechanical contrivance, and bid fair to revolutionize warfare. The light model, which is really a machine gun rifle, is carried and fired from the shoulder as easily as an ordinary rifle. It will fire forty shots in two seconds and a half. The heavier, water-cooled machine gun is operated on a tripod and can pour out bullets as fast as it is possible for them to follow one another. In a severe test it fired thirty-nine thousand shots without the least hitch or mishap. Many ordnance authorities consider John Browning the greatest gun-making genius that ever lived. That his royalties pile up as high as a thousand dollars a day speaks for his success. Yet he is a lover of peace and concord, and we suspect that John Browning would willingly forego both his reputation and wealth if he could end war forever. In that, John Browning is the best type of the American. The End of Who is John Browning? By the Editor of The Popular Winter Talk by Henry Ward Beecher From Plain and Pleasant Talk About Fruits, Flowers, and Farming, 1859 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Winter Talk Do not be tempted by fine weather to haul out manure. It will be half wasted by lying in small heaps over the field. To spread it will be worse yet. Manure should lie in a stack as little exposed to the weather as possible look to your fences see that they are in complete order and leave nothing of this to consume your time in the spring when you will need all your force for other work it is well to haul all the rails you will need for the year the timber will last longer cut now do not leave rails or sticks of timber lying where you cleave them on the damp ground. They will decay more in six months there than in eighteen when properly cared for. Put two rails down and lay the rest across them so as to have a circulation of air beneath. If you have five or ten acres of deadening which you mean to clear up and put to corn, you may as well roll the logs now. Every good farmer should study through the winter to make his spring work as light as possible. Whatever can be done now, do not fail to do it. You will have enough to do when spring opens, and perhaps the season may be one which will crowd your work into a week or two. If you have young fruit trees or a little home nursery, look out for rabbits. They usually depredate just after a light fall of snow. Overhaul all your plows, carts, shovels, hoes, etc., and put everything in complete readiness. While you are moving about and repairing holes in the fence, putting on a rail here, a stake yonder, a rider in another place, you may inquire of yourself whether your character is not in some need of repairs. Perhaps you are very careless and extravagant. The fence needs rails there. Perhaps you are lazy. In that case, the fence corners may be said to be full of brambles and weeds and must be cleared out. Perhaps you are a violent, passionate man. You need a stake and rider on that spot. And lastly, perhaps you are not temperate. If so, your fence is all going down and will soon have gaps enough to let in all the hogs of indolence, vice, and crime, and they make a large drove and fatten fast. 
now is a good time to plan how to get out of debt don't be ashamed to save in little things nor to earn small gains many a mickle makes a muckle but set it down to begin with that no saving is made by cheating yourself out of a good newspaper no man reads a good paper a year without saving by it suppose you put in your wheat a little better for something you see written by a good farmer and get five bushels more to the acre one acre pays for a year's paper one recipe a hint which betters any crop pays for the paper fourfold intelligent boys work better plan better earn and save better and reading a good paper makes them intelligent besides suppose you took a good paper a year and found nothing new during all that time an incredible supposition yet every two weeks it comes to jog your memory about things which you may forget but ought not to forget it steps in and asks whether that little store bill is paid whether that loan drawing a fatal six seven or ten per cent poison poison deadly poison is being melted down whether the children are going to school whether the tools are all right the fences snug whether economy and industry and sound morals the best crop one can put in are flourishing it will look at your orchard peep over into your garden pry into the dairy nay into the cupboard and bureau and even into your pocket now if you are a man willing to learn it will give you hints enough in a year to pay ten times over for your paper end of winter talk by henry ward beecher from plain and pleasant talk about fruits flowers and farming 1859 read for librivox by sue anderson Young People and Life Insurance by Silas Xavier Floyd. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Every little boy and girl, and of course every man and woman of the colored race in America, should carry a life insurance policy of some kind in some reliable company. In this matter, the old people, as in some other things, ought to set the example for the young. But there are some reasons growing chiefly out of their previous condition of slavery, why our mothers and fathers have not, as a rule, taken very largely to the business of having their lives insured. But because our parents have been negligent in this matter, there is no reason why the younger generation should be. Life insurance is a good thing. Boys and girls, one of the best things in the world. American life insurance companies alone pay to policyholders or estates of policyholders over $100 million annually. Only a very small and almost insignificant portion of this vast sum goes into the hands of colored people, and for the reason that very few colored people carry life insurance policies. Taking out a policy. Now use a little common sense about this matter. Whatever is good in life insurance for other races is good for our race. Whatever in life insurance benefits other races will benefit our race. In business as in education, whatever is good for a white man is good for a black man. I would therefore urge every boy and girl to join a life insurance company. And where your mothers and fathers are not insured, I would urge you to do your utmost to persuade them to join at once. For one reason, a life insurance policy is not expensive. You might as well talk of the expense of buying bank stock. 
or the expense of putting your money into a savings bank or any other safe place as to speak of the expense of keeping up a life insurance policy. It is accumulation and not expense. Every dollar put into life insurance is a dollar saved to yourself or your estate. For another reason, life insurance is a good business investment. Carefully collected statistics on file in Washington City prove that investments in life insurance are much safer and yield much larger returns than money placed in a savings bank. When you are older, you will perhaps be able to make these comparisons for yourself. For the present, you can take my word for it. A third reason, life insurance is cheap. You can, in an instant, create a capital of $1,000, though you may be ever so poor by laying aside only a few cents a week. Young people chew up and drink up and smoke up and frolic up more money every week than would be sufficient to protect them against the rainy days that must come to everybody. And then life insurance has a character value. It makes a young man a better man. It makes a young woman a better woman. That is to say, it makes them more economical, more businesslike, happier, and I believe it will make them live longer. It is high time that black boys and girls were learning these things and acting upon them. When God commanded us not to serve money as a false god, he did not say that money could not serve us, and I beseech the boys and girls, and the old people too, to exercise the same foresight and the same good sense about life insurance that other races exercise. End of Young People and Life Insurance by Silas Xavier Floyd Read by Jacqueline Burrell Walton